Good morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure and privilege to uh, welcome you all to the Raman Research Institute. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, this is uh, our 75th year. We have just stepped into our 75th year and we are celebrating it with uh, six international conferences. And I took the advantage of uh, having the cosmology meeting the first one. And so we here we are at the frontiers of cosmology. And uh, we will have many more meetings uh, in this year, uh, five more meetings. So I should uh, also begin by, you know, thanking you all for making your time and all the efforts to come here. And really nice to see so many colleagues and particularly after the few years where we were all meeting online. Uh, offline meeting of this kind where we are discussing, you know, the really few uh, very important frontier areas. We are also touching on other areas. So I should also commend uh, our young, my young colleagues here and also in the country, cosmologists who put this program together. Although I was on the SOC, I, you know, should confess that uh, I had only very limited role. And uh, so it's a great and also particularly you know the enthusiasm is what is important and you know i'm really happy to see the cosmology community grow in india and you know now the meetings we have we are you know we have young people who are really at the frontiers of these uh, uh, areas that we are talking about and there are quite a few of them and uh, you know people who have been in india before so like people like Shubir who will especially welcome uh, Oily Pen would know in the 90s and all I mean the community was much smaller than what it was uh, what it is now I mean from where we started and I'm really glad that this uh, growth is happening and you know we hope to sustain it and take very important position in the, the so some of the sessions are also you know targeted towards uh, introducing you to the researchers in the country so there are many uh, talks which are uh, by you know people from uh, india uh, very good young researchers who are starting and also we would be touching upon the major efforts in astronomy that are ongoing in the country so without taking uh, much more of your time now let me again welcome you uh, to this uh, meeting and uh, also to the Platinum Jubilee celebrations of uh, Raman Research Institute. Thank you. Welcome to the first session of this first day of the conference. The theme of the day is inflation and CMB. And the uh, first set of the talks will be of 30 plus 5 minutes. The first will be given by uh, speaker Akito Kusaka on cosmic microwave background, challenges and future prospect. So thanks for inviting me to give this talk here uh, for this great opportunity uh, and anniversary for you. Congratulations for that. Um, so yeah, I will talk about the cosmic micro background and I guess I'm the intro person for everyone. Um, yeah, so I know you're tired to see this uh, figure at this point, but uh, someone has to show you if it is a cosmology conference. And if I'm the speaker, then I'll take that opportunity to show that. Um, so you know, this is my, our current understanding of the universe, right? So, you know, the universe has started by Big Bang and expanded. And at one point, uh, which is, you know, uh, 380 kilo years after the beginning, um, the, it has cooled down enough to to let the photons free stream, right? And decouple. And after that, the uh, universe kept expanding and we're now right here. Um, and this, this figure does have, uh, you know, at least uh, to me, three biggest questions. In it, and which is how did the universe start? So that's that's one. And then the other is um, what's a dark matter? So we know that uh, we all have uh, dark matter there, but we don't know what it is uh, and what the dark energy is. So I'll touch on those things a little, a little um, on those. So cosmic micro background, like I said, uh, at the point of last scattering, uh, the photons have started to free stream, and uh, that's where the cosmic micro background come from. Um, and we observed that uh, from the Earth, uh, the Kobe satellite, as well as the Canadian sound rocket, has uh, you know characterized it very well. And you know it is known to be 2.7 Kelvin uh, black body. Uh, it, it, this is showing the spectrum, 
and its fluctuation here that on top of that 2.7 Kelvin uh, uh, temperature, we have 100 micro Kelvin-ish uh, fluctuations here. And that's, you know, that has the fluctuation uh, of, you know, that created later the, the galaxy clusters and eventually us. So this is really sea levels. So we know those uh, temperature fluctuations very well. So this is measured by Planck satellite. So what this is showing is the fluctuation Fourier transform. So the vertical axis is the, uh, the power, basically the size of the fluctuation, and the horizontal axis is the wave number. So that's you know, the inverse of the angular scales. And you see these beautiful peaks and troughs and you know, this pattern, and you can fit this um, uh, beautifully with just six parameters, amazingly. Um, and so from that, uh, what you get is, you know, the, the, for example, in the current universe, dominant portion of the energy is dark energy. Uh, the rest, again, dominated by dark matter. Uh, what we know is only 5% of the universe. And in addition to that, the universe ge geometrically is very flat. Um, and also the fluctuations are Gaussian. So we all know that these are well established and well understood. So what's next? Right, so what, which is polarization. So at the point of last scattering, um, the electrons would Thomson scatter uh, the photons. And at that point, um, if there is a further polar anisotropy, then we will see the anisotropic behavior of those photon polarization. So these are statistical anisotropy, not, not you know, we're not talking about single photon being polarized one or the other. This is more, uh, you know, if we collect many, many photons from one direction, coming from one direction, uh, then, then we'll see the, those polarization. So we're interested in measuring that. And why is that? Um, you know, one of the reasons is to explore this very beginning of the universe, which I said, one of the biggest questions. So, um, you know, at the very beginning of the universe, um, you know, the, the, the leading hypothesis of how it started is this inflation which is, you know, very rapid expansion of the universe. And that very rapid expansion uh, may have frozen in the quantum fluctuations of the metric, uh, which becomes a, uh, what we call primordial gravitational waves. So if we see it, that's a very definitive evidence for inflation. So, you know, some people would say, especially if there is that, okay, we know that inflation has happened. Uh, someone like me, who's an experimentalist, no, 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 we have really so deep evidence for that. Uh, but if we see it, that would be a very, very strong evidence for that. So the way we will see it um, is this uh, B mode pattern on CMB polarization, which is, you know, parity odd pattern. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we are looking for. Um, this is the current state of the art. Um, so again, the same uh, axis as the temperature fluctuation that I have shown. So the vertical axis is the size of the fluctuation and the horizontal axis is the inverse of the wave number. Uh, the, uh, the vertical axis is turned to the, the fluctuation size of this B mode pattern, which is parity odd pattern of the, of the polarization. Um, and what we are seeing here, th those are all upper limits. And we started this, you know, this, this actually shows fascinating history uh, in this area that people have started to put upper limits a lot here. And we have finally drilled down to see this signal, which is not the primordial gravitational waves. This is uh, what's called lensing, uh, which is expected signal from the uh, gravitational lensing effect. Uh, and then if we would see any primordial uh, gravitational waves, then we are supposed to see it here. We have not yet seen it. Um, so the, still the endeavor goes on. Um, and we are, we are going to hear more about this uh, later in uh, today also. Um, you know, that's not only science that we are looking at for, for the CMB. Um, and, you know, one thing we can use, so CMB comes from this service, right? But that, that contains a lot of information because A, it has information about that exact surface and the expansion speed, basically, of the universe here, which tells us about, you know, how much of these, uh, how many of these um, relativistic species there. We know that the, um, the neutrinos were there, but there could be others, um, such as axions or star neutrinos or that sort of thing that we don't know yet. Uh, then as the light comes through the universe, it will also capture information about, uh, you know, about the growth of the universe uh, through the gravitational uh, lensing effect. 
And I'm not going to talk much about, but uh, of course, uh, you can observe uh, galactic clusters by, by its interaction with uh, hot plasma trapped in, in the cluster. So we might hear more about those in later talks today again. Um, so, and so what, where we are now, um, so, you know, like I said, we know very well about this temperature fluctuation, which is, you know, compared to all those polarization signal, way, way bigger. Uh, and then we have characterized this E mode spectrum, which is parity even component of the polarization pattern also very well. Uh, but you kind of see that as it goes to higher L, which is smaller in your scale, there are, there are room to improve. Uh, and this B mode spectrum, which is, you know, the least well known, and there are just orders of magnitude difference between the size of the signal. So we are really drilled down on this. And in this plot, for example, different features of, of the cosmic micro background shows uh, different, connect to different science. And that's how we can extract the information. And I guess I forgot to show in this plot, but the uh, primary gravitational waves show up here. Um, one thing, you know, I, I thought um, I should mention this because this is actually pretty hot. Like whenever I talk to people, CMB people these days, they were, they're telling me that, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to measure that one too. Um, so I'm going to talk about it. So, so uh, there is this possibility of um, axions uh, actually interacting with those microwave photons uh, and uh, causing a feature that would not show up else, uh, otherwise. So, so these axions, the fascinating thing is that, so these axions are, are a kind of hypothetical part particle that can be motivated by, uh, you know, QCD or, you know, these days, uh, more interesting possible, well, I shouldn't say more interesting, but interesting possibility from the string theories uh, that could actually create uh, many types of the axions. Um, and if those can be created at the very beginning of the universe, um, you know, this the vertical axis shows the uh, amplitude of that axiom, and the horizontal axis is the redshift. So that's uh, sorry, the time direction is the inverse from from the uh, figures I was showing. Um, and then the amplitude uh, start out, you know, at the beginning of the universe, start out to be large, and then as the universe expands, it kind of rolls down and then start to oscillate at the bottom of the potential, right? And uh, and depending on the mass, right? So the actions are very light, um, and we're especially we're talking about very light kind here. Uh, but the you know among those those a little bit heavier one would uh, roll down early and behave more like dark matter actually, while very very light one actually doesn't roll out roll down, and those large amplitude uh, behave like dark energy. Um, so this is kind of interesting possibility that, you know, perhaps, you know, there are just axions and that, that behaves both as dark matter and dark energy. And of course, um, and those show up differently in the CMB. So if it is like dark energy, then it's a rotation of the polarization and it's just a constant rotation. Well, um, if it is dark matter, then it's going to actually roll down at the bottom of the polarization, uh, the potential, they're going to kind of oscillate. And that oscillate translate to the oscillation of the polarization angle. So people started to measure that. And uh, for the oscillation, people started to put the upper limit, which actually is close to be better than um, other measurements. Actually, it turned out it's a little bit farther away uh, because of those guys. But still, um, it's, it's probably getting to interesting regime. But also one interesting thing is that for this constant rotation of the polarization angle, there are people who claimed a uh, more than three sigma evidence of that rotation. And there are some skeptical opinions about it, especially on their uh, treatment of the foregrounds and stuff, which is why um, uh, many people got interested in and you know, either rejecting or confirming this signal. Because if this is real, this could be a big deal. And there's, of course, a way to go from detecting this effect and confirming that to be axiom. So, you know, still, you know, we shouldn't be starting dancing to, to say that we understand the universe yet. Um, but um, this is pretty interesting and people got interested in to look at it. Anyway, so um, those are the science that we are interested in, and uh, it's going to go into a little bit technical, but as an experimentalist, probably I should talk about experiment. Um, so this is one example of CMB telescope. Um, uh, so the CMB telescope would have, you know, usually mirrors made of metal. Those are warm, but the rest are cryogenic. So at the focus of the mirror system, uh, we have cryogenic receiver typically. 
and those have like cold lenses, cool down four Kelvin or below, and uh, focal plane is you know sub Kelvin. Um, this is one example with the mirror, and another example. So that one was a pol polar bear experiment, and this one is Simon's Observatory Small Aperture Telescope, and this one doesn't have mirror to it. This one is just a refractive. Uh, optics. Uh, it's got lenses and uh, that's cooled down to one Kelvin here. Um, and then the focal plane is cooled down to 100 millikelvin, right? And those, those are cooled down by the dilution refrigerator. Um, so what's actually driving those design and uh, those basically, you know, you know uh, design of those telescopes? And I would say three elements. Um, and one is, you know, we definitely have to have really good sensitivity to it. Uh, and then the foreground separation. So there is uh, our galaxy, for example, in front of the CMB, and we have to separate out this component. Uh, and then the instrumental systematic, which is gonna be a big deal. Uh, we often talk a lot about those two these days, but uh, in part because we think we figured out those many things about the raw sensitivity, but we should actually, we have to remember all those things uh, not to screw things up. Um, so those are all challenging things. So I was gonna, uh, talk about those uh, little by little on those. Of course, uh, you know, 30 minutes is not going to be enough to talk all the details. Uh, but, you know, so the detectors, um, so the way we measure the CMB is basically this. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, or, or what, uh, but uh, this kind of photo is kind of more familiar these days. Uh, but, you know, so this is measuring people's temperature at infrared. And the reason why use in, we use infrared is because uh, that's the peak of the Planck distribution for a 300 Kelvin object. Uh, if we would look at uh, the 2.7 Kelvin object, then we would look at you know roughly 100 gigahertz, 150 gigahertz. So that's what we need, and those are uh, the detectors for that. So the, each one pixel would correspond roughly to you know 100 gigahertz uh, uh, wavelength. Right, and that uh, many of those would uh, would uh, comprise a focal plane. This is an example again from from polar bear two experiment. Um, you know, let me let me skip this one uh, because I don't think I have time for that. Um, so those detectors are cooled down to um, 100 millikelvin level. These are superconducting detectors and super sensitive, and super sensitive to the point that the intrinsic noise of the detector is negligible. Right, so the noise fluctuation uh, primarily come from the photons. So the CMB photons, they are thermal, so they have fluctuations to it. If you're observing from the ground, then the atmospheric photons also have fluctuations to it. So they have thermal fluctuations to it. And so, so the requirement here is to make sure that the, each detector are limited only by that. And in, in getting to so, the, to have a good observing site is critical. Right, uh, to CMB, uh, CMB temperature is 2.7 Kelvin. Uh, the, um, the atmospheric uh, temperature is roughly 10 Kelvin, right? So, um, and at an extremely good site, such as South Pole and Chile. So that's really important, uh, first of all, uh, to go there. Uh, otherwise we're gonna have, you know, like even, even a dry and good site, uh, we're gonna have like order 100 Kelvin, right? So we're gonna go there. Uh, then we have to make each of them really good. So at that point, at this point, uh, each detector cannot be better than as they are right now. Then the only way to make it better is to make many of those, right? So which is why this uh, lithographic technique, basically the technique used for uh, fabricating semiconductor devices are also used on these superconductor devices, right? And that way people manage to make you know, make many, many of those, right? So this each wafer contain uh, 7,000 detectors, right? And we stamp out many, many of those and that coupled to, you know, either horn antenna or lenses to, you know, to be coupled to the electromagnetic wave coming through the vacuum. Um, and the readout is also crucial, right? So there are all those superconducting detectors and these are cooled down to sub Kelvin, below one Kelvin and around 100 millikelvin. Right. And if there are many, many wires coming into the stage, then that's going to warm up that 100 millikelvin object. So we have to minimize the number of wires. Also, um, uh, the, the 
complexity of connecting all those things are, are too much. Uh, so we have to multiplex those. And in order to multiplex these things, there are two ways mainly. And one is to multiplex in frequency domain, which is like, um, you know, the, the radio, you know, or TV, right? There are just radio waves and we use different frequencies for different channels. And it's basically the same. And there are two ways. One is to use the gigahertz uh, resonators, which is these guys, and also uh, the megahertz resonators. Uh, and both use its squids um, and to, to read out, amplify and read out uh, those elements. Uh, you can also multiplex in time domain um, and, uh, and uh, read different channels. So, so those readouts are also crucial to increase the number of channels. And then uh, you have to also have a good optics, right? So the, um, so the optical throughput, so the telescope has to be big, but not only it has to be big, it actually has to have wide field of view. So A omega, the aperture size and the field of view, this product is a conservation number, uh, similarly to whatever other conservation in the physics, right? If you run the Lagrangian optics, this is the conservation number and you cannot violate that. And so the number of optical modes that you can measure uh, is proportional to this, basically this number divided by lambda squared, that's the number of modes. And you cannot put more detectors on the focal plane to make your sensitivity better. That's the limit. You cannot increase the density of the uh, detectors. I mean, I mean, you can, but you actually don't gain by doing that. Um, it turns out that there are two ways to do it, two ways to maximize this. And one is to make the field of view bigger while the aperture size is moderate. Uh, and another way is to make the aperture bigger while the field of view is, I mean, it's still big, it's 10 degrees, but uh, still sort of moderate compared to this. And each of those have advantages. Uh, this guy can measure actually a uh, small angular scale, obviously, because, uh, because it's a large aperture. And this guy actually can, is good at large angular scales because it has large field of view. And having a large field of view actually measuring a large angular scale is crucial. If you think about WMAP, they actually have like 120 degrees field of view, so to speak, and that's that's crucial. And Planck, on the other hand, Planck satellite actually had a hard time to measure those large angular scales, but again, I'm not gonna talk about that detail. Um, so, you know, like I said, I, I guess I'm not meaning for you to understand all of those details, but, you know, just putting all those things together and work together is so hard to just get to this row sensitivity, and then we have two more things to tackle on, right? Um, so one is this foregrounds. So what this is showing, this is from Planck satellite, and this is the 70 gigahertz, which is roughly where the CMB is cleanest. At the higher frequency side, you see the um, dust emission from our, our galaxy, and the lower frequency side, there is this uh, synchrotron emission. And so, you know, at the dust side, we see dust, and at the synchrotron side, we see synchrotron. Uh, and the CMB, you know, you would think that we, we see it and it's fine, and it's not really, right? It, it is actually a sum of CMB, but also a small amount of synchrotron and dust. So we have to measure all of those in order to characterize and eventually make it be clean. Um, so how do we do it? So you know, this is a plot showing the emission, uh, the, the rate, uh, kind of the strength of the emission, and the horizontal axis is the frequency. This is the CMB, this is the free, uh, synchrotron, and this is the dust. And you just have to have multiple frequencies in order to distinguish those things one another. And uh, so one technique people come up with is that to make one pixel more se sensitive to multiple frequencies. So typically these days, uh, each, each, each pixel is sensitive to you know, two, uh, two frequencies. That's the design, for example, CMBS4. The SPT had uh, three frequency sensitive uh, instrument. Bicep stick to one, uh, one frequency, which has good, good things about it. Um, but typically we have to make those things uh, sensitive to multiple frequencies. And then often forgotten thing, but the making pixel sensitive to multiple frequencies is not enough. We have to make the optics also good at multiple frequencies, and it has its own challenge, especially if you make it be wideband uh, good. So then you have to have multi-layer coding to it. And we have those high index materials such as silicon or alumina or sapphire, and those high index material needs multi-layer anti-reflection coding. 
uh, and making it work at cryogenic temperature is really hard. So people thought about, um, for example, dicing the surface and make it be effectively multiple index, refractive index. Um, people thought about, you know, good old technique of putting, you know, either, you know, medium index layers, uh, which is really hard actually, it turns out, because if you cool it down and those things shrink, but different amount, and they, then they start to delaminate. So really figuring those out is really difficult. Um, so that's that. And then the instrumental systematic. Um, so again, uh, we have done all of those things. And the thing is, in order to tackle this thing, we cannot screw this up. And I'm, again, I'm going to show just one example. Uh, but, you know, so the um, one thing that, and I think uh, in my mind, the biggest thing to tackle on is this uh, temperature leaking into polarization. Um, so everywhere we are looking at, uh, typically things are not polarized, right? And for example, in the CMB, the dominant fluctuation is temperature, and that's orders of magnitude bigger than the signal that we, tiny, tiny signal that we are looking at, right? Uh, if you look at the atmospheric fluctuation, this is showing actually one detector is looking at pretty much, okay, there is CMB in it, but um, you know, it's, it's looking at the atmosphere and you, you see the dominant fluctuation and that comes from the atmospheric fluctuation, which is not polarized. And then we, we have terrain. So it, this is a photo seen from Chile and you know, at our site and you know, you do this iPhone thing that the, you know, you actually get the uh, 360 view of it and we have mountains and stuff. And of course our telescope wouldn't look at the mountain, but you know, those things have diffraction scattering and stuff. So actually the light from those mountain comes into the telescope. And again, those are dominantly not polarized, but if uh, there is a small amount of our instrument that actually leaks this polarization into into uh, leaks this intensity temperature to polarization. So that can happen. Um, so there are multiple ways to tackle on it, uh, but I wanted to show this example, which is halfway plate in part because I work on it, but also I'll tell you why. Um, so so what, how this works um, is that the, um, so this halfway plate such as sapphire are birefringent material and there are two axes to it. Two axes have different in indices refractive index um, and so if we make it be half wavelength difference between one direction and the other, you, can, you manage to rotate the polarization. And if you rotate this uh, sapphire plate, uh, then incoming photon actually gets por its polarization rotated. And so by doing this, you can actually modulate the polarization. And that's one you know, really good way to measure this polarization very, very accurately and killing all those uh, temperature to polarization fluctuations. Um, so we actually developed this thing uh, called the cryogenic halfway plate. The thing is, again, we cannot screw up other things. So for example, if we have it warm, then uh, it's going to emit uh, photons from it and it's going to increase the noise, for example. So we have to have it cold. So the way we do it is to have superconducting bearing. Um, and so this, there is this YBCO and strong magnet ring. And then uh, we actually drive it, levitate it, right? And so that way we can drive it cold under vacuum and this large object that is 50 centimeter. So, you know, this is a view uh, on liquid nitrogen. We eventually bring it to, to the cryostat. Um, and then uh, we also develop the optical element, which is, you know, 50 centimeter large sapphire, right? Um, and, and then we measure it and it's, it's good to go. Now, I said halfway plate, right? Um, and I said that we have to have wide band, multiple frequencies. That's important for, for uh, foregrounds, right? Uh, but halfway plate means halfway plate, half wavelength. That's only good at one frequency, right? Um, so how do we handle that? And this is where, you know, Raman Institute comes in, um, of course, uh, as well as many other places. But we basically follow this person's invention, Panchatnam, uh, who were, I think it's his work when he was here. I think he moved to uh, UK eventually, which is this magical idea of stacking multiple birefringent element in different angles. So usually the halfway plate works as a halfway plate uh, between one axis and the other. Uh, but this, this person has uh, come up with an idea 
that you can actually stack these weight plate at different angles. And that way, so this plot, what this plot shows is that, uh, you know, how well this half weight plate works as a half weight plate, right? So if you have one layer and the horizontal axis is the frequency, if, ha if we have one layer, then it, it is only good here, right here at right one frequency. But if you have three of those, then you can actually make it be good at this wide frequency range. So thanks to this person, uh, we can make it be good, but th this actually shows that how difficult it is. So this halfway plate makes, you know, this instrumental systematic better. It also makes the angular sensitivity better because you can reject these atmospheric fluctuations. But as you saw that, for example, in order to have detector sensitivity good, we have to cool it down, right, at cryogenic temperature, which is really challenging because that's why we have to have this superconducting uh, bearing. Um, and we have, to, in order to maintain this number of channels, uh, we have to have a big, you know, 50 centimeter sapphire, right? Uh, and then also in order to have foreground separate it, uh, we have to have this wide uh, frequency band, and which is why we need this Pancharatnam's idea implemented in our system. So it just shows that how challenging it is, right? That, you know, everything has to work together, right? So, you know, they, they, that's the thing about the CMB instrument. So I used to be in particle physics and in particle physics, each element of the instrument can work on one thing. And then, you know, the whole detector is good by doing, by collecting all of those things. But in the CMB instrument, basically all the things have to work together in order not to screw up and get everything right. Um, anyway, so so the exci exciting time is coming up. Hopefully we did everything right. So this is uh, footage of the Simons Observatory in Chile and site. And uh, we're, you know, this, these are the foundations and we're putting together an instrument. So Simons Observatory, happening uh, very, very soon. And then CMBS4, uh, which is, you know, the Simons Observatory cons would consist of hundred thousands of detectors and the CMBS4 is going to be 500 thousands of the detectors. And that's happening uh, after that, uh, which would consist of, you know, three uh, big telescopes and uh, also uh, many, many of those small aperture telescopes that would uh, look for the inflationary signal. So um, I was chatting with people that this uh, timeline is a little bit off. I think this would st stay longer, but um, you know, those current generation experiments are gonna uh, be, are doing amazing science and they're gonna be keep doing that for a bit more. Simon's Observatory will kick in and I'm really excited about it, personally involved in it. Um, and then the CMBS4 and the Lightbird uh, will be starting around 2030. So really exciting time um, it is for, for the CMB experiments. And just, just a couple of examples uh, that um, would show how exciting it is. Um, so the, this is showing how much we can go on uh, looking at the inflation. Vertical axis is the size of the inflationary signal. And uh, we are about here, right here, right? Um, and then we're digging down here um in the next uh 10 years or so and uh, you know these are some of the a you know very well motivated interesting models such as Star stravinsky model um and we're really getting there so it's really a big milestone um okay i'm probably not going to talk about this because i'm running out of time so to summarize you know the cmb has uh provided us very very crucial input uh to the understanding of our cosmology um, and that's not the end. We are looking forward to have more things coming out of CMB. The next 10 years is going to be exciting. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time on talking about the instrument. Um, and, you know, I hope, you know, that each individual component are so complicated that I, I understand I cannot convey that much. But, you know, hopefully I conveyed to that point that, you know, in making those CMB instrument, every single thing has to be right. And otherwise we're gonna screw this up. Um, so that's that's really a challenge, but I think we are learning how to do that. Um, and uh, uh, last but not least, congratulations for, for your institute. Um, um, you know, I have I have a little bit of thank you for, for that Pancharatnam work, because it, especially because I'm so connected to that work, but I uh, hope you, you can continue working with us on this exciting endeavor. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the very nice overview. We have five minutes for a few questions, please. Thank you for so clearly outlining the important issues. There is one you didn't mention, which won't affect S4 on the ground, but 
uh, might affect light bird which will be at Lagrange point 2. Uh, as you know uh, the Planck uh, high frequency instrument was quite severely affected by cosmic ray damage. Uh, what steps are being taken to uh, mitigate against that for light bird? Right. Um, so, I am not from light bird collaborations. I am not, I may not be uh, well positioned for that, but just if I take the liberty of saying whatever I know. Um, so, first of all, I think it was good that Planck has so that because for Lightbird, it's not a surprise anymore, right? So I know that people are doing a lot of radiation studies, you know, bringing into accelerator and how it's going to be affected. Not only the radiation damage, but they are also trying to, you know, measure it. Uh, and also the thing is that those are uh, transition edge sensors, right? So, uh, so the thing is that the the kind of the target area for the cosmic rays to affect those bolometers is actually minute compared to, you know, for example, Planck system of the bolometer. Uh, still, I think you can hit the, the wafer of those detector and still affect it, but, uh, but the, that effect is smaller. So I think a uh, combination of those two would certainly help, but uh, you know, I'm probably not in a position to say you know, more details on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yes. Hi, Kito. Thanks for that great mm -hmm. talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could say more about uh, the site selection for CMBS4 and if there's any advantage in also going to more sites or Northern Hemisphere coverage. Right. So, you know, right. I should have, of course, mentioned that I was interested in this Indian site. Uh, let's see. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I'll, let me go back while I'm here. Right. So, um, for example, you see here, pretty good. And I, I learned from Mayuri that you know, there is an Indian side of the site that is pretty good too. Um, so the question is, you know, from the, is it worth it, right? And uh, to establish the site, so there was a discussion in the early days of the CMBS4, whether it is worth it to go to the northern side. And the answer is, you know, probably not by us. And the reason is that it took years of experience, you know, deploying those instruments to those sites and seeing the stability of the weather and all those things. And so in order to establish that, really someone has to be committed and do probably small experiment to go there and you know, spend, you know, I don't know, five years at least. And we're not in a position to be able to do that. And then what's the gain of it? Uh, it turns out that from Chile, you can get more than half of the sky. Right, so the the improvement is somewhat increment incremental in that we can probably get up to square root two of of, of the gain. Now, if we are at the level of okay, we are seeing R, or you know we are about to see the R, and the, you know that square root two really helps over science. You know that might happen in the future, and that would be great. Then yeah, we should look at northern side. But at the moment, we are not in in that stage. Yes, one more question. This is a really nice talk. So, so you talked a little bit up about polarization, and I, I maybe I didn't fully follow it. But in in sort of radio astronomy, we have the same problem. We have a lot of polarization leakage because we have wide fields, and of course you get geometric effects, right? It simply is not a for us a cross dipole anymore. You get polarization leakage. It's a very strong direction dependent effect, right? So it's only it's not something you can correct in the data. You have to correct it in the post processing. Now you talked a bit about polarization, uh, uh, correcting for polarization. So, so I is that the same problem? Do you have these geometric polarization leakage effects as well, or is that totally negligible? Yeah. So, um, let's see. I'm not sure if I fully understand that geometric effect that you're talking about. One thing I know is that, for example, these half wave plate that we develop, they degrade its its accuracy as you go away from the line of sight. Now, the speed of that degradation is somewhat limited because these are actually high index material. So even though they come like pretty off axis, when it's coming through the sapphire inside, it actually becomes more straight. Um, but yes, so there are a lot of things that are not, so things are never perfect. Uh, we get to about 0.1% uh, of the temperature to polarization leakage level. Um, and we, you know, I think then we start to think about like how the pat what the pattern is, what the cancellation effect is and stuff. Uh, but you know, the older 0.1% is what we're But that's about. still a relatively small field of view, I guess. Uh, how many degrees field of view are you talking we're about? We're talking about 35 degrees of field of view. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. That is pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. We have one last question which is online. Uh -huh. And uh, please, Jan Can Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, can you comment on, on what uh, what your perspective for seeing the anisotropies is after we're, after all this activity? Of course, uh, not to say that we're not already really impressed by what's going to, uh, going to happen, um, but what is your perspective for seeing the anisotropies uh, afterwards? You mean the um, you mean the temperature fluctuations or or in yes, general? Yes, no, um, uh, just the, the the way forward after light bird and the CB stage four has happened. Uh, what what's your perspective on on that? Uh, well, yeah, activity. I typically CBHD, don't. CBHD, yeah. uh, Pico, all these kind of things that go even beyond this. Right. So I typically don't want to talk about things more than ten years because uh, you know I I don't want to be disappointed by myself failing to pr predict something. Um, but yeah, no, the, you know, CMBHD and PICO uh, things are interesting. Uh, we might get to the point where, you know, we are really limited about the primordial things, right? So the secondary things have probably a lot more to offer after that. And that's very interesting cosmology. Uh, but I'm not, you know, again, this is my limited knowledge. And I think theorists would be better people to ask this question to be more ambitious. And, you know, uh, you know, experimentalists should never say that it is impossible. I think this morning we were hearing about, you know, measuring R, uh, you know, three times 10 to the minus five, and we'll start to see some effect or stuff. And I'd love to hear those things because that's going to make us be more ambitious. But no, sorry, I don't think I have a good idea uh, to offer uh, for the primary CMB, you know, for the secondary things, you know, if we were to be ambitious, uh, you know, the uh, the SDS polarization and, you know, eventually get into major quadrupole from all those clusters and that sort of things would be pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, all, uh, but uh, no, I don't think I have very uh, concrete. And, and I guess there are things about uh, the, uh, the cosmic variance cancellation and actually the axion rotation thing it's one of those that can cancel the cosmic variance, right? So I think the, the ideas that can cancel the cosmic variance, uh, that could, could fly more. And again, that, that's probably, so that again, intrinsically is about the, uh, non, non primordial more, you know, after emission, it's going to have interactions at the, and, uh, you know, cross correlations with, uh, with the optical surveys and stuff as well. Um, yeah. Sorry. I don't, I don't think I have. Good answer to that. Okay. Uh, thanks, <laughs> Dr. Kusaka, thanks. for the nice talk and answering the questions. Let's see. Jens Schluba will be talking talking on new horizons and with CMB spectral distortions. First of all, yeah, thanks a lot for um, giving me the opportunity to actually uh, talk here, and I. Uh, I'm very, very sad that I couldn't um, come in person because uh, every time I, I visit uh, the Rama Research Institute, it's just a pleasure to be there, and uh, I uh, I can see uh, that that this is going to be a very exciting and nice meeting from all the uh, nice talks that are being uh, lined up, and uh, I still hope that um, that uh, even this remote uh, format will still uh, be be. Um, uh, I, I can communicate the excitement about the stuff that I'm going to be talking about right now. So um, uh, I. Uh, my my um, uh, my topic will be uh, changing now. Uh, I will talk about CMB spectral distortions. So we've just heard about the uh, exciting things that you can do with the temperature anisotropies and the temperature anisotropies. Uh, I'm including, uh, of course, uh, um, there's the the whole perspective on polarization anisotropies that we are going to see. But uh, I, I don't think I need to convince you that this is really exciting science, and uh, we have many things to come for the next decades. Uh, and, and potentially even beyond in connection with secondary uh, anisotropics, uh, as, we, as Akito was uh, just saying. But um, for my talk, I want to now uh, switch gears and forget about the anisotropics at least at the moment and um, focus uh, back uh, to the early days of uh, microwave background um, uh, science when we had Kobe Firas, uh, so the measurement of the absolute uh, sky spectrum. So this is now really the average sky spectrum. You don't have really any uh, directional dependence. And um, Kobe Firas has proven that uh, we are looking at a black body on average, uh, with a with uh, which is extremely uh, with a extremely high precision, consistent with the black body theoretical black body formula that we all love and all the Planckian spectrum. Um, 
And you can see there's these uh, numbers that are listed here. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Yes, yes, you can. We can. Okay, very good. Um, so the temperature uh, is known to the high, high precision. And then we have these upper limits on these parameters, mu and y. Uh, so mu and y are uh, parameters that are the classical parameters that describe uh, spectral distortions of the microwave background. So these, uh, these are describing departures of this red curve from the data, uh, from the uh, perfect, um, you know, black body formula. And um, spectral distortions are really about these departures. And as you can see from these parameters, um, uh, we will go into details now. Uh, these are uh, upper limits th that are, so there's no detection at this point of any spectral distortion on the average uh, sky. Okay, so spectral distortion is the classical types, the Y type and the mu type distortion. Um, the Y type distortion is known in connection uh, also with the, with the low redshift universe, the Sunya Selvich effect, uh, where you just imagine the CD is illuminating um, a hot cloud of electrons and you get the partial upscattering of uh, photons, uh, um, the CD photons, where you move the solid black body uh, curve into, uh, you know, the dashed curve here um, for a compensation parameter, which is pretty high. And it just means it's partial upscattering. Uh, uh, um, this is happening in the regime where energy exchange is inefficient. And um, uh, uh, for for uh, our early universe perspective, this is a distortion that occurs at low redshifts, which means uh, roughly uh, you know redshift of fifty thousand. So of course, those people who are looking at uh, twenty one centimeter signals and uh, all the stuff that is happening at late phases. Um, for them, this is extremely high redshifts, but for me, this is low redshifts. Whenever I say low redshifts, I mean low 50,000. So that's roughly a couple of thousand years after the fact. Um, then on, on the other hand, you have the uh, mu-type distortion, which is the other regime where you have uh, the energy exchange between electrons and photons. It's very rapid, and you can actually equilibrate the spectrum um, under a fixed number of, of photons. That is also why uh, the name chemical potential distortion is... Um, uh, illustrative because uh, normally we we know that photons don't have a chemical potential, but in the universe you need to actually supply photons to actually uh, restore a black body formula, and uh, especially if there's energy release or dis uh, some disturbance of the um, of the equilibrium between matter and radiation, uh, then this is ultimately the uh, the, the goal um, that you have to actually uh, reach, and it takes uh, you know a very long time to actually do that. Because thermalization processes are uh, fairly, uh, fairly uh, inefficient, um, unlike uh, normal lab physics where you have a cav cavity and the cavity walls uh, supply these photons. Um, so let's put this into perspective. This is um, a slide of you know the history of the universe, and I don't think I need to um, uh, elaborate on this. Um, when we talk about CD anisotropies, uh, we are normally looking at the last scattering surface, um, uh, the signals that become visible um, at this time of recombination, some 400,000 years after the bang. And uh, by studying the statistics, we look at in, want to learn about the initial conditions of the universe, and we have all these uh, interesting things happening at low redshifts, uh, secondary signs, um, and uh, the E and B modes uh, from polarization and uh, lensing and CB uh, uh, anisotropies from Sunya Selvich effect. Spectral distortions, they probe the thermal history in contrast of the universe. Uh, so um, any energetic processes that happen in the, uh, in the uh, cosmic evolution on average. And uh, in particular, they, they are sensitive to processes that happen in the pre-recombination era. Um, so you, uh, in principle, by looking at spectral distortions, you can look into the uh, early universe uh, in the pre-recombination universe. And um, this means that uh, spectral distortions open a new window to the early universe, uh, which which is ultimately meaning there is new observables that we have access to by looking at spectral distortions. And that is exactly what we really uh, need. We need new observables to put uh, limits on uh, the uh, cosmology we live in. And, and this is really exciting uh, opportunity uh, in, in principle. Um, now, to put the mu and y type uh, distortions in perspective, um, uh, this is you know, or, or goes back to work, of course, uh, um, I should have mentioned uh, by Seldovich and Sunyaev, uh, the Y-type distortion being the late-time distortion uh, here with the redshift roughly marked at 50,000. Um, uh, this probes the late uh, universe and the early universe physics comes from the new-type distortion because you need a cosmic dense environment to actually really uh, um, do this uh, equilibration process. Um, you need a very optically thick um, uh, medium in order to uh, create the new distortion. And then there's also what I call here the temperature error, uh, which is uh, in the pre-distortion um, error where you have thermalization extremely efficient. This is happening, uh, the temperature error is happening some uh, at some redshift of above uh, 2 million or so, which means a couple of months after the Big Bang. And um, we have now understood that uh, you can, in principle, 
the transition between the mu and y distortion is not abrupt, but you have uh, some some error, which is like a transition error, and that uh, actually includes some new information about time-dependent processes, the time dependence of the energy release, and um, uh, this means that you add another real dimension to these uh, um, uh, you know cosmic exploration by looking at the shape of the distortion. And um, there's also the helium and hydrogen recombination lines, which add another uh, era in which you can see uh, effects of uh, thermal physics and non-thermal uh, um, uh, out of equilibrium processes uh, from the recombination of the hydrogen and helium plasma. So this is all very exciting in terms of uh, uh, the, the global picture. And we can calculate these distortions now from the theoretical point of view very accurately. Uh, with uh, with uh, uh, here, I'm just highlighting the code Cosmotherm, which is uh, the one that I have been working on. Where you have multiple, uh, you know, energy release histories that you can uh, put in, and you can, uh, in a full time dependent way, uh, explore the distortion shapes. And we have added a lot of physics to this, um, uh, including Comptonization uh, with with a full redistribution kernel. We retreat the important processes like double Compton and branch tunneling very accurately. And we can uh, do multiple things uh, in this calculation that that really put this under a very solid uh, uh, footing in terms of uh, calculating what the signals could look like from different uh, scenarios. And um, we are not limited to just uh, doing um, the mu and y type uh, uh, distortions. Um, potentially uh, also uh, going beyond with uh, non-thermal uh, y type distortions, which uh, um, uh, which um, uh, Sandeep Ashaya and also Rishi Katri have been working on, uh, but I won't be going into details and also uh, not going into more details about other uh, uh, photon injection uh, distortions that you can uh, create by injecting actually photons instead of just uh, heat. So this uh, is just meant to give you the uh, the perspective that we know how to calculate these signals, and that means uh, just like with the CMB anisotropies, um, the physics going into the calculation is very well understood, and the, then we can focus on the uh, physics uh, that is creating the distortions, which is an exciting uh, perspective to take. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, CMB um, uh, limits from Kobe Firas. These numbers, as I said, are very small, and if you read uh, the slide on how uh, mu and white uh, is related to energy release, um, then that means that there's very little energy release. Uh, but why am I excited about all this? Because, you know, there's no average distortion that has been seen. And, um, you know, why, why is this important? The reason is because there's a whole range of uh, um, processes in the universe that you can uh, think about that create distortions. So here's, uh, you know, redshift. And uh, you can think of the uh, um, uh, y-axis as uh, sensitivity or signal level. Um, so here's a couple of missions on the right-hand side that I'm mentioning, and on the left-hand side, uh, as I said, it just gives you the guidance for uh, sensitivity. Uh, with fires having uh, um, having had uh, the uh, you know the pioneering sensitivity, um, which is uh, here on this figure in the very upper uh, upper part, and then uh, you know in the future we might access uh, different ex uh, sensitivity levels um, as we go. And uh, that means that you are opening, uh, you know, the the uh, discovery space for uh, non-standard distortion sources uh, relating to, for example, primordial black holes or um, a small-scale power dissipation, uh, decaying particles, and and things like uh, as such. Um, but we also have guaranteed signals, which are here highlighted in yellow, um, that come from you know physics that we know should happen. Which means we have uh, signals that we can actually target, and that is a really exciting perspective because you can develop your instrument to uh, go for this. Um, uh, so let's go back into the, uh, you know, give a, give a time frame of like what is, uh, what has, uh, the evolution and distortions been. And, um, you know, Kobe Firas is one of the, uh, is the pioneer, of course. Um, but, uh, we know, uh, that after, uh, Kobe, um, most of the activities went into the CMB anisotropies where Kobe, uh, was, you know, looking at the mapping of the sky and, uh, we had ever improving sensitivity and angular resolution sense. However, in the science of spectral distortions, we're still in the state basically t uh, 30 years from now. Um, uh, and that means that there is a lot of opportunity to go forward. Uh, some small steps were taken with instruments like TRIS and Arcade, which were ground and balloon based activities. Um, however, these uh, did not really, uh, you know, improve very much over the uh, COVID virus constraints. And the reason is, of course, because the atmosphere is very hard to overcome and, uh, you know, flight times and so on are limited. Um, this led then uh, in 2011 to the uh, proposal of Pixie, which is an instrument uh, that has become a strawman type of mission for spectral distortions. It is a fully transformed spectrometer that, um, you know, uh, by modulating the sky, 
uh, and uh, looking at um, the sky in two, uh, with two apertures is allowing to uh, measure both uh, things like the V-modes uh, back in the uh, days when the design was uh, brought up, um, but also by uh, you know putting a calibrator in front of one of the uh, uh, apertures to measure the spectral distortions. And the promise was that it would be improving by more than 1,000 times uh, the COVID virus limit. So that is just the 30 years of development and understanding in detectors and also our, you know, way to actually symmetrize uh, the setup uh, that will give these kind of uh, massive uh, um, improvements. And uh, here, just because Pixie is such an important uh, um, instrument, here's just a, a sketch of, uh, of these two um, apertures and you have the modulating um, uh, mirror that is uh, modulating the path between these two apertures and by interfering these two apertures uh, and put, uh, putting a calibrator in front, that's how we go forward. So this has inspired uh, Pixie was not going forward and was not being selected, although it is, of course, it got at that time very positive feedback. Um, this has then um, inspired multiple uh, incarnations or reincarnations of, uh, of Pixie um, uh, and, uh, you know, improved versions uh, with multiple copies of Pixie and so on. Uh, but then, um, again, uh, the, the, the time frame, uh, there was there was no um, no selection of any of these activities. In the meantime, from the ground, and there have been um, new activities coming, uh, uh, starting with Absera, the idea of Absera, which is uh, uh, led by the Raman Research Institute, and I will say a few more words in a second. And Cosmo, um, another ground-based experiment uh, looking at uh, mu and white type or the white type distortion in particular. Uh, from uh, uh, from Dome C uh, at the Antarctica, and then TMS, uh, Tenerife Microwave Spectrometer, which um, uh, looks at uh, spectral distortion in an absolute sense from one to uh, from ten to uh, twenty gigahertz, so at a very low frequency end from the ground, and then Bizu as a balloon-borne activity that Bruno Maffei is leading um, as a as a way forward. So uh, let me just say a few words. Absera is uh, targeting, um, or the idea of Absera is to target the recombination lines in a, in a very low frequency range. And um, uh, so the two to six gigahertz where you see some recombination ripples that you uh, can in principle target and measure. And I was extremely excited uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, well, actually not weeks now, it's already month. We had a, a workshop uh, at the Raman Research uh, at the Leiden um, uh, Lawrence Center, and Mayuri was there reporting as well, and she uh, kindly shared some of the slides that she had, um, where she showed that there's actually activity uh, in prototype development of this. And I think it is not, uh, it is really important to mention that these activities from the ground and balloon are extremely crucial for, you know, um, paving the path uh, towards the space mission that will, of course, uh, then not have to struggle with, uh, with, uh, uh, things like the atmosphere, but it's exciting to see that this is going on. And in a similar way, um, Cosmo at Dome C, there is active uh, development. And this is led by the group Las Fienza with Elia Battistelli and uh, Paolo Di Bernardes and um, um, Silvia Massi. Here is actually a picture that was shared with me of the cryostat and, you know, things um, uh, going on where um, Elia is, uh, is here working on the cryostat and uh, Silvia is behind uh, the cryostat. I, of course, as a theorist, I always need like a real observation as well. So I was trying to figure out is this really, uh, really true or just did this, uh, was this like some deep, deep fake? Um, but in reality, I was just visiting La Sapienza and looked at, um, you know, some of the elements that they have. So here's some part of the uh, cooler. Um, there is uh, the f frequency modulating mirror that would be, uh, you know, looking at uh, modulating uh, between the, um, the uh, internal calibrator and the outside. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, you know, very interesting to see that there are some of the detector pixels and I was even able with my iPhone to take some picture, a picture of some of the, you know, small little um, uh, electronics inside um, uh, these detector arrays. And it made me extremely happy afterwards, uh, you know, uh, just having seen this uh, by, by, by myself. And it's really uh, going and moving forward. In a similar way, I could have put some pictures about TMS. You can see the calibrator and all these things already. Uh, something that is actively happening. So this is really exciting. Um, we also, as a community, have had uh, you know a lot of uh, development um, gearing up towards you know uh, preparing for the science case. We had some meeting in uh, in uh, 2015 um, in Chicago where we brought together people. Here is a, a picture of a meeting that uh, was happening in CERN, um, where Subud Patil and and several other people were involved in organizing and also uh, you know obviously in the audience here you can see Suvia um, happy Rashid is uh, sitting in the front row also seeing their activity and, and being really happy about uh, you know things happening 
and Joe's still talking actually about the plans of maybe going to the moon um, to to really uh, you know measure spectral distortions. And uh, some of these ideas are are, are rekindling uh, currently in the in the setup. And um, this brought then uh, from this activity we we had multiple additional proposals uh, trying to say, say um, you know spectral distortions is a great target and we should dedicate a mission to this. However, again, nothing uh, no uh, mission got selected. Uh, and I was actually wondering just uh, last night what was actually what is actually happening in the in terms of CMD Barrett because initially that also had the idea of having a spectrometer, but we have heard mo mostly about CMD anisotropies uh, and the future of CMD anisotropies with CMD Barrett in terms of um, you know uh, uh, activities uh, in the recent years. So I, I was actually bringing wanted to bring up that question: what is happening in that direction? Um, so the activities are not stopped with all these you know quote unquote. Um, in vain proposals because we have, uh, you know, uh, pushed in, in ESA in Europe, uh, we have pushed the idea and uh, with several white papers and spectral distortions were actually recognized as one of the goals of the 2050 uh, long term framework um, of uh, ESA. And this is one of the reasons why I uh, had the question about what is beyond the, um, you know, uh, uh, temperature uh, polarization and other trophies. And, um, uh, uh, this is certainly something that would be uh, in, you know, in a similar time frame. So spectral distortions as one of the targets. And we had just recently uh, this workshop on, uh, on spectral distortions at the Lawrence Center. I'm seeing that my time is um, uh, already shrinking. I should uh, speed up a little bit. I wanted to very quickly uh, go through a couple of these examples. I, of course, have no time to really go into details. But um, realization and structure formation is one of those things that will create spectral distortion signals that will inevitably be measured with the pixie type or even with uh, with measure activities from the ground. So this is, you know, spectral distortion as we would see it at different frequencies today. And uh, this is an absolute term. So this is a wide type distortion with a crossing frequency of uh, 150, uh, 217 gigahertz. This is a known uh, signal that everybody knows. And this is something that would be detectable with high precision. Um, Relativistic corrections at the level of precision that we reach will become important and visible, uh, which means that we are able to go beyond the standard mu and y type uh, uh, signals, which is, um, you know, we can extend to the high frequency domain of um, of the uh, spectral distortions from the mu type uh, and y type distortion. And this is exciting because uh, it will be giving us the opportunity to actually look at the temperature of the universe um, and measure it spectroscopically. We can, uh, at least the average temperature, we can determine this. And the signal that we're looking at is already much smaller now than the main signal, but it is still something that is within reach of, you know, pixie type experiment uh, with no problem. Um, and it would give us about uh, information about feedback processes and where in the big parameter space, uh, you know, simulations and uh, and uh, activities um, uh, that, that um, uh, that uh, that uh, study feedback processes uh, would be lying. And the pixie error bar, you know, this is the error ellipse that we are currently having in terms of the whole uh, range of simulation predictions, but pixie would be able to zoom in on, on this very, very uh, tiny parameter space. Um, I think one of the reasons why spectral distortions are really exciting for the future is the dissipation of acoustic modes. And uh, this is just uh, simply related to the temperature and the droplets that we see. Um, we know the measurements of the power spectrum, and we heard uh, about the exciting uh, prospects for polarization. The um, power spectrum drops like a rock at small scales. And this is just coming from the fact that inflation after inflation has been the evolution through the universe. And this damping process uh, related to silk damping has just erased these anisotropies. And this erasure is, is uh, essentially, um, you know, equivalent to an energy release process that will give us a distortion signal. The physics is very simple. It's basically two black bodies. Uh, if you think about two patches that have two temperatures, um, one with a slightly higher and one with a slightly lower temperature, and you just shake the box and mix it, you will get a, um, an average spectrum that is not consistent with the spectrum of the average temperature. This is just a simple statement of if you mix black bodies, you, mixing two Planckians doesn't give you a Planckian. So this is the origin of a wider distortion that then starts standardizing. And that is how you can learn about small scale power. Um, indeed, this kind of process has, back in the days, been used directly to uh, put constraints on the power spectrum because it is sensitive to uh, power spectrum scales that are outside of the range that the CMB anisotropies can, uh, can uh, you know, uh, target. And um, this was one of the first limits, in fact, on 
what is the spectral index of scalar perturbations um, uh, after the COVID virus uh, or DMR measurements at the very larger scales. Um, we can now calculate the signal uh, very with high, very high precision. This is, uh, you know, based on work um, uh, that I did with Richie Katri and uh, uh, Rashid Sonyaev, where we uh, des described the dissipation process. And the signal would be this red line. So you see that it's already getting quite close to the um, signal level, uh, uh, sensitivity level of a, a pixie type experiment. And um, I don't have time to go into the details, but I want to highlight really that we're uh, um, able to, uh, you know, target the, the um, amplitude of uh, spectral uh, of perturbations at scales that are much much smaller than uh, what uh, you know the CMD anisotropies are directly probing, and this means that you're opening a window, a new window to measuring the amplitude of fluctuations in scales that we have not um, directly seen. Um, and the virus constraint already from just linear physics puts you a pretty strong limit on at the level of you know ten to minus five, ten to minus four um, on these fluctuations. Um, but you could with Pixie and something beyond Pixie, you could go uh, many orders of magnitude steeper. Um, and this is exciting because it is another way of probing our inflationary paradigm. And uh, in particular, when we think about things like primordial black holes enhancing the power at small scales, you know, you have to get to this enhancement of power in some way. And then, you know, spectral distortions would be a way to test the transition between uh, different um, uh, mass ranges of uh, primordial black holes um, supposedly uh, existing in the early universe. So this is exciting and something that people uh, are going to be uh, thinking about also in synergy with, with gravitational waves. And um, in the talk by Subud, you will hear about spectral distortions, how they you know, probe tensor fluctuations as well. So I'm not going to go into details here, but leave that to Subot to explain. But this is also another exciting aspect because it is really a, a way of looking at scales that are not probed with other activities. Um, I want to uh, just highlight one more um, aspect. I, I believe I have like, how many minutes have, do I have you for have, my regular talk time? You have six minutes roughly. Okay, good. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, uh, yes. So um, uh, the uh, the spectral distortions that I've talked about right now are all just isotropic uh, signals, but you can in principle think about anisotropic distortion signals as well. And one of those, um, uh, you know, effects that lead to anisotropic spectral distortions is coming from um, uh, the correlation of large scale and small scale um, acoustic modes, which is leading essentially to a modulation of the heating rate in different directions. And in that way, lead to anisotropic distortion signals. We have been talking about heating just happening uniformly uh, in the previous uh, scenarios. And here you now have anisotropic heating. So you can look at spectral distortion anisotropies. And um, one source of this anisotropy is related to primordial number sanity and the ultra squeeze limit. So the local type FNL type uh, number sanity that you can test. And um, just to highlight uh, modulation, you know, the CMB anisotropies, they probe scales that are very large scale again. Uh, the Y type distortion would go into the regime of, you know, some few uh, up to um, like a few tens of uh, inverse megaparsecs. And then you have the mu type distortions and even higher, uh, you know, higher order effects at uh, even smaller scales um, coming from, you know, scales of a thousand and ten thousand inverse megaparsecs. So um, the uh, mu distortion anisotropies would be related to anisotropic uh, correlations between these large scale modes and the small scale modes, which means you're looking at very, very squeeze limit uh, signals. And this is in principle um, a very exciting um, uh, direction. And we have actually shown with Aditya Roti that you can um, already from Planck, uh, you can already put, um, you know, limits on this kind of spectral distortion anisotropies. Um, and you don't need any absolute calibration because you can look at the difference in the sky and standard foreground methods that we're all familiar with um, for separation of uh, CMB anisotropy signals, they can be used to do this kind of science. Now, the numbers that you come up with are in the few thousand in FNL, but I want to, you know, all those people who have uh, thought about longer sanity and who also know the limits from uh, Planck, which are at the, currently in the, in, at the level of, uh, you know, order five um, as an upper limit, they will say, oh, but this is like not competitive at all with Planck. This is absolutely correct. But this is probing very different scales. So we actually have a new observable, which is uh, able to look at scale dependence of the non sanity. So in that sense, uh, you can actually go and, um, you know, really uh, improve 
our understanding of this anisotropic uh, heating mechanism uh, by looking at these anisotropies. And of course, the reason why the, the sensitivity is relatively uh, low is because anisotropies are already, uh, they are building on a small signal and you're looking at the modulation of that signal and the correlation of temperature modes and distortion modes. Um, so this is a hard measurement. But nevertheless, this is a new number that we can look at. And in the future, we might be getting into the level of um, a thousand or even below uh, a thousand. So this is, um, you know, a test of uh, non-Russian fluctuations at small scales. And I, uh, this is not stopping there because we have just recently actually shown that even the average energy release science connects to spectral distortion anisotropies. And I don't have time to go into details, but we can calculate from the decaying particle scenarios, we can calculate what would be the spectral distortion anisotropies that you see. And you can see the acoustic peaks, uh, um, just like in the standard CD anisotropies, but now in a time-sliced manner um, uh, manifesting in these correlations that would be allowing you to constrain average angles at least. And Lightbird, uh, as well as Pico, would be able to improve over the average energy release constraint uh, of FIRAS by uh, some uh, uh, amount that is actually very interesting, in particular if we don't get the spectrometer to measure the absolute sky. So this is uh, open new synergy, uh, synergistic uh, you know, studies in the uh, spectral distortion direction. Um, I have uh, one slide about um, particle physics, but I don't want to go into details. There's multiple things like decaying particles and annihilating particles, also interactions of the, uh, dark matter with uh, standard model particles, photon injection scenarios. There's a rich phenomenology uh, which you can look at. And, um, you know, in principle, uh, one can pick the favorite game, um, model and try to uh, um, convert some of those limits into spectral distortion signals uh, and uh, th therefore then uh, uh, limits on the decaying particle or um, uh, particle physics. And I want to highlight that um, FIRAS has been there for a long time. And in fact, some of the limits are still the strongest limits now. So just imagine we had an improvement of limits. We would be overcoming many of the uh, existing limits here, just uh, an illustration in terms of the uh, dark matter decaying particles. Okay, so one last uh, topic that I want to just spend uh, a couple of sentences, uh, slides on, uh, is the recombination lines. The recombination process is, of course, something that has been, you know, studied uh, already since many, many uh, decades, um, going back to work by Sadovich, Kurt, Kurt and Sambiaev, um, just to describe the decoupling of the universe. And it is very important for the CMB anisotropies, but it's also associated with <clears throat> the emission of photons. And the uh, photons, the distribution is this very rich um, photon injection distortion, and it has many, many different lines. And I mentioned it in, in connection with uh, Absera, uh, where the target would be, you know, the ripples at low frequencies, but you also have these rich uh, imprint um, at high frequencies um, after redshifting uh, from uh, redshift 1000 uh, to us. And uh, this would be a way to do cosmology just in like in the standard way, because we, we have the parameter dependencies and we can now calculate these signals with high precision um, and uh, confidently so that we can in principle forecast sensitivities that are required uh, to uh, put constraints on parameters. And here's just from the um, um, uh, 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 forecast that we did with Aditya Roti and uh, Lucard, uh, where we just show the potential for you know, measuring the recommendation lines with a very uh, futuristic um, experiments. And uh, I want to highlight because of the features, in fact, the foreground challenge is less for spectral distortions from the recommendation epoch than uh, you would imagine. And um, uh, because you have many uh, ripples to actually use to discern uh, with foregrounds, and uh, this opens the way to look at the universe at these, you know, multiple epochs from the recommendation uh, of hydrogen and helium and uh, W ionized helium at different, you know, epochs um, in redshift, uh, corresponding to quite different epochs in, in real uh, cosmological time. And if there's non-standard things happening between any of these um, eras, you would be seeing this reflected in the recommendation lines, which is um, a really exciting opportunity to, to think about uh, the recommendation lines. Dr. In Schubert? one direction, for example, perturbed recommendation and so Schubert, can so you if wrap I want up in minute, one or two, one or two minutes? Yes. I will, I will wrap up. Um, there is the elephant in the room, which is foregrounds and signal, uh, you know, signals contaminating things. Um, and uh, this is, of course, going to be one of the biggest challenges uh, to really go forward and it means that, you know, if we want to do spectral distortion science without going into details, we need to have very high precision, extreme control of systematics and, um, you know, many, many frequency channels that we can work with, uh, which is, of course, putting us into the very futuristic, you know, designs of, uh, of spectrometers. 
and we will have to worry about all kinds of effects like spatial averaging effects and uh, you know what is the uh, um, fluctuating signals and so on um, and uh, I want to just highlight that our uh, all the forecasts that we have done are based basically just on frequency information and with you know different levels of sensitivities uh, that come from you know designs of Fourier transform spectrometers however um, you know the information in spatial information uh, um, uh, fluctuations can be helping to of course also separate foregrounds and uh, to um, tackle you know some of these issues so I don't want to go into details more but we have the machinery to do this and um, uh, uh, I just uh, say that this is, uh, you know, not as far away from home as many people think, because we can apply machinery that is also known in CMB, anisotropy, and B models. The signals are not very dissimilar. They are at the le level of nano Kelvin or tens of nano Kelvin, which is precisely the level of sensitivities that we are reaching now in the anisotropies. But we need to uh, drill through a lot of programs. So this is the end of my my talk, and I leave you with this slide just to highlight that. There's lots of opportunities, really interesting, um, you know, science, some standard science, but also non-standard science uh, that uh, we can, you could maybe tap into. And we have activities, but we really ultimately need something that is really pushing this uh, frontier into, you know, something that uh, is, has been dormant, at least from the experimental side, uh, side, for 30 years, for more than 30 years. And if we ever want to have a space mission, unfortunately, we need to probably think um, not 10 years, uh, but we need to think, uh, think 20 years in preparation and really going forward. And uh, again, as one of the questions for for this uh, workshop as well, um, what is happening with CMB Barat? What is the ideas in spectral distortions there? Um, and it's really one of the things that is, uh, you know, could be a really um, uh, important uh, new angle on our cosmology. And I leave you with that thought um, and, and, and take questions. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much for the nice talk. We have time for quick two, three questions. Uh, Jens, I am uh, Tarun, and I just wanted to thank you for making uh, the effort to, you know, reach out remotely, although you couldn't come. And I, I should just no, 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 uh, no problem. wanted Sorry. to add that the, you're talking to a uh, full auditorium in Raman Research Institute. And, and thanks for, uh, you know, bringing back attention on CMB Varit. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure also I would have been managing to keep my time a bit better if I would have seen people's faces be, uh, become a little bit grim. You know, again, so you need to wrap up. I'm sorry about uh, having, having, having been a bit quick and also a little bit uh, long. Yeah, there is one more question. I, c I cannot hear oh, it now. Uh, sorry, I haven't started. I haven't started talking. Yet. Hello, Hens. Um, it's <coughs> it's Matt Dobbs here. Um, the the hunger of the community for future measurements of spectral discussions is just immense. We see this in the number of theoretical papers that come out and the number of proposed experiments. Yet our our best limits are thirty years old, and we flew Arcade now ten years ago, I think it is, and and the result the limits from that don't don't compete with with Kobe what why why is this next step you know it, it has to be a staircase up to this future space thing that, that everyone wants to do why is this next next step so hard and what's what's the thing that's going to unlock it in terms of making a measurement that would make these future space measurements credible well um, so first of all one should say that arcade was measuring at uh, quite low frequencies for for the spectral distortion science you know it was in the 10 uh, gigahertz regime and the arcade excess uh, you know manifested there in the uh, you know 1 to 8 or 3 8 uh, gigahertz uh, that's a very different uh, regime uh, to measure in and so in de facto um, an FTS in the uh, uh, in the range of FIRAS has not been flown uh, since FIRAS. So um, uh, improving um, over FIRAS with an FTS in this range is actually something that is technologically really not not um, a, a hard task. Um, uh, and factors of you know to reach the wide type distortion. So an order of magnitude improvement is something that people are uh, even confident to do uh, from from the ground now with a future setup of of these kind of uh, experiments, potentially, um, you know, again, flying on a balloon. One of the limitations is, of course, the atmosphere and knowing how to modulate the atmosphere so that you can drill through this is a challenge. Um, it adds a lot of noise. Uh, and then in addition, the flight times for balloons uh, is, a, is a limiting factor. Um, but if we had even a moderate uh, or even a small satellite mission 
um, we would be, you know, immediately going many orders of magnitudes over over uh, virus. The technology is not the problem. This is well-known technology. It's virus on steroids to do this. And um, it is just a matter of, you know, actually getting the funding to do it. And even the activities from the ground um, is not as easy to uh, get get going because you need uh, somebody to give you the, the money to actually build this. And in that sense, all these activities like um, Absera, uh, Cosmet, Dome C, um, and TMS, which indeed are things that have uh, some uh, some activity really starting and going and some level of funding, these are extremely important to get the community um, excited about this again. So I, I think... Um, arcade is quite different from a virus uh, too. So um, this is this is my 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 main answer. Thank you. Oh, last question. Yeah, uh, it's just a comment. Uh, thanks, Jens. Uh, so just to add to that, I have a update that I've not yet shared with you. So uh, I'll take this opportunity. I'm happy to share that uh, the first. Uh, room temperature element uh, or prototype for Apsara has recently been awarded a grant. So in terms of funding, we're not quite where we need to be to detect the actual distortions, uh, but we have made a good start. We have got funding for a room temperature single element prototype for Apsara recently. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, and again, this this kind of work is extremely crucial for for getting, getting uh, the ball rolling again. And, um, you know, the uh, the fact that we are having to undo many many decades of no no um, real push. Uh, this is really a hard hard work, and uh, and these kind of activities are are absolutely key to this, and um, you know to build uh, and to explore and also to improve existing limits. Thanks, thanks very much for the talk as well as answering the questions. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Jens. And we should definitely appreciate he's been pulling an all-nighter, I believe, uh, for this talk. So, uh, yeah. I, I have to get, I get up anyways now, so it's okay. <laughs> thanks, you. Thank you so much. So, welcome to the second session of the forenoon of the first day of the conference. There will be three sets of talks. These are 22 plus three minutes talk. The first will be given by Dr. Tuhin Ghosh on characterization of the galactic foregrounds for current and future generation CMB experiments. So I'm Tuhin Ghosh, so I talk about the characterization of galactic foregrounds for current and future generation CMB experiments. So foregrounds is something uh, in this talk, I'm focusing mostly on the CMB B modes, but foregrounds are important for extracting the cosmological signal. So foregrounds are also important uh, for uh, epoch generation study also. So, uh, so basic goal is to understand the foregrounds and characterize so that we can just peel it off from the sky observation and get to the cosmological signal. So, this peeling of the foregrounds can be in the, done can be done in the map space or in using the likelihood analysis and can be done in the power spectrum space. So, this is the uh, timeline for awareness of about foregrounds. So, before 2014, people don't care about foregrounds. So, so it started from bicep 2 claim, uh, which is R of 0.2. So that time, uh, people believe that there are sky regions uh, where, or the clean sky regions where foregrounds are either subdominant or uh, is not there. So you can directly observe the sky and get to the CMB B modes. So after this, uh, that time Planck has observations, uh, high frequency observation at 353 gigahertz. So Planck, uh, so I was part of the Planck collaboration and we wrote this paper where we look at 353 gigahertz, how much is the dust R? So this is uh, denoted by R dust. So this R dust is different from R CMB. And uh, what is found is that R dust is order of 0 0.2 everywhere. There is no clean sky regions. So some regions which are value is less, but the error bars are high. So we cannot say there is uh, any clean region on the sky based on 353 gigahertz. So this is done at 353 and then extrapolate to 150 gigahertz, which is the observation of the bicep patch. Uh, so based on this result, uh, so the, the, both the teams start working together in 2015. And then they, when they cross correlate the bicep data with the Planck 353 gigahertz data, so they found that there is a uh, strong correlation or like uh, between the two data set and dust cannot be ignored. So after that, uh, in their likelihood analysis, the dust is always included in the analysis. 
Uh, so around 2015, Planck also came with a second data release. Uh, it's not 353 gigahertz. It also includes the frequency from 30 to 353 gigahertz in the polarization data. And uh, the synchrotron is also found to be highly polarized. So in principle, synchrotron can be a problem. So it's not that at 150, if you can just observe, and if you lower the frequency, uh, if you lower more, uh, goes to like 30 or 40 gigahertz, uh, synchrotron start to be dominating factor. Uh, so while these things are going on, uh, in 2016, uh, Planck came with the evidence of dust decorrelation. So this is another level of complexity. So earlier people assumed that dust is correlated. So if you measure in one frequency, you can extrapolate to other frequency with a single like modified black body spectrum. Uh, what is found is that uh, you, the, due to dust decorrelation, the pattern of the dust correlation changes with frequency. So it means that the cross power spectrum has less power compared to the auto power spectrum. So that is another level of complexity which is never people thought about it, uh, which which can be due to the dust uh, spectral index variation, which is an important thing, or the polarization angle of dust changes with frequency. So I will uh, detail this uh, later on the talk. And then there was a lot of effort going on to whether there is a dust decorrelation in the data or not. So uh, so. Later on, Planck reanalyzed the data, 2018 data, and they put an upper limit on the dust decorrelation. They don't detect it. So in this paper, they detect, uh, first time they detect it, but uh, later on it turns out that it is because of the systematics present in the data, which is not accounted for. Uh, so then 2018, uh, there was a Planck legacy release. There was more frequency now and more clean data. So better systematics are well understood. Uh, while doing this, uh, what is found is there is something called dust uh, synchrotron correlation. So dust and synchrotron are not independent. They are also correlated because the origin is a large scale gravity field, which is common for both. And also there are spectral index variation or the spatial variation uh, of the dust, which uh, if you do in likelihood space, you cannot do just uh, square them up. There is a moment approach and Jens Schulber, he works on that. That is uh, something which people are pursuing now that how to take into account the spatial variation uh, in terms of moment approach. Okay, so this talk I'm talking mostly about the CMB experiment from uh, where we learned about the foregrounds. So that is mostly from Planck, uh, which is 32, 53 giga, 857 gigahertz. Uh, then uh, WMAP data, which is low frequency to understand the synchrotron. So this model has a lot of degeneracy to break the degeneracy. If you have more data, it will be useful so that you can use them as a prior. Uh, so these are uh, full sky observations. So we can learn about the statistics of foregrounds at large scale. Then we can validate this model in the small sky observations like BICEP, which is observing 1% of the sky in this frequency range, 95, 150, and 220. So we can test what we observe at large scale. The statistical properties is applicable to the uh, small scale observation. And these models, uh, are like what is gone into BICEP analysis, the model is motivated by the observation from Planck and WMAP. And all this experiment, uh, which we are uh, using now, it is all the foreground modeling or characterization of foregrounds. It is useful for future generation or current generation or future generation experiments. So in current generation, there is a CMB S4, Simons Observatory, and future is like a light bird. So, uh, so basically what we are interested in is CMB B mode. So it has two contribution, which is a primordial B mode and the lensing B mode. And the total is supposed we are trying to detect. Uh, so lensing B mode is well determined now. It's just the primordial B mode uh, whose amplitude we don't know. Okay. So uh, so we are trying to detect this peak uh, at around L is equal to 80 and L is equal to 2. So L is equal to 2 is uh, L is equal to 180 is recombination peak and L is equal to 2 is the reanimation peak. So the main challenge is the foregrounds. So here I'm showing the foregrounds. So this is the signal that we are trying to detect. So this is plotted for R is equal to 0 0.01, 10 to the minus 2. And all the future generation space experiment like CMB Bharat or PICO, they are targeting for 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4. So, uh, so this is the level of foregrounds from 1% to 90% of the sky. So even if you go to very clean region, uh, the level of foregrounds is higher than the signal that we are trying to detect. So we have to rely on the component separation method or to under in the model of the foreground so that we can effectively remove these foregrounds to get to this signal. Uh, and all this knowledge about the foregrounds, it is mostly from the large scale. So it is around degree scale, L is equal to 200. 
above that we don't know what is the foldouts because we don't have observation so we just extrapolate what we learn but maybe we have surprises like there are other foldouts like co line emission which can be polarized which can also contribute at small scales okay so we are assuming that whatever model we have uh, it extrapolates to uh, large area and the same thing is shown here at uh, for the bicep uh, from the bicep paper so uh, so plank detect this dust at like three sigma level at for their patch uh, but they are now doing uh, more and more uh, high frequency observations so this is at 220 they detect the dust at very high significance the synchrotron is uh, they put upper limit so it's not detected in that uh, patch so uh, this signal that they are interested is r of n to minus 2 and this any frequency observed the foregrounds are much higher than the signal that we are interested in so it's important to know about the foregrounds and what is its property so that we can put in the standard component separation likelihood uh, analysis and trying to extract this and see what are the errors if you make in the modeling which will propagate to leads to a bias in the estimation of r so the for the foregrounds so i basically uh, focus on two dominant foregrounds which is the synchrotron polarization and the dust polarization so synchrotron polarization is because of the uh, relativistic cosmic ray electron which is oscillating around the gravity magnetic field so it can be polarized to very high frequency uh, high, highly polarized up to 70% but typically because of the line of sight projection we see uh, around 20% polarization so it has a steep power spectrum of 3.13 and uh, at very low frequency it's contaminated by uh, Faraday rotation at high frequency we don't see this so we have very good template uh, uh, from WMAP and Planck to understand uh, and constrain the statistics of the foregrounds of the synchrotron foregrounds so this is dominant up to 80 gigahertz uh, and after that the dust start dominating so the dust polarization is because of this spherical dust grains which are aligned with the galactic magnetic field uh, so they precess around the gravity magnetic field, so absorb the light in the long axis, uh, which they emit yeah, in the microwave frequencies or infrared frequencies. So by uh, studying the dust properties or dust polarization, we can learn about the structure of gravity magnetic field, how well these dust grains are aligned with the gravity magnetic field, and by looking at the SED, uh, how the what is the dust property at different frequency, we can know what is the property of the dust physics. So this is uh, interesting itself, but uh, for uh, for cosmology or for CMB, uh, what we are interested in is mostly what is the spectral in index of the dust and uh, how much dust decolates or whether there is a decolation or not. So this is the uh, blank maps at different uh, after component separation. So these are the first row is the CMB map, then the synchrotron map, and the dust map. So you can see the dust map looks very different uh, in polarization compared to what we see in intensity. So usually in this model, what is assumed is that the synchrotron has a power law power spectrum and dust has a modified black body power spectrum. So that is a very simple model which they use to make this uh, maps. But if you if this model is not correct, uh, you can have leakage from one component to another, uh, even some leakage from foregrounds, uh, dust or synchrotron to CMB maps. Okay, so why it is important to study this? Uh, the, this is shown by Matthew Demasa in 2016 paper, where they, uh, where he, what he did is that, uh, so this is in a Bayesian way. You are mod, you are fitting the data with a three component fit with a CMB, dust, and synchrotron. So if you make an error in the modeling that the dust, suppose it's a modified black body, if you assume in your likelihood analysis, but suppose it is a two modified black body, so it will lead to a bias. So you can have a false detection because you don't have a correct model of the dust or the synchrotron. Or there are uh, other things like spinning dust which you ignored in the analysis or there is a synchrotron curvature instead of power law, it, it steepens with the uh, frequency, then it leads to a bias. So for all this analysis, what is showing is that if you do it in a blind way, it is fine. But if you are doing in a Bayesian way, uh, the model what you are putting in it is important if the model is wrong it will lead to a bias in the estimation of r so whatever input you put you may not you may recover uh, some larger values so then i focus on uh, about the dust and the synchrotron what we know and where uh, people are working uh, now so one of the things simple thing is that we have 353 gigahertz dust map so we can just look at the peak or maxima in the maps and just stack them so when you stack them uh, in, in 
at the peak location we see there is a peak in E and V mode. So, this is uh, just stacking at the location of the peaks. This is uh, at the location you calculate the local curvature and do ori oriented stacking and stack. So, when you do a oriented stacking you see a preferred direction uh, it is natural, but here uh, you can see that there is a T correlation which is the first time it was detected and there is a TV correlation. So, dust also produce TB correlation and if you do the same thing for CMV, you do not see anything. So, there is TB is 0 uh, in this uh, thing. So, this uh, it is not clear why there is a TB in the dust which is a parity violation uh, and this TB is important to understand because it can lead uh, because it is used for experiments to do absolute ang polarization angle calibration. So, for CMV TB is 0 the foreground is non-zero, usually people assume the TB to be zero and calibrate the uh, instrument. So, uh, it is good to know that uh, for dust it is non-zero. Then uh, to learn about the property of the dust, what we do is we combine all the available data set. So, mostly here the Planck frequency maps uh, and the WMAP data set and we look at the large sky fraction to calculate what is the statistical property of that. So, uh, while do because we are interested in foreground, so we can subtract the CMB at the map level and see uh, and study the spectrum. So, here uh, we use the model where uh, there is a power law for the synchrotron and modify black body for the dust. So, this is a cross uh, power spectrum between two frequencies and also introduce uh, dust synchrotron correlation. So, it is not just two component, uh, they can be correlated. Uh, uh, L by L uh, as a function of sky region. So, while doing that uh, we can get what is the spectrum of the or the amplitude of the dust. So, what we found is that uh, they more or less follow power law. So, usually people assume it is power law, but you can see from the plot that uh, it is a good fit, but uh, it is not necessary that single power law holds for all the L's. So, there are some points which uh, you can see that it start deviating. So, you can look at the B modes and the slope is also not a uniform. Uh, so, it changes from uh, region to region. So, what is extra thing what we find is that there is a T correlation. So, we can calculate RTE which is the correlation coefficient of the dust uh, which is more or less uh, constant uh, as a function of multipoles. Uh, there is a EB asymmetry. So, there is more power in E mode than B mode. So, the red points are always above than the blue points and this EB asymmetry is factor of 2. Okay. So, E mode has uh, factor of 2 more power than the B mode. So, these are the new things uh, which we found. So, this is important because uh, in uh, CMB uh, R estimation, we can always combine E and B and we can put this as a prior that E to B ratio for the dust is uh, 2. Okay. So, once we know what is the amplitude, so we if you fit a power law, so we know what is the amplitude at L is equal to uh, AT, we can uh, study as a function of uh, sky region. So, if you go from uh, uh, low latitude to high latitude which is the fainter sky region. So, it more or less follow uh, mean intensity square. Okay. And just for reference, I put uh, bicep region here. So, what whatever we are learning from uh, large scale region, it applies to uh, bicep field also. So, it is slightly lower, it does not fall on the middle line, but there is a uh, cosmic variance. So, this is a statistical quantity. So, this is a mean spectrum that we are finding, but there is a statistical variation around this mean line and bicep is consistent with this uh, mean line. So, it is useful to, uh, so any patch in for future generation experiment, you can from this curve, you can actually predict how much dust you expect in that uh, uh, patch. Then uh, in the power spectrum level, we can study TB and EB correlation. So, we see, so the red points is TB correlation and the blue point is EB correlation. So, EB correlation is consistent with 0 for the dust, but for uh, uh, all the red points, there is a, even there are large error bars, they are always up compared to this mean line. So, we detect this non-zero TB correlation even in the power spectrum level. So, previously I showed from the stacking analysis, now it is in the power spectrum level and people are searching for the what is the answer. So, one of the possible explanation is that there is a 
filament the ism is a filamentary uh, in nature and there is a uh, there is a misalignment between the filament direction and the galactic field which can lead to this uh, tb correlation so that was shown in this uh, clark 2021 uh, paper but this is only true for the filament region but this property is a statistical property so it is true at large scale where there is no filament and in general it is true so so that is something uh, people are trying to find what is the explanation of this tb non zero tb for the dust uh, for acd uh, so what is the spectral energy uh, like uh, spectral energy distribution of the acd so that we can extrapolate from th th any frequency to higher frequency to lower frequency uh, so, we find that it is uh, very close to what we find for the intensity. So, there is a, a small difference of order of 0 0.05. So, this is important because in polarization we do not have high signal to noise. So, we can always use intensity uh, spectral index as a proxy for uh, the spectral energy dis distribution for the polarization. So, for intensity when we use this. Uh, we will find that uh, the special variation cannot be account when you do in the power spectrum it cannot be accounted by a simple uh, modified black body spectrum uh, the another thing what we uh, find is the dust synchrotron correlation so at high frequency we have dust at low frequency we have synchrotron but when we do a cross power spectrum we find this uh, 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 points which are much higher than uh, the expected line. So, this is due to the dust uh, singleton correlation and this dust singleton correlation is dominant at uh, large scale. When we go to smaller scale, it is consistent uh, with zero. Okay. So, then uh, I talk about the dust decorrelation. So, usually we do when we are looking at the line of sight, it is not just single cloud. There are multiple clouds with a different direction of magnetic field, different temperature, different emissivity. So, when we combine them, uh, it is expected that uh, the integrated effect uh, will change the dust polarization angle or introduce some decorrelation. Uh, so, currently the limit is uh, less than 1 percent from the observation, but uh, even uh, so maybe it is not a problem for current CMB observation, but for future generation experiment which is targeting for 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4. So, even this 1 percent decorrelation can be a problem. Uh, which needs to be taken into account. So, usually uh, what is done is uh, that we can introduce this RL parameter which is capturing this uh, decorrelation motivated by this uh, paper. Uh, so, we can we, if you have a good model of decorrelation we can introduce here and can be taken into likelihood analysis. So, currently it is just a model we do not know if this parametric form is correct or not. Uh, but the goal is from the observations to find this uh, decorrelation. So, I am running out of time. So, I bit hurry up, hurry up. Uh, okay. So, just uh, just to say that uh, Jens Schulberg, when he worked on this, uh, when he worked on the line of sight uh, integration, we have a uh, line of sight averaging, we have a beam averaging and also when we compute the power spectrum, there is averaging of different points. So, usually, it is it can be expanded in terms of movement and it cannot be written uh, with a simple like uh, uh, just squaring them in the CL space. Okay. Uh, so, so, from the synchrotron uh, we can do what we learned from the dust we can do the same thing for synchrotron. So, for synchrotron there is no uh, EB correlation same as uh, what we find for the dust. The B to E ratio is 0 0.25. So, it is not 0 0.5 uh, it is 0.5 for dust it is uh, 0.25 for uh, uh, synchrotron and uh, also for synchrotron it has a uh, uh, spectral index variation which is order of 0 0.13 0 0.13 plus minus 0 0.13. So, this uh, like we are studying this because this spatial variation is important for the movement approach or like whether we want to consider this or not. So, the spatial like how much the spectral index varies for both dust and synchrotron. Okay. Uh, the curvature, uh, when we combine the lower frequency with the high frequency, there is no evidence for curvature. So, the single power law uh, model works. Okay. So, just uh, last two minutes. Uh, so, why all these are important? So, in this uh, bicep analysis, when they fit all the power spectrum, they put this uh, model uh, plus CMB tensor B mode plus CMB uh, lensing. Now, 
in this model, uh, you have to assume whether it's a decorrelation or not, or uh, what is the uh, prior on the beta S or beta D. So, depending on that, the result will change. So, this is from bicep 15 and 18. So, for uh, 15, they are not, they are assuming a prior. So, they get a higher value of beta D. But when you relax the prior, you get a lower value of beta D, which rep, uh, goes into the uh, which goes into the likelihood peak of the R. So, the value of R shift based on the model or the prior that you are putting in. Okay. There is a dust synchrotron correlation is consistent with 0 uh, and uh, the spectral index of the uh, peaks around minus 0.4. So, this is in DL. So, that is why point, minus 0.4 otherwise it is minus 2.4. And depending on the decorrelation, if you introduce decorrelation or not, uh, your signal will change. So, this is the standard uh, baseline analysis. If you introduce decorrelation, the peak will shift towards uh, 0. So, it is important to understand uh, whether this uh, decorrelation is important or not. I will finish. Uh, uh, and depend, uh, depending on the model of the foregrounds, uh, the likelihood analysis shows the change in the value of R. So, this is my summary slide. So, from the uh, all the observations that we have from Planck, WMAP, all the ground based experiment like QOTE, SPAS, CBAS. So, we learned about the foreground and characterized what is the spectral uh, what is energy distribution of it, how the slope changes, uh, whether they are decorating with the frequency or not. Uh, and uh, whatever we are learning, we are, uh, this is a statistical analysis, we are putting in a realistic sky model uh, with all this ingredient and this, uh, many people who are working on component separation, they are using this new models to study or to test their component separation method and uh, this current models can be used to analytical way. Uh, to put uh, in a likelihood analysis, but they are not putting very strong pairs because it depends, it's a statistical study from region to region, it can have a variation. And uh, it's important for uh, any future claim for new CMB discoveries like statistical isotropy, non, uh, non Gaussianity, whether the foregrounds are taken into account properly or not. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rohan. Unfortunately, we don't have much time. We'll take one quick question. One or two. Okay, those two. Hey, it's fascinating, especially the TB correlation. You mentioned the explanations as, as filaments, but I think all of those um, are basically just saying if you have highly non-Gaussian structures, your error bars can be very large, and therefore you, you can, I mean, I think if you average over all universes in a simulation, you will still find zero. I don't think you can violate that. But doesn't that give you a big problem that if your errors, if this leads to highly non-Gaussian errors, any inferred error bar or any cosmological interpretation would have to marginalize over that? Is that something you can, you can quantify? Yes. So, currently it is all done in the power spectrum. So, the error bars are based on the simulations, uh, which includes only the error bar from the uh, noise or systematics from the data. So, it does not include the error bars uh, or it does not assume a Gaussianity of the dust emission. But uh, yes, it is a problem. Uh, so, the error bar, if it is non-Gaussian, the error bars need to be uh, broadened up. Yeah. You did not mention the specter of magnetized dust, which might have a black body spectrum over a relevant frequency range Modified and would therefore be immune to the linear combination techniques right. you are using. Yes. So, do you this elaborate cross correlations that you have carried out uh, in recent years, do they throw any further light on how to guard against such a component? Uh, currently, because in polarization we have a large error bars, like from because the noise is the data is noisy, so we don't see an evidence of magnetic dipolar emission. Uh, but uh, maybe with bicep data, which has a very strong like less error bars, maybe can we look we can look for magnetic dipolar emission. So you mentioned the Planck spectrum over a broad frequency range. Uh, I thought you could allow for a up to 10 15 percent magnetized dust contribution to that uh -huh. well, within the uncertainties. For intensity, it is difficult because there are other foregrounds like uh, anomalous microwave emission, free free emission, uh, yes. it is very complicated. For polarization, it is simple because some of the components are not polarized. So, we can look so, for the evidence in the polarization data. Thank you. Thanks, Tugin, for the nice talk as well as answering the questions. I call the next speaker. Dr. McLean Rubel, 
she will be speaking on science and technology of the south pole telescope past present and future uh, my name is McLean Rubel. I'm a graduate student at McGill University. I'm here today talking on behalf of the South Pole Telescope collaboration more broadly, giving a general overview of the South Pole Telescope, or SPT, uh, our contributions in science and CMB science and uh, technology. I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, my own area of research on SPT, which is in the development of the next couple generations of experiments to go on the telescope. But to start off, uh, it's in the name. We're at the South Pole, which is not uh, necessarily the easiest place to get to, nor the most pleasant, frankly, to work at. So it's worth, I think, motivating a little bit why we bother to go there. Um, it's really about the location itself and the unique atmospheric properties that we find there. Uh, it's very high, it's very dry, which is great, but most of all, it has a very stable um, atmospheric condition. We have effectively half a year of night, which means that we can just stare at the same patch of sky all the time uh, without having to worry too much about uh, avoiding the sun <laughs> or other nuisance parameters. Um, about the telescope more uh, specifically, we're not the only telescope at South Pole after, well, just before me, and after me, you'll be hearing more about BICEP. Um, but us in particular, we are at the geographic South Pole. We are currently the largest dedicated CMB primary mirror on the sky at 10 meters in diameter. And this gives us a really unique angular resolution. So we can make these really fine uh, angular scale maps of the cosmic microwave background. We've been operational since 2007, and over that time, we've hosted three primary experiments. So the SBT, uh, this telescope, is the whole unit, but in this uh, receiver arm here, we can switch out uh, our experiments, or the cameras in the receiver. So we've um, hosted three primary of these, and uh, every once in a while, we run one of the receivers for the Event Horizon Telescope to take uh, pictures of our friendly neighborhood black holes. The three primary experiments uh, started in 2017 with SBT-SC, or the Suniev Zeldovich survey. This was responsible for discovering and making the first catalog of the distant galaxy clusters discovered through the Suniev Zeldovich effect, um, and contributed some very uh, fine resolution maps of the CMB temperature spectrum. We followed this up starting in 2012 with SPT pole, or polarization, where we introduced polarization sensitivity. And so this allowed us to make the first detection of the CMB B-mode lens signal from uh, gravitational lensing, not the primordial. Uh, following it up and currently on the sky is SPT 3G or third generation. Uh, we are currently in the process of making really state-of-the-art, very high resolution uh, maps at degree and, and arc minute scales uh, of CMB temperature and polarization in E and B modes. Uh, we've also started branching out into new realms of science, seeing what we can do with this instrument that's still on the sky, such as developing uh, a novel millimeter wave transient detection pipeline, which is exciting, but still in works. But our primary mission really is making maps of the CMB at very high angular resolution. Um, we do this at, uh, within three atmospheric windows, because we're ground-based, so we have to be able to see through the atmosphere. Um, at atmospheric precipitation absorbs a lot of our light, unless we look specifically <laughs> in these three windows here. So the gray indicating the absorption. Um, our three bands are located around 95, 150, and 220 gigahertz, uh, down to one arc minute of resolution. Uh, we use this high resolution to constrain the power spectrum for the CMB at smaller angular scales, which we can then uh, combine with maps from other experiments like BICEP or Planck to provide extra constraining power on the cosmological parameters. To really further enhance this, we... Oh, sorry, I'm a little cut off by the... I don't know if I can... Oh, well... It's okay, it's only cutting off the top. <laughs> the, uh, if we look at where we look specifically on the sky, we make maps um, in the same patch. So these three uh, outlines outline the, our survey fields uh, from, for the SPT-SE, pole, and then 3G uh, experiments. And so they all overlap with each other, and that's so that we can combine our data from previous experiments to get even more detail and knowledge out of these maps. But they also overlap with experiments like BICEPS so that we can combine all of our data and work together to better constrain cosmology. Um, to go a little bit more into the advantages of this, uh, well, well, not the advantages necessarily, but the strengths of this fine resolution, we can, uh, to showcase how this looks in practice, comparing the Planck maps to the SPT pole maps, so the previous generation of experiment, you can see the uh, much higher resolution that we are able to achieve. This lets us do uh, science like the you know, small angular scale power spectra, but also to pick out point sources. So these circles in red and blue here correspond to shadows against the cosmic microwave background from galaxy clusters that are uh, silhouetted against the background with the Suniev-Zeldovich effect. And then the blue dots 
are very high redshift uh, galaxies that have been lensed by intervening matter. Um, our angular scale happens to be very well matched to the scale of these uh, point sources. And this lets us do a really broad range of science with this data. Over the course of our lifetime, we've published um, many papers. I encourage you, if you are interested, to uh, check them out. The full list can be found at uh, poll.uchicago at edu. Uh, they cover a range of topics in CMB and, and cross-spectra, power-spectra, uh, techniques of observation, de-lensing, um, as well as in cluster science, um, galaxy detection, and as well, of course, the participation in the Event Horizon Telescope. All of this stuff, though, is, um, like many fields of science, new advances in the science are often driven by new advances in the technology, and SPT is a really good showcase of this. Um, we've consistently pushed our ability to see deeper and to do new measurements by innovating the way we make these detections. Uh, so a lot of the, the science I'm showing is really not possible without the, or we could not have done this before we put our like many, many, many eyes, many detectors on the sky. Because um, as was mentioned earlier in the morning, we use transition edge sensor bolometers. Uh, so these are photon noise limited, which means that the individual detector itself cannot really be improved in terms of sensitivity. So instead we have to field these big arrays um, of detectors in order to make deeper maps in less time. To do this, we've had to de develop our own technology. We're doing this for the, for the first time in many cases. And so we've had to create a, you know, the ability to, to operate so many thousands of detectors, which requires us to multiplex them. Uh, SPT uses a frequency domain multiplexing regime, um, not unlike the radio. <laughs> uh, we, to do this, we had to though build our own components. Um, showcasing a few of them here, we have uh, cryogenic filter combs. Um, that we use to multiplex these detectors at the cryogenic level, and then the associated warm readout electronics. Um, this may look familiar to some people here as the blue motherboard in the background is the ICE readout platform, which is what's also employed on the CHIME radio interferometer. Um, it's a general purpose signal processing platform that we designed at Gill, uh, which is why I'm paying a little bit of extra attention to it, uh, that we, you can use uh, in all sorts of experiments. And we pair this with an application-specific um, mezzanine or daughter card to, to interface it to whatever the, the use case is. Looking back at how this kind of, um, these technological developments have allowed us to uh, innovate new things, if we start way back of an early South Pole CMB experiment, ACBAR, which fielded just 16 photon noise limited bolometers with no multiplexing. And this, this experiment was able to create amazing world leading uh, finest sensitivity maps of the CMB that had ever been made, which is fantastic. But only 16 bolometers. The advent of multiplexing let us deploy the SPT SZ focal plane not long after this with 1,000 bolometers. Uh, and we could really get a lot more sensitive in a lot less time on the CMB spectra. We could then follow that up by adding in polarization sensitivity to the, detect these B modes for the very first time. And then, more recently, stepping this up to the SPT3G focal plane, which uses trichroic pixels. So uh, although the focal plane itself is still the same size, we can, we can fit uh, 16,000 detectors onto it instead of on the order of 1,000 by having each pixel be sensitive to two polarizations and three colors. So it's three detectors per pixel. And this kind of makes us <laughs> ask the question of what's next? CMB, well, CMB experiments are happening all over the world. There's a huge wealth of, of uh, investment and, and know-how and expertise in this field right now, which is really exciting. Uh, SPT 3G itself is, you know, starting to reach the end of its run. We're supposed to run until about 2024, 2025, and so we've started to think, what are we going to do next? We still have the SPT, the big primary mirror, and all the infrastructure at South Pole. How can we best use the knowledge and technological infrastructure and know-how that we've gained from our past experiments to start accessing new regimes and to discover new exciting things? To this end, we've uh, decided to take a little bit of a left turn away from the primary uh, CMB science. Not entirely, but at least for a smaller scale experiment as a technological pathfinder, which will be the next thing deployed um, on the South Pole Telescope, although in a, in a shorter term basis. So we are diving instead into millimeter wavelength line intensity mapping. I, I think a lot of people here are familiar with line intensity mapping, uh, but generally at radio wavelengths. For a millimeter wavelength, it's a bit of a different game. It's much higher frequency, uh, of course, and this means that we don't use coherent detection. Instead, we use spectrometers. Uh, there's lots of types of spectrometers. Uh, us, in particular, are considering using what's called a filter bank spectrometer. Um, now, these are single spatial pixels, each one with a fairly wide bandwidth, and that bandwidth then is divided up using hardware filters uh, into hundreds <laughs> of individual 
cryogenic microwave sensitive detectors. So this presents some different technological challenges to uh, the you know, more conventional radio in, uh, line intensity mapping. But that the difference in challenges and the similarity of the physics that it's tracking does provide some advantages. You, know, you can combine our millimeter wavelength line intensity maps with um, other science from, for example, 21 centimeter line intensity mapping or CMB lensing, galaxy surveys to extract a lot more science with not a lot of additional cost since these data sets already exist. Um, you can use them to reduce your statistical errors, cut down on control your foregrounds and nuisance parameters, which is, we think, really exciting. Um, for us, in particular, at millimeter wavelengths, we have access to a few different emission lines that we could use as tracers. There's the uh, C2 ionized carbon fine structure line, and then the CO, or carbon monoxide, rotational ladder. For us on SBT, we've decided to look at the, a few of the CO transitions that happen to be, because remember we're on the ground, so we're limited by the atmosphere, within this 120 to 180 gigahertz region where we have access to uh, three of the, the transitions of the CO ladder over a redshift range of about one to three. And to see them, we are designing the South Pole Telescope Summertime Line Intensity Mapper Experiment, or SBT-SLIM. This is a, uh, a smaller scale experiment, really a technology pathfinder that we're planning to deploy uh, <laughs> this coming Austral summer, uh, so in just a few months, uh, on the South Pole Telescope. Uh, this would be a small, uh, the receiver itself is quite small, and it will be going into the uh, telescope's receiver arm alongside the main SBT 3G camera, which will continue operating after this run. We're hoping to deploy it for about four weeks over the summer as, as a test, a technology pathfinder to see can we scale up these single pixel uh, spectrometers from their existing state as being really one or two pixels at a time up to a full array uh, and to pave the way for, from, for larger scale experiments in the future. Um, nonetheless, despite it being just a small technology pathfinder, we're uh, expecting that we should have enough sensitivity to make a uh, high significance detection of the CO power spectrum for the first time. We've also, with this turn into a slightly different branch of uh, cosmological science, we've also taken a turn into a slightly different detector technology. We've heard quite a bit about transition edge sensors today, and they're excellent. Um, there's no, no, nothing against them. However, they are rather difficult to deploy, and they're rather difficult to fit a lot of them onto a focal plane. So if we continue on this theme of wanting more detectors per focal plane, an easier way to do this is switching to this, a new type of, well, new-ish type of detector called kinetic inductance detectors. These, uh, by their nature, allow much higher uh, multiplexing densities, and so focal plane densities, uh, with greatly simplified cryogenic readout. So up here we're comparing the, the transition edge sensor SPT3G wafer with a uh, KID wafer fabricated at NIST, and you can see the number of connections coming off of each of them. Uh, these detectors also lend themselves really well to this spectrometer idea because each of them is effectively a superconducting filter all on its own. You can use them to create what are called on-chip spectrometers, which is when on-chip refers to that it's all patterned onto the same wafer. Um, the filters in the spectrometer are the detectors themselves. And so for the SPT SLIM experiment as this pathfinder, we're planning to deploy 18 of these uh, spectrometer pixels, each with dual polarization, so 36 spectrometers in total, and each of them with a spectral resolution of 300. So <laughs> in a way, we're uh, sort of undoing our technological evolution on SBT. We've gone from you know, a few detectors to very, very, very many detectors, but not at very many different colors. And so here, we're kind of doing the opposite. We don't have very many pixels. Well, we have a lot compared to what's been deployed before, but each of them has 300 colors. And so we're excited to see how, how this grows, uh, both in terms of the science and in terms of uh, learning how to, to do this. You know, this is a new detector technology for us. Uh, we need to develop new hardware, software, and expertise. To accompany it, uh, my particular area of research, so I will give it a small spotlight, is the development of the readout for this new camera. Um, we are using the same familiar uh, blue ice motherboard. Uh, and pairing it with a new application-specific mezzanine, which we've actually purchased from analog devices off the shelf. Uh, this has made the development of this go along quite quickly, uh, such that this new readout platform is now in use testing and developing the detector prototypes for our experiments with some example readout uh, outputs from this characterization shown at the bottom. Reusing the ICE hardware, like we're kind of re reusing the South Pole Telescope, allows us to make use of the existing, well, the hardware itself, of course, but also the, the knowledge that we've already gained and put together amongst the collaboration over the last 20 years. Um, and uh, especially, we, we can even re make reuse of the full software stack, uh, firmware, and uh, the interface, which makes this go a lot quicker. 
In terms of the experimental outlook, what we expect to get out of this technology pathfinder, besides just the technology, um, I mentioned we expect to be able to make a, a reasonably high significance detection of the carbon monoxide power spectrum at three of the rotational ladder stages. Um, this is forecast for our first observing run, which we are hoping to get about four weeks on the sky um, of a conservative 50 to 75% observation efficiency, so about 300 hours. Um, now, like, this is not the most cosmologically groundbreaking uh, measurement, it, but it's mostly, it's a proof of concept. If we can get this to work, we'll have learned a lot about how to deploy this new type of uh, detector technology at a larger scale and really get ready to, to scale up for future generations of these experiments. Because these experiments get a lot more exciting when they get a lot bigger, just, just like the TS experiments that we're all familiar with. Uh, you know, the constraining power of these line intensity uh, mapper spectrometer scales with the number of hours and the number of spectrometers you have on the sky. Something like SPT SLIM comes in at around the 10 to the 5 spectrometer hour range. But as you start moving up into this 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 spectrometer hours, things get really exciting. We got uh, a lot more promise, especially in collaboration with other uh, cosmological probes, to, to really nail down those cosmo cosmological parameters. Um, but like any new field, you have to take the development in stages. You can't just jump to these big guys where it would be difficult to do. And so uh, we're excited to see where we can go with this new technology and to, to start laying down the groundwork for the future. And with that, I'll show the, my collaborators who have made all this work possible from the South Pole Telescope. Thanks, Dr. Rubel, for the nice talk and finishing the long time. We have time for a few questions. Uh, great talk, thanks. Uh, I was just wondering, when you're looking at the low redshift, you're accessing the CO2 one mostly, right? So I guess that one is slightly more um, difficult to access than the, the first one zero because of essentially the lower abundance. So uh, are these forecasts for uh, a certain ratio of two one to one zero, which is uh, probably motivated by astrophysics? Um, that is a great question. I don't know all the details of the, the forecasts that are going into the, these models. Um, I, would, uh, I would guess so, um, but I can direct you to the paper in which, uh, if you'd like to see the, sure. this was from our white paper on uh, when we announced the SPT SLIM. Yes, so, so mostly these models um, I take into account the astrophysics behind it to the, as, as much as we now know it, uh, as well as our instrument sensitivities over a range of frequency. Yeah, so that usually depends on temperature, so it's uh, important. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. Um, I was wondering, uh, for the four-week run of the line intensity mapper, how will you choose the patches of sky you will look at, and do you hope or expect to stare at any nondescript uh, patch of sky during this run? Like the other... Uh, let me... Have a lot of slides. Ah, this one. Um, like our other SPT uh, patches of sky, we've chosen these to be sort of, mm, from an astrophysical sense, a more boring region of the sky, and that there's not a lot of point sources um, or other foregrounds that might confuse our experiments. For at least the first run, I, I believe our plan is to, to to do a similar, to have a similar choice uh, of fields, um, in that we want to, we don't want too many surprises in the observation. Uh, we'd like to, to really evaluate how well we can be, get these working Yeah, for now. Uh, we hope to be able to deploy this again in future, and so we might choose a more exciting patch then. <laughs> There's one offline question, and then there, we'll take the online one. Yes, please go ahead. Um, yeah, this is really exciting. Um, so you mentioned that the cool science comes at 10 to the 8 spectrometry hours. That's a daunting number. <laughs> um, and then in the technical, like focal plane design, it's dominated by the kid readout, right? So how do you get so many spectrometers in a physical focal plane? Oh, I mean, uh, so the nice thing about uh, these MKID readouts or kid readouts is that they, uh, they really do scale very well. Uh, so we're planning to deploy what, three, just less than 4,000 of these detectors. Um, but you could imagine packing, maybe this, maybe I'm going off track for your best. Yeah, yeah, that, that I get it. I think it's <laughs> in the next slide, uh, 17. Yeah, that? so that focal plane is yeah. dominated not by the horns. Uh, I, yeah, the, so this, we have a very small focal plane. Um, from side to side, this whole thing is only 275 millimeters. And th that's because this whole cryostat is like about this big, uh, because it's going to be slotted in next to the SPT3G receiver. We have tentative plans um, for the next full-scale generation of SPT experiment to deploy an optics um, setup to, to really scale up this spectrometer design to a, a much larger focal plane and, and therefore more spectrometers. Yeah. Last question online. Uh, Jens Schluba, please unmute. 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, I uh, it is extremely exciting to hear all this, uh, you know, development in detector technology and and uh, spectroscopy uh, in in these you know really uh, small devices. And I'm just wondering, um, if, uh, as a first point. Um, uh, is there any way uh, that you can imagine uh, to do absolute calibration um, and or how how well is, you know, the response really uh, going to be calibrated uh, across frequencies? I'm thinking, of course, about spectral distortions as an application uh, of this technology. Uh, and and if you have any comment, um, how can uh, the line intensity mapping or, or the CO mapping be complemented by a spectrometer that has absolute calibration and actually could be, you know, giving you the monopole of this signal as well? Um, is there any exciting uh, uh, science perspective that you think you can think of? Uh, great question. Um, certainly, the getting an absolute calibration or just any calibration is is part of what we're working on the designing right now for for this experiment. Um, it's how that relates into the uh, larger scope uh, of doing these like more advanced uh, cosmological measurements. I think remains to be seen, depending uh, depending on how well this goes. It, it, we don't know how how well this will perform yet. Um, we're hoping, we're optimistic that this will pave the way to, to more higher performance experiments. I would um, hesitate to make forecasts about that at this stage, but I'm happy to direct you to people who would be uh, more knowledgeable and probably more ambitious um, than, than I am to, to make such forecasts. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rubel, for the nice talk and the answers. So I call upon the next speaker, Dr. Ritoban Basu Thakur. <laughs> He'll be talking on peering through cosmic times with bicep array telescopes and advance in astrophotonics. Hopefully. Okay, great. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for inviting me and having me here. Uh, it's always good to be here in Bangalore. So much exciting science happening here. Uh, so, uh, I'm here representing a joint group from Caltech and NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, and the organizers asked me to give a, a brief uh, summary of where the bicep project is. Uh, although, originally, my plan was to talk on astrophotonics. So, you'll get a little bit of both. And apologize if I don't finish my slides. Okay, so we just heard about South Pole and why it's exciting. And of course, SPT, the big dish there. Uh, BICEP uh, makes up the other two uh, telescope stations that you see on the picture there. Uh, these are all small aperture telescopes. Akito talked about this at length. Uh, and we're optimized at degree scale as opposed to these arc minute scales. And the idea is to measure the polarized CMB plus the foregrounds with you know, extreme precision. And why do we want to do that? Well, we want to do that because we are uh, going after inflation. So uh, again, you all know about this, heard it from Akito. Um, the initial epoch of inflation, the, you know, the universe is expanding very rapidly and there's this violent perturbation to the metric and those quantum fluctuations get frozen in and they lead to these quadrupole and isotropies in the CMB that effectively put an imprint in the polarized CMB. So you make a map of the CMB you do your divergence and curl decomposition, and you know one we call the E mode, one we call the B mode, and the B mode maps ideally will look something like this. So this is in real space. Imagine you know tilting your head up, down, left, right, uh, and at degree scale, that's the size of that blue circle. You expect to see these curly patterns, but its intensity is not labeled because we haven't discovered them yet, uh, and that would be the signature of inflation we are going after. So uh, Akita had a nice uh, comment, almost the recent uh, 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 limits on uh, measurement of R, the tensor to scalar ratio, uh, which is essentially the power in that degree scale of those curly patterns. Uh, so this is the most recent one that we have compiled within the Bicep Tech Telescope end of last year. So if someone has discoveries this year, let me know. Uh, the paper is cited there. And the key uh, statement here is that the primordial gravitational waves are quite weak. There are these red dashed lines, and this is, of course, some guess value we put in to make a plot. Uh, it's dominated by these lensing B modes that you have heard about. Nonetheless, the bicep Keck experiment pushes uh, you know, on the search window, and we are going deeper and deeper into uh, probably some tantalizing territory right here. Um, and we're doing this by deploying you know, year after year, uh, these uh, sets of small aperture telescopes at South Pole, and the common uh, uh, sort of pattern to our progress uh, is uh, putting more and more of these uh, photon noise limited detectors on the sky. So uh, the most uh, recent result, therefore, is from that uh, BK18 uh, paper, and we get a sensitivity to R, how well you can measure R, of 0.009, and this is, you know, the leading limit currently. 
Uh, but we realize that foregrounds are a thing, and Tuhin uh, spent a lot of time discussing this. Uh, particularly for BICEP, we realize that synchrotron is not well measured. So if you look at the constraint uh, on this plot of the power in the B modes at degree angular scales versus you know, frequency of the photons, uh, you see that dust is well understood. Again, the saga was explained by Tuhin, but synchrotron is not quite there. So for BICEP array, we are not only uh, deploying bigger telescopes, and four of them, in fact, will uh, fill up this uh, you know, bay, um, but we are focusing on foregrounds first. So all you need to focus on is this orange block, and you can see the various channels. So the 3040 synchrotron uh, telescopes are going first, and then the dust channels, and of course CMB is going to go in, and we're collecting data with BICEP3 as we speak as well. And the whole idea is to increase the survey depth, the number of detectors that are simultaneously seeing the sky. So uh, where are these telescopes today? Uh, so right before COVID, I was part of the team that deployed the first bicep array telescope at South Pole. Uh, it was a massive effort led primarily out of Caltech, uh, but you know, COVID happened and then we were all stuck uh, and suffering. And then uh, since then we have gone back a couple of times and upgraded the telescope. There are now uh, more than 500 low noise polarimeters uh, looking at 3040 gigahertz. And here's the synchrotron map. This is, of course, not the science map. I'm just showing you a sneak peek. The main paper is in progress. Uh, and this year, uh, we worked on some of the optics upgrades that increases the noise, or, or rather decreases the photon noise coming from extraneous uh, things. And now the mapping speed will be advanced by about 10x, and we should get good synchrotron data uh, end of this year. This year, and then last week, uh, BICEP Array 2 got deployed. Um, and here is the team from this uh, deployment. Uh, and you can see the second big tube on the sky. So this data I'm showing you is very preliminary. Just, you know, this is just students in the lab just checking things, how they work. And we're getting good band center. So 150 gigahertz is the channel. You get a nice rectangular band. That's nice. The optical efficiency, how well you can see the sky is again, pretty close to what we expect from theory, not too much scatter. Uh, and you know, this is just a week worth of an analysis, but we have years to go. So uh, hopefully this will pan out for the whole telescope. Um, also to point out, we only uh, were able to populate half the telescope uh, due to, again, COVID delays, but even that is more powerful than the single Keck 150 gigahertz receiver. So off the bat, we will do better than our historic selves. And that's a thing you should try in experimental science. So where do we go with this? Uh, complicated plot, you can just focus on the bottom part. Uh, the resolution, i.e. how well you can measure R. The curve just shows how we are progressing there. X marks the spot, namely every time we write a science paper, where do we land on the forecasting? And you know, the collaboration does pretty good at predicting its own success or failure, except the one time. Uh, and here you can see that our projections going forward with SPT uh, will take us to a sigma R of a few times 10 to the minus three. Uh, and, you know, we'll see how well the analysis pans out, but that's the range we're gonna land in in a few years. So that's the status of BICEP. Um, so there's a slide here on technical details of the experiment in the spirit of Akito's talk, but I'll skip this. Ask me, you know, if you need to know more. Uh, these are the people, uh, you know, an excellent team behind the scenes for BICEP who make all of this happen. Uh, and so, you know, all the institutions, all the great people right there. Okay. So now I'm going to rush into the real reason I wanted to give this talk, astrophotonics. Uh, so uh, this is uh, somewhat a new thing for us in the sort of radio and submillimeter world. Uh, for people in quantum optics, this has been there for the last few years. And the idea is that, you know, consider whatever you can measure on the sky and measure it at the quantum limit, i.e. using the tools of quantum optics. And if you can do that, you can design very compact uh, circuits uh, on chip that can measure the full power of all the information that lives in whatever object you're trying to study. So you can think of these as you know, uh, imaging spectral polarimeters where you are measuring things uh, on the premise of quantum mechanics and at the quantum limit. Now, we are far from that, but we are beginning to you know, build these things now. So uh, why would you want to do this connected to the theme of today? Um, and that is an inspiration from hyperspectral imaging. So, uh, what does that mean? So let's take a uh, look at the bicep focal plane and zoom in at one little corner there. So those are all our detector modules. And if you zoom in, you will have antennas and the power that these antennas receive 
are dumped on these transition edge detectors. The details are, do not matter. All you need to know is all the photons are seen by the antenna, much like your eye, uh, and then uh, the power is just measured on that little guy. So, and with that, we have done, you know, really amazing imaging and even spectroscopy as SPG Slim is uh, uh, trying to do now. Uh, but one can do better, uh, and this is the concept of hyperspectral imaging. So if in the chain of information, going from antenna to power detector, you can intercept it with a spectrometer that is very compact, because we don't want to give up the real estate here by packing in all the spectrometric channels. Then you can have your thousands of detectors on the same focal plane, but get color information. And this is a cartoon made by Sanchez uh, Lopez that shows, you know, it's a cartoon that you have a galaxy, but if you could get all those colors, you learn in detail all the microphysics behind that galaxy. Um, so that's the inspiration is do not sacrifice what you have, but add to it something new that augments its, uh, uh, you know, technical power. So one example of this, and this is coming again from quantum optics, uh, is uh, the Mach-Zander four-port interferometer. So if you have taken any quantum optics course, you would have done a homework problem on this with A daggers and A's and all that. And the idea is pretty simple. It's a, you know, your standard interferometer. You take a signal uh, from some antenna, you split it with a thing called a hybrid coupler. It's a beam splitter, but it's on chip. And then you pass the two signals through two arms. In one arm, you introduce a relative phase delay such that when you combine it, you get a, a, you know, a interferogram. Right, and once you have an interferogram, you have broadband spectroscopic power. So this is, you know, you know the Fourier transform spectrometer, Michelson interferometer, standard stuff. And this is well known. Pixie that Jens uh, showed before is very much this. But we want to get away from macroscopic, optomechanical interferometers and do something, you know, clever because again, we want to use up all our focal plane. So the way we do this, this is a bit of a digression. It is a topic of quantum materials. That is my new expertise, and I don't want to bother you too much. All you need to look at are these two bullet points and this graph. So we have a new material, magic material, let's say, that we make, in which the speed of light, the phase velocity, is 0.1% C. So already, you can have a massive compactification of the interferometric structure, because you know, light is moving slower, so to speak. Furthermore, in this magic material, you can apply a DC current, the photons are RF, right, it's radio frequency, but a constant DC current that allows you to slow down the wave propagation. So the delay can be tuned with uh, milliampers of current. And milliampers is one kilo ohms with a 1.5 volt battery. So that's exactly how I took this data. It's that simple. But real, the real science is in the material, right? I'm glossing over it. You can read the papers, um, you yeah, know, but that's a different thing. So given we can now have an electronic version of that Mach-Zender interferometer, what can we build? Well, we can build something like Pixie on a chip, and it's indeed a few hundred times smaller than the full FTS. Uh, so this is uh, operating at low frequencies, at 25 to 40 gigahertz. We did this purposefully to prove a point because low frequencies are longer wavelengths. So if you can make that smaller, everything else will be smaller still. And this is the first demonstration plot uh, so this is very preliminary. It has gone into some proposals this year where we are showing single tone interferograms. What does that mean? You take that FTS, now on chip, and uh, we call it SOFTS, by the way, superconducting on chip Fourier transform spectrometer. So you take a delta function in frequency, a single tone, and you scan the delay. You better reconstruct a sine or a cosine, right? That's what it should do. Just, you know, constructive destructive interference. If you can do that at multiple frequencies, then you have calibrated your device and you can do this for a broadband spectrum. And that's the proving principle in here. So we you know, get the modulations we expect from classic theory and the data you know, has some scatter basically related to the fact this was the first chip made at JPL after COVID and you know, all the machines were out of whack. Uh, so there's a lot of noise scatter in there. But nonetheless, you see the trend. Okay, so now coming to the vision of this SOFTS program, why are we doing this? So that is going to come out in a paper I co-wrote with a bunch of people from NASA and ESA uh, for a roadmap on astrophotonics. Uh, it should come out next month. Um, and that outlines the general you know, landscape, including SPG Slim. And uh, the European colleagues were quick to point out that SOFTS is unique because we are not competing with anyone. Because again, we don't need multiple filter banks for different colors. It's one device that does both the imaging with the antenna, 
but the full spectroscopy. Uh, but you pay a penalty in noise, which is known as the standard uh, FDS penalty. And so you don't, you know, it's different, but it's not something very uh, unique in that sense. So you can see that in mapping speeds and number of spaxels, spaxels means spatially imaging uh, spectrometric pixels, uh, you know, we can fit in fewer things to get the same result. And so again, the dream of the kilo spaxel focal plane can be realized without having a very big thing. And this is of interest to us because we would like to fly this thing. Uh, and the design again is similar to Pixie because in principle it is, the, the physics is identical. Um, but it's much smaller and it's completely electronic so you can run this digitally. Okay? So the science motivation, uh, Jens of course did a lion's share of this work so I don't need to tell you why you need to do spectral distortions. We are the expert. Uh, there are other things you may want to do as well with astronomy and astrophysics. So for example, the Suenev Zeldovich effect, uh, and there are experts in the room, you all know how to do this. And you know, here again, you want to localize on a galaxy cluster like SBT, but get the full color information so you can disentangle the relativistic effects, the hot electron effects, and whatever else is happening in the plasma, right? And so again, color information becomes relevant. Uh, recently, that is three months ago, we realized that in the interstellar medium mapping problem, there aren't much hardware after uh, Herschel, Spire, and Pax, where each, you know, it's a heterodyne system, so the number of spaxels you can deploy are a handful. But with this, because at terahertz, things are more compact, you can have, again, kilo spaxel focal planes. So that's a new science topic we are working on, uh, but I don't have any slides to show on that. Um, so moving back to the CMB spectral distortions and kind of doing an apples to apples comparison. Um, so this is a plot of, again, the brightness as a function of color or spectrum. Uh, and you can see the myriad things that are in the sky, right? The CMB is not the only thing. Uh, so you have things like dust and synchrotron that you have heard about. You also have the line intensity, in intensities from a family of molecules uh, and atoms that are ionized. So when you try to measure these weak signals of the Y and mu distortion that Jens uh, spoke about, you really need to factor in all these foregrounds. Just for bicep, look at how much trouble we're going through, right? Um, and so it, it matters to have many spectral channels as well as imaging capability so you can disregard a hot object there and look at the dark spot in the sky. And uh, the whole you know, infrastructure mathematically or whatever in forecast language comes down to this parameter called noise equivalent spectral brightness. This formula is very much adapted from Pixie because again, it's the same instrument. Um, and yeah, the, the results for uh, R equals eight, so that's uh, you know, roughly four channels per band, is shown here. And in one year, with 4,000 of these spaxels, we can go much deeper than Pixie. That's our forecast. The forecast is quasi-realistic. I have thought about telescope optics and CMB and CIB as much as I can, but you know, irregularities and inefficiencies exist in life, so you should put a factor of two error on this. But um, nonetheless, this should be a very powerful instrument that can map the sky in against uh, uh, color domain as well as image. So this is nice, I hope you're slightly entertained. But what's really nice is that the whole control is digital. So as I'm looking at the sky, if Tuhan comes and says, hey, there's a lot of foreground there, can you do something about it? I can change the current in each of these soft pixels and get more spectral sensitivity at the synchrotron and dust channels and image that real well and then put it back into analysis for better foreground separation. And this is all digital. We don't need to worry about you know, the mirror breaking or whatever. So that is a really powerful aspect of this. The other powerful aspect that uh, some JPLers have been excited about, and this shows my ignorance perhaps, is the optics. So unlike Pixie, it is not multi-moded. It is single-moded like all the standard SPD tele or BICEP or whoever, or Simons. So we know how to do that stuff really well, as you saw in Akito's talk. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel there. We learn from the best. And that allows for very clean mapping, not just spectroscopy. And so this example was done, by the way, just to optimize for uh, a dire situation where you have high dust and synchrotron. And you, you know, we you know, are trying to run this through a forecasting algorithm, but it's only so many hours in a day. So uh, the other thing we are trying uh, with the astronomers at Caltech uh, is addressing the question of galaxy cluster surveys. 
And you don't need to read the details at depth, but I can just give you the summary. So there's a collaboration called Olimpo in Rome. Paolo de Barnardis, Silvia Massi lead it. We're working with them. And Olimpo is now proposed in a photometry mode, kind of like SPT back in the day. And we wanted to see what happens if you in, in, inject a soft pixel between the antenna and the detector with you know, some number of spectral channels. And we went for something very modest, something I can build today, not the future. And with that, we can get uh, velocity reconstruction limits down to 30 kilometers per second, which is pretty impressive if you are interested in how fast those electrons are moving in the uh, plasma. And so we are working on a paper with an undergrad. He presented at AAS on this. And this is exactly what led the JPLers to think about the interstellar medium physics as an a another application at high frequency. Um, so yeah, so with that, you know, the grand vision we have, and obviously we're not gonna get everything we ask for, but you know, discoveries will be made somewhere, uh, is that softs, if you develop it at low frequencies, middle frequencies, or a millimeter wave, and then high frequencies at terahertz, you can address a lot of interesting science. So the CMB spectroscopy is again, you know, the talk from Jens and Tuan and so on. You heard about intensity mapping, so we can address the same millimeter wave uh, uh, line intensities with this kind of a you know device, and then at terahertz, we're exploring this uh, idea of ISM physics, uh, and NASA has been after a little bit of challenge, uh, generous. Uh, so we got an award in right before COVID, which was kind of annoying, but that allowed us to build some of these prototypes. And uh, this uh, past year, we got an internal award to explore these magic quantum materials a little bit and push towards terahertz, and you know, we'll see where that lands. We have uh, certainly a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, and this is the collaboration. So it started off with myself and Eric Shirokov, who sadly passed away, and Phil Mauskoff, and we have now you know, built up a big team. And last week, we got Oxford in the loop now. Um, so there's a lot of activity happening, uh, and we're still looking for people, mostly people who can help us with forecasting work because I can make those graphs, but I'm not good at likelihood. So if you uh, can help, that's my email. Please reach out. And with that, I'll end and take any questions. Thanks for the nice talk. Time for a few questions. Obviously, on? okay, obviously exciting um, technologies. How does that um, would that work with what we just heard in the previous talks, the M kits that they're putting on SPT? Is that complementary or totally different or unrelated or incompatible? Or how, do, how, how should it, one use this? The, the gist of it, it is very, very compatible. So um, again, the idea, so let me just go back to the opening slide on this. Yeah. So the idea is to, again, not reinvent the wheel of what people have done, right? So the antenna technologies or lens couple technologies you heard about, and the detector, whether it's TES or MKIDS, we are completely agnostic. We can just fit the spectrometer in the line between these two. And so it is very compatible. In fact, the first, uh, the proposed Spaxel we plan to build, I should say this out loud, we haven't been funded for this yet, will be an MKID. It will not be a TES. It will be an MKID. Yes. But why do you still need an MKID if you have your own spectrometer? Isn't it you good enough You need the detector. You need the detector. Sure, but a TES is good enough for you, right? It is good enough for us, but as was explained, TESs are a bit, a bit annoying to fabricate. But they've already been fabricated. Somebody's already they, made 10,000 of them. This is a clearly political and programmatic statement, not scientific. <laughs> yep. Oh, uh, Thanks, Tuban. That was very exciting. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, you mentioned a comparison between the soft's uh, kind of uh, sensitivity with Pixie. Does it assume it's like a space-based or? Yes, 100% space-based. Okay. Uh, so uh, the last talk had a nice slide of, on the atmospheric transmission. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I had requested this. Uh, so if you imagine overlaying you know, the atmospheric transmission, you can immediately see that the number of channels you have are not that great from Earth. So our intermediate plan is actually a balloon, okay. you know, but yeah. So that's an, another question I had was, uh, you mentioned that uh, by definition, the spectrometer is going to be broadband, it's going to slice up whatever optical windows mm -hmm. coming through into many channels, mm -hmm. but are you ultimately going to be limited by the how broadband the optics are ahead of your spectrometer, basically? Yes, but one layer uh, not as advanced. Uh, so we, w what, okay, this is, a, this is actually a really good question. So um, let's see. Okay, so for those who are RF experts, this is trivial. For everyone else, I apologize. 
Uh, so this ladder-like structure is called a hybrid coupler. This is how you, you know, mix different modes of the electromagnetic thing and, you know, you get 3 dB split, but you have to have that over a certain range. That is what's going to limit us. Now, uh, Phil Mouskov, who some of you may know, is a very ambitious and smart man, and he has convinced me that he can build this infinitely broad, uh, but I think the ripples and reflections will be a problem. Uh, so my take on this is an octave is easy, more than that is not easy. And then we look at the science, or the reality of science, the noise from the CMB and the CIB, you know, you will eat that noise the broader your band is. So the optimization that we did behind the scenes uh, tells us a bandwidth ratio of 1.5 is good for both the science and the instrument. So that's the answer. So there is one question here and one in the middle. Hi, Ritha. Yeah. Hey, nice talk. So good to see that the image of spectrometer concept is kind of getting realized uh, in reality. I have a question regarding the band uh, choice. So what is the control you can get on the band resolutions for softs? Band. That's because if you want to measure spectral distortion or any, any particular signal, the band over which the signal changes, you need to catch it up at much finer scale to really uh, reconstruct the signal. Otherwise, it, everything will be combined. So my worry, my, what I'm asking is, how well can you control the delta nu over nu? Excellent. Okay, okay. I now understand your question. Uh, so, uh, I, do I have a plot in the backup? Let's see. I have an answer to your question. And I have a follow-up question on that as about uh, how well can you control the band leakage? Maybe you have a slide on that too. Band leakage, no, but the other thing, yes. So uh, this is a prototype, I didn't talk about this. This was a behind the scenes toy project we did. Uh, and you know, it was enough to get some cash, but not enough to do good science. Uh, we have demonstrated 500 megahertz, uh, sorry, 670 megahertz resolution. And the newest generation of the materials we're doing, we can do 10 times better. So that's the answer to your question. At which new? Hmm? At which frequency? All frequencies. So the beauty oh, of this is, is frequency independent. That's as great. far as the Cooper pairs and the superconductor are concerned, before you go to the plasma frequency, they don't care. They will dance with the electric field as you drive it. Uh -huh. And then uh, you, at these resolutions achievable without much worrying about band leakage, like how much signal seeing as a 30, at 40 gigahertz can be realized at 41 or 42. They're completely spectrally separate. So th you're seeing the full Green's function of this device. They're completely spectrally and they're controllable separate. at that level. Yep. Oh, that sounds good. We should yep. talk more. Thank you. Yep. One here. Thanks for the really nice talk. Uh, I was very interested in that plot where you showed uh, different experiments. So I'm more on the science side of exclaim, but I know that uh, they're doing this balloon and they're going to have a uh, new spec on it. So what is the difference between, or what would you consider pros and cons um, between your, your technology? And yeah, so the, the lead person on new spec, uh, Emily Barentine is a good friend of mine, and we have gone back and forth on this. Okay. And the point is we are just different beasts, so there is not much competition um, sure, yeah. uh, in, in that sense. So mu spec is, is good if you want a lot of spec, uh, uh, number of detectors per channel and the mapping speed to be optimized. But I am operating under the, you know, so far the assumption that detectors are, you know, at that scale become very hard to build. So how do you get away from that? Uh, now, the other distinction with the difference here is that SOFTS is best suited, because it's an FDS technology, for you know, large-scale survey, not targeted things. So uh, if you want to study a you know, little object on the sky, you're better off with filter banks or, or something like MuSpec. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so how will uh, absolute calibration work in this? Because Pixie, you have two light paths. And in one light path, you put a black body and you compare. It so, seems here you have only one. So again, the idea is not to reinvent the wheel. So what we want to do is have a focal plane array with horns, and every horn that goes to the detector, uh, the calibrator arm will have a black body on top. So that's sort of the easy answer I'm giving you. The more ambitious answer uh, is really, again, go back to the books on quantum optics and talk to people who are building qubits and measuring single photons. They can calibrate things very well, right? Uh, so Michael Devere's group, uh, Michelle, sorry, at Yale has shown that they can do different black body powers using quantum optics by counting photons. And so we want to take that inspiration from them eventually. That's the long and diffuse answer. So if I understand correctly, you are saying you will not need a big black body sitting there, but you can do it. Uh, 
through quantum electronics. That's Is the that? whole uh, aspiration, but it's very much aspirational. One last question. Great, super quick, uh, uh, quick question. What's the time constant with which you can modulate the current? Aha. Change it? Thank you, Matt. <laughs> You've got a backup slide for everything. <laughs> I was on the job market last year, so. <laughs> so yeah, so in the lab, we have done this at uh, about a kilohertz, that fast. Now, uh, if you work out from, again, pure kinetic inductance formulae, you can get up to tens of megahertz. That's how fast you can go. Before that, and after that, you know, you will have nonlinear couplings and you will have the, the benefits of the traveling wave parametric amplifier will become a pain for this if you're going to you know, modulate at megahertz, past a megahertz. So fundamental limit is this won't limit my scan strategy in any way. I can much no, I, I mean, like we have worked on the same telescope. We know how this goes, yeah. There are no more questions. Thanks, uh, Ritoban, for the nice talk and a couple of answers. With that, we close the first session, and I thank all the speakers of the session and hand it over to you. First speaker of the session is Rishi Khatri. Uh, Rishi, over to you. Thanks. Uh, so I have actually a lot of online players. So let me just give you the conclusions first, and then we will see how far I can go. So uh, I'm talking about uh, quite a few things all related to CMB spectral distortions. Uh, so this uh, first uh, on the right, you see a plot of CMB spectral distortion. So in the, okay, let me first tell you about this background picture. The left side you will recognize, this is the Planck CMB map. On the right side, we have actually a thermal SZ map, again, made from the Planck data. And you can see that already, so the thermal SZ effect is the only CMB spectral distortion that we have detected so far. You can already see that is a very weak signal. You can see here the, everything you see is signal. Here, most of what you see is actually foregrounds and uh, systematic artifacts. But you see that at some points, there are these bright spots. These are actually the actual signal, and the signal pops out uh, from this uh, foregrounds and systematics and all sorts of artifacts uh, where you have uh, clusters of galaxies. So that is where the SZ signal is strongest. But this is again, so this is a thermal SZ effect. It is also known as Y type distortions and we heard a lot about this in the morning from Jens. Uh, so Jens talked about, so all of what Jens talked about in the morning, that is actually non-relativistic uh, distortions, which means that we are assuming, she talked about mostly about energy injection in terms of energy or photon injections, we are injecting something into the CMB. But also the, there's another assumption there in what he talked about, which he did not state uh, very clearly, that everything is non-relativistic, which means that all energy, all particles that you inject uh, in the primordial plasma, which give you these distortions, they have energy which is much, much smaller than the mass of the electron. So that is what I mean by non-relativistic. But actually, he should then showed some examples of new physics you can see, like dark matter decay or primordial black holes, evaporating. So actually, those solutions don't apply to the, all this interesting stuff because all this, uh, so there's a contradiction there because dark matter decay or primordial black holes, all these interesting energy injection processes, they actually inject particles which are very, very high energy. So depending on dark matter, will is GV dark matter or mass dark matter, it will inject particles, probably it decays into electron positron pairs, then initial electron positron pairs have GV energies, right? So, so all those so actually, so people until now, they have been using Y type distortions to put constraints on all sorts of new physics. But actually those constraints, I will show you that they are actually off by a factor of two or five or even more. And the, if you calculate the actually the cascade, so if you inject a high energy particle in the early universe, you have a basically shower, a particle shower, just like you see in the particle detectors. So this cascade will go down and the, uh, high energy electrons in the cascade will interact with the background CMB and produce CMB spectral distortion. So you have to actually follow this cascade uh, all the way from the injected particles all the way until the uh, this shower dies down. And this was done by Sandeep Acharya. And these are, you find that actually there's a whole zoo of CMB spectral distortions and they look very, very different from any Y or mu type distortions that Jens was showing uh, in the morning. In particular, you also see there's a double peak. So one of these curves is a double peak spectrum. So actually, you can not just have one peak on the high energy, so you can have more than one, two peak, one peak also. The high peak, the second peak is actually not observable. It is at very high energy, but it is important to get the full shape. 
the shape of the distortion remembers not only that energy was injected and how much energy was injected, it also remembers which particle was injected. If you inject a 1 GeV photon versus 1 GeV electron, so here is actually there is a difference between photons and electrons, the shape of the spectrum is different. If you inject a quark anti quark player, dark matter decays into quark anti quark, that spectral shape will be different. So it remembers what kind of particle is being ejected and what is the energy of the injected particle. So a lot of information here beyond just you know measuring y and mu and I hope to get you excited about this. So this was done by Sandeep Acharya and mostly what he has talked about was in energy injection. He also talked about energy absorption that was the adiabatic cooling but that was only one example. In principle energy absorption of from CMB by some new physics for example dark matter is also an interesting prospect and this is a uh, work by Anoma Ganguly and uh, she is sitting over there and she has a poster. So you should uh, look at the poster for more details. I will talk little bit about this, but it uh, turns out you open, it opens up a new window into uh, indirect detection of dark matter. So most of the indirect uh, uh, searches for dark matter so far, they have looked for the emission signals, you know dark matter decay into some particle. Few years ago there were a lot of excitement about a new anomalous X-ray line or a anomalous gamma ray line, but it is the same thing you can look for absorption also, anomalous lines in X-rays or gamma rays or radio or in CMB band or optical band. So any anomalous line, absorption line that you detect that cannot be explained by baryonic physics can in principle be a signature of composite dark matter. So this dark matter has to be composite, it has to be internal levels. Uh, in particular the internal levels can be such that it can also produce the edges like signal. That is very interesting. So in injection, absorption. But these are still I am talking about unpolarized CMB spectral distortions, but CMB spectral distortions can also be polarized. So that is what is shown here. So this is work by Ritsu Kumar Gon, who is also here and he has also another poster uh, out there. I will encourage you to look at that. So in particular what I have shown here is a Y type. Uh, so this is the Q and U maps, the polarization, but which has a spectrum not like a black body spectrum that you expect from usual CMB, B and E modes. So the spectrum is actually of Y type because it is being generated at second order by the transverse velocity of electrons. So this is a second order kinetic as the effect. So the linear kinetic as the effect you look at uh, linear order at and you learn about the linear velocity of or the line of sight velocity of the electrons. Here you are looking at transverse velocity of the electrons and because it is being generated at second order that gives you both a y type spectrum and also polarization. And the last part if I have time I do not know if we will get there. I will talk about a new solution to new class of solutions to the Hubble tension and this paper actually has been generated lots of citations, but most people who are writing the citations or in the, the review papers they are citing this paper, they probably have not read the paper because they cite it wrongly. They usually club it with early universe uh, uh, solutions to the Hubble tension or sometimes some neutrino solutions to the Hubble tension, but it is actually different from all other solutions. So most solutions rely on changing the early universe expansion history. So you modify the sound horizon or you change the late time expansion history of the universe. So you modify the distance to the last captain surface. Here we do neither. So we do not change sound horizon or distance to the last captain surface. The expansion history remains exactly the same as lambda CDM. But you introduce a phase shift in the, uh, uh, in the CMB acoustic oscillations. And the phase shift is coming from neutrinos. So basically if whether neutrinos free stream or not, it, uh, there is a relative phase shift between these two cosmologies, one where neutrinos are streaming and one where they are not streaming. So the Hubble parameter is actually you can say that it is degenerate with the free streaming length of the neutrinos. So if you stop the, it turns out it is very, found it very interesting that if you just stop the, do not change anything, just stop the neutrinos from free streaming, you actually push the Hubble to almost value of 70 and the tension basically reduces to 2 sigma level. Okay, so these are my conclusions and let us see how far I can, uh, I, uh, how much details I can give you. So uh, this is the my version of the, uh, you know, picture of the universe. I like this picture because this is from our point of view, the observer's point of view. So we are looking back in time and we look different, uh, you know, spherical shells of the universe at we should observe a light cone, right? We cannot observe the three dimensional universe as such or four dimensional universe. We observe a light cone. So we look at shells of the universe at different redshifts. As you go, your temperature goes up, redshift goes up, and the you know, time goes down. 
so again, so I will not go too much detail because he has already talked about a lot of physics. So important landmarks here is for as far as CMD spectral distortions are concerned, one is ratio of 2 times 10 to the 6. So it turns out if you disturb the CMD spectrum, if you from a black body at ratios greater than 2 times 10 to the 6, that disturbance gets exponentially suppressed and CMB goes back to the plant spectrum. And this is coming because of the processes uh, of Compton scattering, Brahms along and double Compton scattering. Between ratio 2 times 10 to the 6 and about 10 to the 5, if you disturb the CMB spectrum, it does not go back to the plant spectrum, but it goes back to a Bose-Einstein spectrum, it still relaxes and you have a uh, non-zero chemical potential or mu type distortion that is what we call. At very low redshift, you get a Y type distortion if you are in the non relativistic limit. But as I tell you, that is not a very accurate approximation for most of the new physics that we might be interested in or that particle physicists may be interested in. And in between, there is some intermediate type distortion, uh, type era. But this 2 times 10 to the 6 is actually not a very hard limit. You can actually look beyond this. And I will show an example where actually dark matter, suppose it decays into a very high energy neutrinos. So neutrinos at uh, low energies, they actually are uh, free streaming, but if you increase the energy of neutrino, their cross section uh, goes up and at some point they actually become non-free streaming and they can actually deposit some of their energy into the electromagnetic plasma. So this uh, uh, deposition of energy is not instantaneous, it takes some time, which means that if you uh, inject energy at ratio of 10 to the 7, some of that energy will be injected at redshift less than 2 times 10 to the 6, it will leave some spectral distortions. So we can actually, uh, so there is information in spectral distortions even for energy that was injected before 2 times 10 to the 6, provided it was injected in some dark particles like neutrinos, which have not, don't have very strong interaction with the plasma. So it takes some time to deposit the energy. Right. So let us look at uh, the first part, the non-thermal so we call it non-thermal relativistic spectral distortion. I should probably have called it ultra relativistic. So not to confuse with the relativistic distortions that people talk about in the galaxy clusters. So here we are talking about electrons which are GeV or even higher energy. Uh, so standard model, again this Jens talked about, we have already predictions on silk damping at the level of 10 to the minus 8. And the reionization and uh, low redshift uh, universe we expect from galaxy clusters and filament. We expect uh, as the effect of order 10 to the minus 6. So this is the usual plot. Many people have shown that. I will just go a little further. So this is the Planck spectrum, and you are looking for distortions for this. Really, it is easy to define a dimensionless frequency which does not change with the uh, redshift. And I will work in terms of occupation number, which is again uh, Lorentz invariant. So just a simple example: if you have high energetic electrons, they interact with CMB. So they push some low energy photons to high energy. So that is you got a spectral distortion. So when this uh, energy of electrons is have a thermal distribution and the energy of the electrons is small, then this uh, difference between these two, the in original spectrum and the final distorted spectrum is called a Y type distortion. And the Y type distortion, so you can define some parameters, uh, how efficient this Compton scattering is by multiplying it by this number of scatterings. So number density times cross section that gives you number uh, in the non-relativistic limit, the energy transferred in each scattering is of order T over M. So if you multiply these two, you get what is the efficiency of scattering of energy exchange between the electrons and photons. So if this number is high, in particular if this number becomes of order 1, then it means that energy uh, exchange between electrons and photons is very efficient. So you will get a Bose-Einstein spectrum. If it is uh, much smaller than 1, then it is not efficient and you will get a Y-type distortion. So this parameter control, so energy exchange can go both ways. So this is photon to electron, this is electron to photons. And the net distortion is basically in equilibrium, these two will cancel each other. So the net distortion you will get if they have CMB and electrons are different temperature. So that is called the amplitude of Y distortion. And most of what Jens in the morning we talked about and people have been using now was the solutions to this component. All these are solutions to component equation. So you have this Y distortion which is blue. And as you increase this Y gamma parameter, it, you relax to a mu type distortion in between your intermediate. So people have been using this Y type distortion to put constraints on all sorts of physics, but actually they are off by a factor of 5 or even more. Because uh, most of these scenarios, uh, this non relativistic approximation is not valid. So you have to actually uh, follow the electromagnetic cascade until everything becomes non relativistic and things thermalize. 
And all the electrons in this uh, energy, high energy cascade will interact with the background photons. And it can happen many, many times. So you can have cycles, you know. The first high energy electrons, it excites, it uh, energizes a background CMB photon. The CMB photon may also have very high energy. So it will also lose energy to more background electrons. So it will excite more background electrons. Right? These background electrons will again interact with more CMB photons. So this cascade becomes broader and broader. And the, in the end, you are left with something which is frozen out at uh, in the uh, main part of the CMB spectrum. That is this non-thermal relativistic spectral distortion. So we can do this for different photon and injection by different photons or electron positron pairs. And you see that the spectral shapes are different. So the general trend is if you increase the energy, the uh, this uh, you are basically creating a, so you are, I am injecting same amount of a total energy, but in terms of different, uh, the energy of the initial particles is different, right? So this is the red is the Y type distortion. You see that it is very different. In fact, in general, it is smaller because when you are injecting uh, uh, high energy particles, they actually transfer, uh, they lose, they can lose all of their energy to very small number of initial photons and they scatter the photons to much higher energies. So develop a, the uh, amplitude of this peak goes down and it goes to the right and you develop a thick tail. And at some point, these photons in the tail again scatters uh, electrons and then electrons scatters photons and you develop a secondary. So it actually goes up and down, it oscillates the amplitude of the uh, peak, it oscillates up and down as uh, above 1 GV you uh, more or less saturate. So at above 1 GV you actually get to a universal solution where you become independent of what particles you are injecting or what uh, energy you are injecting at. You get to a universal solution but it still depends on redshift. So you are still sensitive to what redshift you injected the particles at. Right, so this is, uh, so if you you know, I'll try to put uh, constraints on decaying dark matter with different lifetimes. So dark matter is decaying at lifetime corresponds to different decay redshift. So if you assume Y and mu type distortions and try to put constraints using COVID data, you will get this gray line. But you use actual solutions, then at high energies actually you do go back to the mu distortion because if it is equilibrium, there is no law, there is no freedom. You forget everything about the initial conditions. So you do get back to the mu distortions. Uh, at uh, high energies, but uh, at uh, above redshifts of 10 to the 5. But at low redshifts, there is actually a huge difference and actually uh, you are very sensitive to what what was the initial, uh, whether you injected electron or a photon or what was the initial energy of the injected particle. And you can be off, the constraints actually become weaker by factor of 5 or more because with the relativistic distortions, you are decreasing the amplitude, amplitude is smaller. So you can do this for, so this is for electron positron, this is for photon photon, already you see that constraints look different. You can make it in a two dimensional plot. So at uh, high redshifts, you are making a new type distortion. So you don't have any dependence on the mass, but at low redshifts, you actually get uh, dependent on uh, this dark matter mass and you have this basically ups and downs. So the constraints become weaker or stronger because the peak is going up and down as you are changing the uh, energy of the injected particles. So we can do a lot of other things. So we actually went further and also actually looked at CMB and isotropies. So if you're injecting energy, then you will also change the recombination. In particular, you change the residual electron fraction, so which will generate additional polarization in the CMB. So the polarization looking at mostly E-type polarization. You can constrain again uh, the energy reaction around the time of recombination. And even before uh, two times 10 to the six, so after BBN, actually these injected particles can also destroy the BBN elements and you can destroy the concordance that we have. So this uh, looking at the, how the injected particles will dissociate the elements which were created during BBN, you can put additional constraints. So you can put all that together and this is the final constraint. So this band comes from varying the energy and type of particles that you are injecting. If you vary those, you get basically not a single line but a band. But at high redshifts, it just becomes a mu distortion. So it becomes a line. So these are the new COBE constraints which are compared with previous constraints and these are very different. Also plotted BBN constraint. And this was the previous CMB and isotropy constraint which usually stopped at the time of recombination. But we can actually go even further before because energy injection is again not instantaneous. Even if you are injecting particles much before the uh, time of recombination, some of that energy is actually deposited after into the plasma or into the recombining plasma 
after or at the time of recombination. So, actually you do change the residual electron fraction even if energy was inducted at the zero 10 to the 4. So, actually there was a gap that existed here between CMB spectral distortions and an isotropic constraint we have filled that. So, again you can do same thing with uh, primordial black holes depending on their mass and temperature they inject uh, they produce all particles which exist democratically right. So, you have bosons, quarks, pions everything that you can uh, you can produce and you can again do the same thing for primordial black holes. So, we uh, corrected the so the, there are new constraints on primordial black holes and also to so fill the gap that existed here. Uh, and you can convert that constraints on black holes assuming some model of formation of black holes to constraints on primordial power spectrum. And then again, so I talked about neutrinos. So, if you inject neutrinos at very high energies, then you can actually, uh, actually uh, you even probe uh, energy injection up to the shift of 10 to the 7. So, these are very high energy neutrinos. And the amount of energy injected in neutrinos, I am parameterizing in terms of this N effective. So, here actually this is Planck constraint, but spectral distortions actually constrain N effective to much higher in terms of uh, N effective in the form of very high energy neutrinos, uh, much, much higher orders of magnitude better than Planck. Uh, so, again, so you can also do the same thing with BBN. Uh, so, above 1 GeV actually, so you do not have to actually, if you are injecting particles above 1 GeV, it turns out that you get a universal spectrum. So, it actually do, turns out you do not have to follow the cascade. But we have provided a correction table. So, you just assume all energy goes into mu distortions and then pro, 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 uh, and then depending on the inject uh, uh, redshift you that you are injecting your particles at you can provide uh, apply this correction factor to correct your constraints right. So, uh, calculate your constraints you need mu type because this is in the uh, this particular paper the correction table. So, if you want more accurate uh, constraints rather than just assuming y type distortions you should use apply this correction factor. Okay, so last I think five or six minutes. How much? One minute for the talk. Okay, so I will just very quickly go through. I already talked about. So you should look at the posters. So, but the main thing is that you assume it is a composite dark matter particle which has some internal levels, and this internal level can be anywhere. It can be in radio range, or it can be X-ray range, or gamma range, anywhere. But for illustration, we have taken we took that to be radio range because we are interested in what it does to. The, and you can do lot of these things. So, physics is simpler to 21 centimeter except there is a Brumsch along which is important because you start producing if it is dark matter it gets decoupled from CMB very early on unlike the hydrogen. So, you actually start producing distortion or the absorption feature in the CMB very very early even before recombination. Before recombination Brumsch along is important it will destroy any feature right. So, in the so, uh, without Brumsch along you will expect this broad feature, but if you include Brumsch along this actually goes away and you uh, get this narrow feature which is very similar to what you get from edges. But the transition that we need for dark matter to get to match the edges is actually 100 times larger. So, it is at 150 gigahertz not 1.4 gigahertz. And this energy that the Brumsch along absorbed, so that it destroyed the feature it had to create the photons to destroy this feature. So, it had to get that energy from somewhere. So, that energy is coming from rest of the CMB spectrum. So, you predict that actually uh, uh, accompanying this there should also be a y type and mu type distortion. So, you can actually fit the maybe the amplitude and even get the right f the full width half maximum with not the exact shape. And you also predict that if your dark matter is there then you will look at a quasar then you will also this dark matter halos which absorb this photons from quasar and just like 21 centimeter forest you will have a dark forest and you look at the star, one point statistics of the dark forest and it turns out it is uh, uh, sensitive to the properties of dark matter whether it is collisional or collisionless the self interactions of dark matter and whether also whether initial power spectrum it is also sensitive to the initial power spectrum. And then I think maybe in the last minus one minute let me just quickly go over the uh, polarized kinetic sunny Daldovich effect. I just wanted to so I think Aritro will tell you more in his five minutes. But just uh, the main point is that you know if you at second order you basically create both a black body type and a uh, SZ type spectrum. So, this is just a y type distortion and because it is uh, second order in velocity. So, there is velocity inside that theta you have a quadrupole. So, you have also a polarization. So, you have a polarization which has a y type spectrum. And there is no cosmic variance. So, from reionization we calculated this and it is of order few times equivalent to r of few times 10 to the minus 5. 
So, it is very very futuristic, but at the low energy at the high multipoles actually this becomes a low uh, the packet ionization is not included here. If you include that I will show you it becomes of order nano Kelvin. So, it is not maybe too pessimistic to uh, assume uh, uh, to uh, maybe it is not too optimistic to say that this might be detected in CMBS4 and it is sensitive to the duration of reionization. And yeah, I want to just point so that just the linear KSD effect is also actually very immensely sensitive to the uh, to the width of the reionization. So, in these two models, uh, the total optical depth is same, I are just changing the reionization history, the width of the reionization. The linear KSD effect from reionization changes by you know uh, factor of 100 percent, 300 percent. But unfortunately, this is undetectable. If we could detect this, we could have nailed down reionization because it has the same spectrum as primordial CMB isotopies and the CMB cosmic variance uh, kills you. But here you have a different spectrum and it is polarized. So, uh, you are not affected by the cosmic variance. So, you can actually uh, learn about reionization. So, and then so see the poster and there is some early works also and there are some things here. And then the Hubble tension, I just want to maybe show this formula to uh, and I will not share too much about this. Just that you know the acoustic uh, peaks correspond to the extrema of this cosine k r plus phi r is the uh, sound horizon at recombination. So, most people miss this phi nu factor. If you tell out you uh, uh, you know calculate where the position of the peaks will be it is given by this formula. So, people who have only looked at d a over r square, but they have forgotten about this phi. So, we actually manipulate phi. So, we just stop the neutrinos from free streaming, but do not change d a or r s. So, the expansion history remains the same and you solve the Hubble tension. So, you can do all sorts of games. Uh, so, let me. Uh, so, this just shows that you know if you have a lambda CDM universe, you stop neutrinos from free streaming, you actually you go, go from red line to blue line. When you increase the Hubble tension, you come back to the red line. So, there is a degeneracy between the Hubble parameter and neutrino free streaming. And again, you can do all sorts of MCMC. And uh, we have a prediction that actually if this is the solution, then you should see the effects in matter power spectrum and also uh, in the lensing polarization, lensing B modes. So, again, so this is uh, maybe a bit uh, optimistic statement that okay, if it is real, this is one solution. And again, so I will leave you with this slide about the future. There is a lot of data is coming. And in the end, we are, you know, theorists can produce a lot of models. When the end, data will decide whether these anomalies are correct or not, or they maybe the anomalies will go away, or which of the anomaly solutions is correct that we have to look for future data. And a lot of interesting data is coming, and we should, uh, yeah. So, uh, so I think the future is very promising, and I think I'm few minutes over time. Sorry yeah. about that. Uh, we Thank can you. take two questions. Great. Thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, you had a plot where you were matching edges and uh, I mean you were looking right. at the consistency with edges and with the scenario. Uh, previously when people looked at different kinds of dark matter for the context of edges, they found only a certain percentage of it had to be for example milli charged because the phase exactly, space yeah. was. So, is there a similar yeah, ruling no, no, out? This is very different from all those because okay. there also the absorption was still coming from 21 centimeter line. Okay. But here this there is no 21 centimeter at all. And dark the whole thing is, is coming from. Dark the matter is completely neutral. Okay. The constituents of dark matter is composite. So, it is made of different particles and those particles have milli charge. Oh. So, okay. think of a dark neutron. If not neutron was stable, it would be a dark matter. Okay. And these internal transitions of dark matter which are absorbing which directly. Are, oh. directly. Thank so, which is why this absorption happens at a shift of 2000. Not at. Ah, okay. But you get so the feature the, still at yeah. the same same frequency as 60 uh, megahertz. Right. No, so then you are ruling out this parameter of space of dark matter. Yes. What are you then ruling out? This particular parameter space of dark matter. So all so right now all parameter space is open because no one look has looked at absorption uh, signatures in dark matter. So uh, right now everything is open. Even you can look for these features in optical, infrared, radio, X-ray of gamma rays also. Just like people were looking for X-ray lines and. Hi, Rishi. Thanks. Uh, here. So, for the nice talk, I mean, I have a question regarding the initial part when you are saying that because of the cascade of the energy, you also predicted how the polarization uh, signal will change the 
Right, right. Uh, so, yeah. right. Did you try out the whether you can constrain the width of uh, recombination epoch? Because that you can constrain from combining TT and EE. No, no. So here the polarization is mostly sensitive to the residual ionization fraction. Yes. Uh -huh. So here actually we are not probing the standard recombination. But you are actually modifying the recombination, particularly the tail end of the recombination that gets modified, and that changes this uh, residual electron fraction. But so can we measure this? We we, this is, we have added the additional parameter, and we are just constraining that parameter. Okay, so you have constrained it from some observations. So for one? CMB observations, this, this okay, is the okay. Planck, I missed that. Planck okay. CMB polarization. So this band, uh, the pink band, okay. this is the Planck's uh, temperature and E mode polarizations, all the Planck anisotropies, which I is see. giving you this pink mm -hmm. band. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, let us thank uh, Rishi for the talk. Uh, next talk is by uh, Subodh Patil. Well, uh, first, uh, let me thank the organizers for the invitation to speak. It's always really nice to be here uh, at the RRI. Um, very beautiful campus. I could spend all day just sitting under the trees. Um, so today's, uh, so this is quite rare actually to be speaking at a workshop um, and have, uh, that is not dedicated to spectral distortions and have two other talks before you on it. So. Um, I'm very happy to be the third speaker on the topic, uh, although I'll probably have a very different uh, take on it because um, I'm primarily interested in um, very high energy physics and, and, and particle physics in particular. Um, and um, um, I would like to tell you about the possible, well, the, the certainly the relationship between spectral distortions and uh, gravitational waves. So um, if you go onto this really, uh, really nice website, gwplotter.com, and you know, go nuts with all the, all the options you could take, um, here you have the standard sort of uh, sensitivity curve plots that you would get for all the different things that people are um, planning or are already operational. Um, of course, this always comes with a caveat emptor that there's no such thing as a raw sensitivity curve. These uh, are sort of things that sort of assume a very particularly peak spectral line. Uh, and I suppose that's the most agnostic thing that you could, you could uh, worry about. But if you're looking for stochastic backgrounds, for instance, uh, you know, then you'll just have two numbers to constrain, an amplitude and a power law, and you can start integrating over frequency bins. You may find that these sensitivity curves drop quite a lot. Um, but uh, why am I showing you this? Um, well, the title of this workshop is Frontiers in Cosmology. Um, so uh, these frequency ranges are depicted most resources, mostly of astrophysical relevance. There's a bit of cosmology, depending on what redshift you think um, cosmology begins at, um, um, that's relevant here. Um, but you know, I'm interested in you know telling you about frontiers in cosmology. So before I get into the meat of what I wanted to uh, get into, I just want to sort of cover the whole range of what we can learn from gravitational waves. Uh, the remarkable thing about gravitational waves, by the way, is that we are going to be getting them. They are, exist at uh, a much bigger frequency range than um, electromagnetic waves. Uh, and that comes from the obvious fact that you need to have a source uh, that is approximately some fraction of the wavelength for a transverse wave, anyway, uh, of, the free, of the wave that you're trying to produce. And of course, you know, it's very hard to have you know, free charges in a dipole configuration you know, wiggling around at very, very large scales. So we expect. Uh, you know, the, the universe to be quite, uh, you know, empty of electromagnetic waves above a certain very, very large frequency. But gravitational waves cover the whole spectrum. So, um, you know, here we have these sort of interferometers that are photon noise limited at these scales. Uh, but what's going on over here? Is there anything interesting? Can we even measure things over here? So um, I had, uh, so this is one of these workshops that uh, you sort of attend and it really kind of blows your mind. It, I've had this uh, twice happen to me where I sat at a workshop just, uh, you know, and was introduced to something that, you know, could end up being a whole new direction for me in my research. And, and this is the idea of high, ultra high frequency gravitational waves. Um, and by ultra high frequency, I'm talking all the way up to terahertz. Um, how is that done? Um, well, uh, realize, uh, recall that for interferometers, um, you're trying, you basically, you have these sort of like these two lever arms trying to get some sort of a quadrupolar distortion in, in length, the fractions of a size of an atomic nucleus. Um, that's why they're so long with a laser beam. But we can also have such 
uh, spatial uh, precision with atom interferometry. Um, so there's sort of these, these uh, Bose-Einstein condensate design uh, principles that are trying to get up to the, and certainly to the megahertz regimes. There's uh, levitated nanoparticles that are also going to get up into the similar uh, ballpark. And then uh, there's something that you may have come across if you're interested in dark matter, uh, which is axion uh, searches for axions using axion photon conversion via the inverse Primakov effect, uh, meaning that you know, there's a photon that gets converted to an axion, two photons that turn into an axion. There's a similar thing for gravitons. It's called the Gertzenstein effect. Um, Gertzenstein effect. And uh, we are, uh, uh, if you know, of course, the, the frequency range is up here, but the sensitivity is still quite poor, uh, but one can dream. And there's an active effort among experimentalists to do tabletop. Uh, so these are potentially quite cheap uh, relative to throwing, you know, Lisas or, you know, constellations of Lisas in orbit. Um, that can get up to frequencies up to terahertz. Now, why is that interesting? Uh, well, if you're an astrophysicist, you're probably not that much interested. But if you're a particle physicist, uh, the standard model um, itself has a crossover. There's no phase transitions in the standard model, but there's a crossover uh, and is going to peak at around gigahertz. Um, all sorts of high scale phase transitions could have happened uh, in the early universe that we would have no evidence of today because the remnant defects have just decayed long before you know, the hot big bang commenced, um, they would still turn up, potentially. Um, um, the list goes on. You could have primordial black holes, decaying kaluza klein gravitons, which can actually be very, very long lived. So these are very interesting things to think about uh, if you're a particle physicist. Um, and then there's, of course, uh, the other end over here. Um, why do pulsar timing arrays crap out over here? And the answer is obvious is because you're just limited by how big these arrays can be in the sky. Um, and so uh, there is a, a gigantic uh, 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 range of gravitational waves uh, that we kind of have not very much scope of detecting yet. Uh, of course, uh, indirectly through CMB B-mode polarization, uh, we can hope to sort of uh, get some evidence, if they're there, uh, of of, of some sort of stochastic background, but there is this tremendous gap that spans one to one to uh, about uh, six orders, six decades in frequency. Um, that's pretty huge. So what can we do? Um, so probably it won't come as much of a surprise to you, given the title of my talk, that um, spectral distortions will fill this gap. So. For the remainder of my talk, um, I'd like to give a, a, a basic uh, overview of spectral distortions for those of you who uh, may not have been, uh, may not be familiar with it. Um, I, I double checked with Jens this morning that um, I'm not going to um, be, you know, repeating anything he said. Uh, but of course, you know, Rishi's talk went over some very interesting consequences of, of what the consequences of these things are. Um, I'm going to go over the different types of spectral distortions, hopefully in a in a in a way that's uh, intuitive if you're if you're not. Uh, if this is all new to you, and how it can actually be sensitive to dissipation of scalar and tensor modes in uh, the pre-recombination plasma. And in that way, it offers us a, a detector, a stochastic gravitational wave detector in the sky. Um, um, this may bore you uh, or excite you depending on your predisposition, but towards the end, I will give you the so what, right? So, so and, and, and the so what is all the different uh, amazing particle physics you can do. It's not an academic thing to do. Um, so, you know, depending on whether you check HEPPH every day or astroph.co, um, you know, you will, you will uh, be able to tell me whether you find this interesting or not. I certainly think it's interesting. Um, and then I'll hopefully have time to briefly uh, touch upon some experimental concepts and proposal on the table to measure spectral distortions that were alluded to, but maybe I'll give a bit more detail. So, yeah, so one of the most successful predictions of the Big Bang is that, um, that there is a relic radiation that is very, very close to a black body um, with known deviations that Jens alluded to. Um, and uh, if you dump any amount of energy, uh, any amount of photons into the plasma, um, um, if they are distributed exactly according to the derivative of this function, all you do is change the temperature redshift relation. Um, now, what happens when you dump photons into a plasma is that if they scatter enough, uh, scattering rapidly thermalizes, and so you wouldn't know any better. 
So if you're going to want to see any distortion of the, the perfect black body, you had better be in a regime where scattering is somewhat inefficient, but not completely inefficient. And uh, if you manage to dump photons into this plasma such that this relationship is not satisfied, um, there are two main types of distortions. Um, the first one is as if you still have both science and statistics, but with a non-zero chemical potential, which is important at redshifts of about uh, greater than 50,000. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, wide distortions, which uh, tend to be more important a little, a little later. Um, and um, 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 another way to understand wide distortions is simply through the mixing of black body very crudely, uh, where you get, when you combine two black bodies, you don't actually, you know, imagine two black bodies sort of combining in the sky from different regions with different temperatures. The resulting mix of photons is not going to be black body, there'll be a distortion of the wean tail. Um, those are generically the sort of two, roughly the two types of uh, um, dimensions, if you like, of spectral distortion that are easily parameterizable. Okay, there's an infinite number of ways you could deviate from a function, right? These are the two canonical ways in which we find it easy to constrain their presence. So um, how do you mess up the spectrum? How do you mess up a black body spectrum in the early universe? So uh, you know, before recombination, Bremsstrahlung and double Compton scattering uh, change the number of photons. So that's clearly going to do something to your distribution, your phase space distribution. Uh, whereas regular Compton scattering just redistributes photons in phase space, which ends up in rapid thermalization about a redshift of over a million. So if anything happened before redshift of a million, you would not know any better. But a redshift of a million is still a striking number for anybody who thinks cosmology sorts of, at least our access to observations ends uh, at recombination. Um, and of course, you can indirectly probe things through BBN, of course, but um, this is still a, 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 an impressively large redshift. Um, but of course, many more interesting things can happen other than these two canonical shapes. Uh, you know, you could have a time-dependent release, as Rishi was, you know, um, going into quite a bit of detail over. And uh, you could have these sort of intermediate shapes, which you can, you're free to parameterize however you like. Um, um, and so uh, what causes, uh, um, so, so, so how is it that spectral distortions are sensitive to any sort of uh, stochastic background of anything? So uh, scalar modes dissipate. Um, I am in this room. I am talking to you. Uh, my, my, my voice is a scalar mode, it's a longitudinal propagation. Eventually, uh, uh, if you go far enough away, there's a, a more than the, the, you know, the, the whatever, it's not quite number square, but you know, that decay. It all goes into heat, I'm heating up this room, hopefully with some information and not just entropy, but um, it's, it's heating the, the air around me. The same thing happens in the primordial plasma, and that heating results in a, both a mu and a y type distortion, um, crudely, it's, it's this much power that gets dumped into a distortion. Um, and um, tensor dissipation, oh, and by the scalar dissipations are, uh, are due to both free streaming and scattering effects, but you could also imagine a quadrupolar tensor perturbation going through your plasma, but that only dissipates through free streaming. So you've lost one channel, and so it's a lot more inefficient. So these are the transfer functions that you would get from a particular energy release history to a mu distortion signal by a tensor and scalar modes, and notice that tensor modes are about five orders of magnitude less efficient. So um, you've seen this plot earlier. Um, this went into the, um, um, one of the, the white papers, the NASA white papers, decadal surveys, um, where we sort of tried to make a case for a pro-class mission for uh, you know, really filling in a gap for sensitivity to small-scale scalar power, um, but uh, but spectral distortions does precisely the same thing for tensor power. And by the way, there is, to my knowledge, in fact, probably uh, I can say this with some amount of certitude, there is nothing else that will fill this gap. Only spectral distortions will tell us about primordial sources uh, within this frequency range. Okay? So, um, so uh, that's, that's quite a big range to ignore. And um, if you imagine, you know, you, you gave us all the money in the world, it still wouldn't be uh, something that you would really want to, you know, say is anything comparable to pulsar timing arrays to, or interferometers or even um, CMB anisotropies. But you, we work with what we get. And um, I'd like to just sort of spend some time now and tell you what sort of interesting physics 
uh, you could hope to extract by bridging this gap uh, before I tell you about um, just a little bit about you know what's on the table right now um, with actually trying to get this uh, looked at. So uh, before we do this though, um, there is a little bit of work that has to be done in separating sources that are really, really primordial, that sort of came from inflation, so the very, very long, long wavelengths re-entering the horizon versus things that are created sub-horizon, which very often first order phase transitions uh, that happened um, uh, can be. So you know, maybe they're even in some dark sector, maybe they're not even in our visible sector. That's entirely possible, by the way. So, but, and they would produce gravitational waves and nothing else. Um, and so uh, once you account for that, um, so the next three slides, I'm going to do my best to explain in, in, in simple terms uh, what the particle physics that is interesting that these types of spectral distortion measurements could constrain. So axions are uh, um, potentially ubiquitous in the universe uh, if you believe in string theory, but even if you don't, they're also around in the standard model, and in, pr in principle, they could be very, very light. And so uh, if you just sort of add all the operators that you could add uh, in the presence of an axion, uh, you can imagine having a coupling that looks like this that couples to like FF dual. This is for a dark photon. Um, and what that does is if it starts to move, it sets up one helicity to have a tachyonic mass. So it really starts to overproduce these things. These things back react, produce gravitational waves with a very particular knee. And uh, even Firus, by the way, could have ruled out some of the some parameter space that I have actually seen in papers, um, but I think they're a bit nuts because they require certain decay constants to go above and Planck, which no, no serious theoretical physicist would ever advocate. But um, um, these, by the way, are parameter ranges that are of quite topical interest to people who are worried about uh, the presence of ultralight axions in the early universe. If there was, um, if there was some coupling to some some dark uh, U1 sector. Um, so this is not an idle thing to do, um, and in fact, uh, you know, some phenomenologist colleagues of ours have gone aw gone away and started taking this really, really seriously. And uh, um, it has actually uh, kind of been outsourced to me as part of the spectral distortions effort to sort of be the outreach to the particle phenomenology community and get them to include spectral distortions and all their exclusion plots. Uh, the memo is starting to get out there. Um, another thing it could constrain is the presence of very low scale. For, uh, first order phase transitions. Um, so first order phase transitions have multiple sources of gravitational waves actually. Um, there are bubble collisions, there's MHD turbulence, and uh, remarkably, uh, sound waves are the most relevant uh, um, contributor. Um, and so this is, uh, so this, this parameter here is roughly the duration of the phase transition in, in units of Hubble at, at, the, at the particular time. Alpha is a measure of how much latent heat you dump from the false vacuum to the true vacuum. And again, uh, you're starting to cover. So if you look up the literature on, uh, on, on first order phase transitions constrained by LISA, um, um, the sport that was been played there by my colleagues is literally, here is an experiment. Let me cook up a model that can get into those exclusion plots. And so you could play the same game here. Um, you can also constrain, uh, potentially, uh, models of cosmic string network collapse. So in any um, symmetry breaking pattern in the early universe that ended up with the standard model, there could have been all sorts of topological defects that are very shortly lived. They don't live long enough. Um, so we don't see them in the sky anymore. Um, but they've decayed and that decay process has dumped gravitational waves. Um, and we could potentially still be sensitive to them. So this is actually getting kind of interesting here, right? So um, um, there are uh, some, some quite interesting uh, exclusion uh, um, regions of parameter space that you can exclude already using Firus and Punk that are not crazy. Um, and of course, a probe class mission could really, really tell us a lot. Um, so that was the, uh, the case for the, for the, the, on the theory side. Well, okay, so um, I'm just gonna make a little brief uh, summary of what was uh, done before before I conclude my talk. Um, so that was, that was pointing out that um, um, there, are, uh, there is about six decades in frequency of gravitational waves that we will not measure through any other means other than through spectral distortions. They're just, we just don't have detectors big enough in the sky. Um, and the one that's in the CMB anisotropies is, is much, much bigger scale. So this is an intermediate gap that this fills. And there is some interesting particle physics. Uh, 
Interesting is a, a word that comes with an asterisk. Uh, it really depends on the eye of the beholder. If you look up hep pH today and what's being produced, um, then it touches upon some of those papers. In that sense, it is interesting whether the field has gone haywire and is just doing whatever it can just for the sake of writing papers is another question. But these are nevertheless interesting ideas that have been entertained by people who very seriously advocate um, you know, an ultraviolet completion of the standard model that ends up in something that looks like string theory or supergravity. So where are we now? Okay, so, so I think the question has been asked before, where are we now, right? Virus has come and gone. It's already been 30 something years. Um, what next? So um, there was this Voyage 2050 call uh, where the European Space Agency sort of just asked uh, members of the community to put forward ideas for what might be an interesting um, set of things to focus on for which a very senior panel got together and uh, very strongly gave us a very resounding endorsement actually for spectral distortions. And, and um, 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 it, says, it says in this passage, in this paragraph, that you know, gravitational waves are also something to look into. But we all know that there's plenty of other things that are going to be uh, looking at gravitational waves. And so um, we have you know, been pulled aside and told, start planning, um, because uh, this proposal will seriously get looked at. Now, the, uh, the, the uh, net effect of the start planning is that we realize that you know this is probably something that really is going to be the third call of 2050. So I'll probably also be getting close to retirement at that point. But the web preparation nevertheless has to start now. And so we just recently concluded a workshop uh, where some very interesting new ideas were put on the table for maybe going beyond uh, Fourier, uh, Fourier transform spectroscopy. Uh, I learned today that this is possible to do on the chip, but uh, there's possibility of just directly using radiometers, just you know stacking radiometers on, on various planes, just you know, going straight for the, for the frequencies. Um, um, we have to admit that the foreground issues are tough. Um, way out of my pay grade, I, I know very little about it, but uh, they are not insurmountable. And there's a sustained effort now there's, uh, you know, of, of people getting together to try and really hammer out uh, what's next. Uh, we invited Joe Silk to the workshop, and he said, why not just go to the moon? Um, um, it's not as crazy as it sounds. But the take home message from the senior ESA scientists that we invited was very much go big or go home. Don't bother. Don't bother with any of these sort of like, you know, um, you know, like these incremental things that, you know, people have been trying to mess around with for some time. Um, there really is uh, an appetite for this at a very high level. Um, and in fact, it's been told to us um, that the theory case has already been made. Um, you don't need to tell us more about it. You need to get the observational and foreground issues under control. So, um, yeah, let me conclude. Uh, um, I think I'm under time, actually. Um, um, so spectral distortions are a powerful probe. Well, not powerful probe. A somewhat weak probe of scales you don't access in any other way. So in that sense, it is powerful. Uh, um, of course, you know, once you measure something, then the, you know, that's sort of like the, you know, you measure the, the actual existence of the thing, let's say the monopole, then that's really sort of like a pathfinder that's going to spur a lot of development in measuring all sorts of things like, you know, anisotropies and so on. And, you know, maybe, um, maybe Rishi can write, you know, many more papers then. I mean, like, there's, there's just so much more to be done, but we first need to get the base level observation, something planned to do it. Um, it is, it is a complementary probe, a physical process that is totally inaccessible by any other means. And that's, that's a fact, right? And I, I said, I alluded earlier to this workshop. What, what, you know, where I sat in, I was like, wow, this is really amazing. This is actually how I got into spectral distortion. There's a workshop in 2013 at the Lawrence Center. I'd never heard about spectral distortions. Jens Kluber gave a talk, and my jaw dropped, and I've been working on it ever since. Um, um, and it's because of this fact, right? You are seeing much more the factory of whatever produced those modes you see in the sky at work, right? That is incredible, right? So um, um, remember, cosmology is an inference science. We're not directly in, in measuring things, so more data is making us more confident of our inference or maybe telling us we've been fooled. Um, and um, there are many, many beyond the standard model scenarios that can be further or already constrained uh, by spectral distortions. And, and for me, that's, that's, that's reason enough. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, we have time for question, really. Hey, um, I guess I'm a bit 
confused because according to Steven Weinberg, gravitational waves only couple to neutrinos. So the damping is only from neutrino and isotopic stress coupling, meaning wouldn't you have to measure neutrino spectral distortions to see that? So I'm just confused for how a photon I think spectral I think distortion okay, so, can do it. So neutrino, neutrino damping of gravitational waves right, is separate from dissipation of tensor modes. No, but that, no, how is that different? By energy conservation, if you, if you want to heat something, you've got to, you've got to by energy conservation con and tensor modes yeah. can either convert the energy to neutrinos, which they do, but those are very hard to measure. No, 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 hang on. No, so, so that is not true that gravitational waves get converted into neutrinos by one person. Right. They heat the neutrinos. No, no, no. So what happens, okay, so, so this is really two different physics I've written, let me tell you. So okay. what happens yeah. with neutrinos, right, is you have, so I'm what, very, what, I'm very familiar what, with hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm very familiar no, 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 with that. No, no, you yeah. make something up. Let me let me explain. Right? What damps gravitational waves? Right? You set up something if it's light, right, and it's free streaming and has and it has tensile anisotropic stress. Gravitational waves goes through. You set up a quadrupolar perturbation. Gravitational wave hits it again. It gets damped. That's a separate mechanism from gravitational waves heating up a plasma and then losing energy through dissipation. Two but, but the mechanisms. latter effect, is there any reference that actually happens? Because it then, so, the tensor, so, so you do, by the way, these tensor dissipation uh, 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 transfer functions do have to take into account neutrinos. They do have to factor that. Of course, in. and that's the big but effect. Those are two separate mechanisms. That, that's the big so another effect. mechanism on top of that. No, I understand. But, yeah. but as I thought in the normal calculations, the photon does not get any energy input from the gravitational waves. And therefore, I guess I'm just confused. Is there a reference? I'd love to see a calculation. I, so, so I'm a bit, to be honest, I'm a bit confused by your question, but, I'll, I, but I'm, what I'm trying to understand is, is, is that you're saying that, um, so, so gravitational waves are heating up the plasma. That is I, the I, No, I, I don't get that because right. in our calculations and all the literature that I'm aware of, yeah. and con if you go to conformal time, they are, yeah. they are decoupled completely. And therefore, I, just, I guess I'm just missing where the coupling happens. So if there is a literature, I'd, love, I'd, I'd really need to know. I'd really love to know that. Yeah. Uh, Okay, we can talk details. I'm a bit thrown off by your analogy to neutrinos, though, because uh, I think that is a very distinct mechanism. Yeah. I agree, neutrinos. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, I think uh, Rishi has a comment or a question. Two questions here. Maybe I can comment on your question. So it's exactly like neutrinos. So you have to look at this question of scales. So neutrinos are damping gravitational waves on horizon scales, right? Because they are free streaming. Now you ask, on what scales are photons free streaming? They are free streaming on the scales where you know, the order mean free path of the photons. In the plasma, on the scales of mean free path, photons are free streaming, right? So on those scales, they will damp gravitational waves. It is exactly like neutrinos. So that is why you are looking at very small scales, k of 10 to the 6, because those are the uh, free streaming scales of photon that you are probing here. No, no, it's very, very weak. So it's it, very it depends, so at, at by the time weak. of recombination, yeah. The free streaming scale of photon has also become of the size of horizon. Look, look, I, right? think, I think you can just, without getting into the complicated details, it's a very obvious statement, right? That if you were moving things around with a gravitational wave, that energy has to come from somewhere. It's going to be very inefficient, but if you're doing it enough, you're getting it out of the gravitational wave. Very simple physics, right? There's different fifth scales and processes that go into it, but, you know. Yeah. I think there are more questions. Uh, uh, please carry on. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm under time, right? So I can take many. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So let me just turn to my very ignorant question here. Um, so on this uh, signature, as a signature of this gravitational waves. What do we see? And the question is, if we detect, start to see something, can we actually tell that it is tensor mode or just we, we just deviate from nominal spectrum and we, we cannot really tell? Yeah, so, so the, answer, the honest answer to your question is you're, you're seeing a number, new distortion, right? At least at the first time you're gonna look for it, you're gonna see something like that. Now what caused it could be many, many things. Now, the examples that I showed you above, uh, I picked specifically because their scalar mode signatures at the same frequencies, the scalar dissipation is controllably small, right? If they were also producing scalar modes, then the mucin will be scalar dominated, right? So there you need to actually then start to refer to, then you need much more 
sensitive measurements and start to look for residual type distortion to be able to tell these things apart. But yes, absolutely, you have no clue, right? But but uh, but let me put it, let me flip it around and say the other thing, right? Which is if there was a peak gravitational wave signature peaked at that scale, the only way you would see it is through some new distortion. So if you could rule out a scalar source through any other means, then you can say, well, you would never detect, you would never claim you detected it, right? You can see that it's consistent with this background. With more data, you may be able to say something. Else. Hopefully this one. Hopefully this one. Oh, sorry, I thought you said in what century. So what was your question? Oh yeah, so 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 there's 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 the mu distortion type. Okay, so remember, there's an infinite ways to distort a function, right? Mu distortion just as if you're adding a chemical potential. Why distortion has a very specific uh, response function? It's complicated, but think of it loosely as, as something on the Wien's tail. And then there's all these sorts of like you know residual type distortions that actually decay over time as well. So if you can trace their time dependence, you can also start to tell apart the energy release history and then say, say stuff about what the specific source was. But that's really, really, really far ahead of where we are right now. Right now, we're just trying to get something to fly. Okay, uh, we'll have two questions. One. Hey, thanks. So I have a question regarding uh, the error bars from on the Omega GWR coating. So these are with what uh, allowance of the scalar perturbations? Like if I take mu of 10 to minus 8, uh, so then error how, bars where? You mean on these uh, So in the Omega GW error bars that you have shown for different experiments, how much uh, contribution from sc scalars do you include? Like, yeah, yeah. So, so, so again, so these examples are specifically picked such that the scalar distortion, the scalar perturbations that are going around are continuing to be tuned to be negligible compared to the tensor ones. Oh, is that extremely, okay. But yeah, yeah. Not so if they case. are present, we are cooked for seeing this. So remember, they will contribute probably greater to mu distortion. That's right. So I'm just asking like, if I take a lambda sodium value of mu, two times yes. energy minus eight. Yes. And I trust that number is going to be there. Yes. What is the corresponding, how big the error bars are going to be? In your one of the multiband plot. Yeah. So 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 I think uh, let's see. So, um, so if you go to the plot, where do you have Lightbird and Lisa? Yeah. This and one. one. Yeah. yeah. So here, how much will I will be affected by this? Oh, you mean the so the lambda CDM? Oh, so so if I go Voyager uh, Vo at Pixie, yes. are like tennis minus eight level minus nine. Yeah, level. yeah. So 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 that 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 signal is for scalar dissipation, right? It's a mu signal from a scalar dissipation, right? So, so look, so this is complicated, right? So you're just measuring a number of which there are many, many sources, right? Right. So, so to can... separate them apart, right? I think this, this goes back to the last question as well. I wouldn't be able to tell you just, if someone just gave me mu and you said, where is this mu coming from? I'd uh, honestly have to say, I don't know, right? Okay. At least it's there. Okay. That makes me pretty happy. But, when, yeah. No, it doesn't. Uh, I mean, no, but at least the mu number you can get, right? I mean, you have a lambda city and value. Yeah. No, lambda sodium uh, with the current CMA measurements of a prediction. saying with, 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 uh, with parameters, with NS or minus one. The scalar perturbation we expect exactly. that we measured from inflation, if we put a power law to it and you, you integrate it over it. the whole spectrum, it's going to generate a signal of that mu 10 to minus 8. No, I think that's a, that's a lower limit, right? So, so if, you have, if you really have scale invariance going over the entire range of modes that the mu distortion uh, tensor uh, transfer function is sensitive, it's a minimum of 10 to the minus 8. Yeah, that's so right. So if there were features, oh, by the way, if there are features, if it, it goes grows up, up yeah, that's right. you get a bigger mu, right? So people have used this to constrain uh, primordial, you know, growth in the power as seeds for primordial intermediate mass primordial black holes. You can already rule that out using virus. Yeah, nice, thanks. One more quick comment is yeah. that this particular band can also, not the full range, but the part of it can be also accessed by astrometry. Uh, motion of, uh, relative motion of a star or object uh, right. Uh, after some, some, some after PTA, of that's right. I do but not remember when, how the bucket looks. Yeah. But one can calculate the bucket given your sensitivity of the astrometric experiment. I'll uh, be very interested in hearing. Yeah. Oliver Dore's paper. Okay, cool. So, so, so maybe one or two orders of magnitude this way. I do not recall. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, people are working on it. Okay, very nice. Thanks. Okay, we'll have last question, and I will request to keep yes. it uh, short in the interest of time. Uh, yeah. So, can thank you. you. Comment on. Uh, different ways of proving the high frequency domain of gravitational waves because there aren't any direct detection experiments in that range. You mean yeah. high is in like up 10 to power 4, larger than 10 power 4. Larger than the, 10 to power 4. In the very first slide, you were showing yes. some sources contributing in that domain. What is, yes. So, so what can do it? Yeah, what can we do? Okay. So, um, so atom interferometry, mm -hmm. right? So you have Bose-Einstein condensates. 
and uh, you know the, you know they have a they have a basically you know they, they have a, a, a quantum wave function that you can basically interfere with each other with very small perturbations mm -hmm. that is sensitive to megahertz here this DC it's about megahertz okay it's a levitated sensor so now you have you levitate nanoparticles it's it's somewhere it's not as competitive um, I don't really know what a heliscope is so I won't comment on it okay but I can tell you what these these are basically re refitted uh, you know light through war experiments using the the, the I keep wanting to say Grotstein because of that book it's, that has traumatized me, but it's a Gertzenstein. Yeah. The inverse Gertzenstein. It's Stein. the inverse Gertzenstein yeah. effect, right? And so, so they're, they're actually, re so a lot of these uh, Axion folks are actually, a lot of them are getting interested in doing high frequency gravitation waves. Now, a big, by the way, I should stress, a big uh, block on their progress is you cannot have a stochastic background up there. You've overclosed the universe, right? I think there's some errors in that computation that allow you to actually say that. And the other thing is you can also have short noise, right? That gives you some sharp knee of, like let's say from KK gravitons, right? You have really late time decaying things that just give you give, uh, stochastic background with the knee. So they're, they're a bit disappointed that they're, uh, that they're not going to get down to something that you would expect from the standard model, which would be way, way down here, mm -hmm. right? So it's really a question of frequency versus sensitivity. Um, these are very, very tiny strings, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, so, so, the, so these are uh, inverse, so this is basically like re-kitted uh, like the wall experiments. Uh, atom interferometry. Uh, what else is it? There's magnetic. There's some sort of resonant cavity technology as well. I see. There's magnons as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this workshop, by the way, uh, I've, if the slides become public, uh, oops, I've included. How do I? Yeah. Yeah. yeah this. Yeah. The website. This workshop. Go through all the slides. Okay. I'll, it's amazing. I'll it's like, I have it. You could lose two, three yeah. days on this. So let's thank Subodh for the talks and so lively discussion. So next we have uh, Willy Penn. So um, I'll be talking about something that we've gotten interested in that's um, related to both large scale structure and the cosmic microwave background. So um, thanks to the organizers for slotting me into, uh, into this session, which I think actually makes it easier to connect to, um, to even though the CMB is not sensitive to helicity in the initial conditions. We had some interesting talks this morning about um, actually measured TB cross correlations, which, um, which is not actually allowed for a random for a, a, a cosmic averaged observer. Of course, any given observer can see all kinds of things. And, um, and that's some the extension of that is uh, to ask, well, when, when is parity violation actually allowed when you also impose full homogeneity and, and isotropy of the universe? So we know that um, neutrinos, for example, um, so the all 100 neutrinos per cubic centimeter in our room, right here, are all left-handed. So it's maximally violated. So the microscopic violation is, is maximal. Um, so there's the un and of course our universe is still fully homogeneous and isotropic, same number of neutrinos everywhere. So uh, compatible with the full cosmological principle, there is a completely independent degree of freedom of helicity violation. And then I'm just going to explain there's been claims over the last few months that this has been measured or detected. I'm going to sort of explain a bit about, uh, so that literature has been a bit opaque, um, I think for many, um, for many even experts. I'm going to try, to try to deconstruct that a little bit of what it takes to measure that and what people are measuring and how to move this field forward because I think, actually think it's an exciting field. Here is, but uh, for just, just as an example of helicity violation that you can get in your kitchen is apparently, this is a pasta called Fusilli. Anybody who's been to Italy um, will be familiar with this pasta. Apparently, um, the vast majority of Fusilli is like neutrinos. It is, I'm going to give you a test. Um, you can tell me how many things this is left-handed for Sealy? How many of you think it's right-handed? Okay. If you think it's left, raise your hand. If you think it's right-handed, raise your hand. It's 50-50. Okay, this is, this is a homework exercise. You, you figure out what the handedness is of Fusili. And this is a nature paper on the self-organization that if you take a can of Fusili, the, the macroscopic ordering of the Fusili will inherit the, the helicity of the microscopic Fusili particles. So this is, you can write nature papers even in, with, your, with, your kitchen, um, with your kitchen supply materials. 
Oh, I do know the answer. We can, at the end of the talk, I'll, uh, we can go back to this. <laughs> and uh, this, this is apparently this um, collective violation of helicity in fossili pasta is thought to be due to plagiarism. That the machine, the first machinist who made the who made this fossili machine, everybody else didn't reinvent it from scratch. Because otherwise, it is not possible that that you know, ninety some percent of all fossili machines have the same parity. I, I, that's what people think. At least those authors think. Anyways, this is sociology here, and it doesn't really matter. Now, just to go back to uh, what actually matters here, is that we know uh, all the late time macroscopic physics are parity symmetric. Okay, so with gravity, with E and M, with any process we ever talk about in astrophysics, um, other than electric weak very early on, um, they're fully symmetric. So you're not going to get a, 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 a helical outcome from any structure formation process. So if you were to measure a, a helical distribution in your large scale structure, that indicates either your physics is very, very different from what you thought it, what we think it is, which most, I think, seems to be an even more amazing um, uh, uh, inferentive true. And surely the most conservative inference, if the claim measurements are true, is that the initial conditions, that the perturbations themselves had a helical asymmetry to them. So that's why I just want to go explain a little bit about what it, what they, what that, what it takes and how much we understand or how much room there may be to um, allow for more degrees of freedom. So um, last year there were three papers, well, two claiming, one claiming a seven sigma, one claiming a three sigma, and one claiming a, a two sigma upper bound on the uh, nature of helicity in the universe. I was on the last paper and my colleagues tell me that I'm totally naive. You've got to claim at least three sigmas, otherwise, otherwise nobody reads aside your paper. Okay? If you claim three sigmas, that's the perfect sweet spot because if you're wrong, that's fine. If you claim seven sigmas, you probably put yourself a bit out on a limb in case this doesn't pan out. So next time you, you do this to your data, this is what people tell me that I, anyways, we were just being naive, but that's fine. Um, this, so these spaces, if you look at face values, the reason why this uh, is, I think, remained this a little bit abstract for many, um, many researchers even in the field, is that they talk about four-point functions, and that's a large dimensional space. You've got all possible, um, what do you call this? What's the name for that? A four-sided object. Sorry. Tetra, no, tetra, heat, and quadrilateral. Thank you. A quadrilateral is a thing with four sides, and there are many ways you can make that happen. Um, it's hard to think about that. The covariance of that is, has eight dimensions. It's just kind of hard to think about that on the fly. You hear a talk, and it seems a bit abstract, and you say, whatever, whatever. Maybe they got it right, and maybe, maybe you believe it or you, or you don't, but it's more a matter of belief than somebody actually sitting down and figuring out what they did. I'm going to try to explain what they did um, in terms of CMB lensing, which is a very similar process to measure a four-point function. And um, here, I think we've heard up so much about it that I can just immediately jump to these plots we've seen before. This is the CMB um, lensing power spectrum um, from well, various experiments uh, compiled on a, a blank paper. And just to recap what, what one does, okay? You take quadratic estimators of the CMB. So this phi that's in, the, in this axis is um, a scalar meant to be represent the gravitational potential due to dark matter or any kind of all matter. And the power spectrum, so you, so you reconstruct the, the 2D distribution of gravitational potential, and you plot the power spectrum of that. Since the potential is quadratic in temperature, this object being plotted is in fact a four-point function of the CMB temperature. That's what the, what's being plotted here. Okay, what, so it, 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 not just implicitly, explicitly, this is a four-point function. It's often called a squeezed four-point since two of the triangles, you know, the, since you've measured a quadratic function and square that, um, you've, got, you've got a bit of symmetry. Two of the, of, the vector, of, the, of the quadrilateral vector. Is there a name for a quadrilateral vector with pairwise sides equal in length? There must be. A, in, high, in high school, I may have learned that. If anybody remembers, please do let me know. Anyways, these are the squeezed, we call them squeezed quadrilaterals. Are they called rhombus? Anyway, I don't remember what those guys are called. Rhombus, when, when you can have two different lengths, but anyways, let's, uh, thank you. Okay, um, and that's, this is the power spe spectrum of this lensing field. Okay, now just to think through what all can be measured, 
In addition to this is the what we call the E mode scalar like um, power spec four point function. It's a scalar like four point function of the temperature um, tri spectrum of the four, four point function. In principle, there is a B mode um, power spectrum. Okay, this is what's sometimes called the parity odd. We heard about it this morning. Um, the CMB parity, well, no, we didn't hear about it. We heard about the parity odd um, polarization. This is all. I think this is all, mm, okay, this includes different things. But anyways, this is a bit of a detail. You can measure the um, non-scalar part of the gravitation, well, gravitational potential is scalar-like, but any non-scalar-like collective deflection um, from the CMB to us. And it's interpreted as a display, uh, lensing as a displacement field. It can have a diversion, it can have a curl. And you can measure the power of the, and sometimes that's called a parity odd, variation at the B mode like lensing effect. And that's in some level inevitable for multiplane lensing. We know that this is there. And this is just a reminder that this is a different configuration of your what do you say? Romb rhomboid? Sorry. <laughs> of your of your um, quadrilaterals. Okay. So by the different configurations and weights, um, you can construct a a different um, power spectra which is the parity odd. Now, parity odd, it's, um, it is odd in the sense that this B mode can fluctuate positive or negative, but the mean is zero and it's symmetric. So it's not, it's not a helical in the sense that there's no preference for a left versus right handed in this power spectrum. It just says that there are random walks. Um, it's not exactly zero as it might have been if you were in a, um, 2D, in a truly single lens universe. So just to distinguish the concepts, this is parity odd. But not helical, so this is allowed. This is the random fluctuation. Sometimes, so this is a bit what we had this morning. Uh, B mode, sure. B modes don't have to be zero if you have dust. Uh, dust B modes can be non-zero, but on, on average, there's no reason why all my B modes are negative. That would be very, very difficult to explain um, in a physical mechanism because if you viewed from the other, an observer on the other side of the galaxy would uh, would think they have the other sign. So this is not something. That, this is observer dependent, and um, and only statistical fluctuations that have a. a isotropically definable um, expected meaning. Okay, so now let's do this in 3D. And um, CMB lensing in 3D, uh, different people call it by different things. I call them cosmic tides. Um, in fact, these are, oops, these are these papers that I mentioned that can be used, these can be used as, um, as detectors for gravitational waves. Okay, it's the same way as CMB. CMB, you, you just have two, your number of modes is limited. You've got a million modes, so your limits from that on tensor modes is not competitive with, um, with say, CMB polarization B modes. But in principle, this B you saw earlier also constrains uh, gravitational waves. Um, it's just not the most competitive constraint and never cited and should not be cited. So that's, uh, that's fine. Um, but if you go to smaller scales with 21 centimeter and other um, surveys which can cover a lot of um, modes, this actually is a very sensitive probe that has, in principle, stronger R constraints than all the models we heard about, including S4 and including all the futuristic surveys, in principle. Now, these are all with SKA style um, 21 centimeter pre reionization um, modes. So, optimistic, but in principle, observable. So, just, just to keep in mind, these are observable. As, as an example, gravitational um, tensor modes can be uh, he helical, left handed or right handed. And even though in the minimal inflationary model, there's an equal number of left and right handed gravitational modes, but that depends on, you know, inflation. And if you are agnostic to the origin of cosmic gravitational waves, I can certainly in a simulation set up a asymmetric set of tensor modes that are the only left handed. Okay, so that in fact, anybody working on CMB analysis, I, I think it would be amusing to publish bounds on both the left and the right um, tensor modes separately. In principle, they are separately, they are separately observable. And as we just heard, um, this is the, the same, you know, you're measuring at the end of the day a power of a quadratic, the power spectrum of a quadratic form. That is a four point function and um, it covers the full squeezed um, configuration of these uh, bispectra, of these trispectra, sorry that have been where, we, where people have claimed detections. And um, this gives you an easier way because it gives you a uniquely defined one parameter curve. So otherwise it's very hard to plot a function of four variables. 
plotting a, a function of 1k, which is all you get if you have statistical isotopy. Um, I encourage the, um, everybody else doing these analyses to project this onto these, um, onto these len call them lensing modes, I call them tidal modes. And then there, it turns out that there, uh, you get um, scalars cannot have helicity. You've got two vectors and two tensors, and the two vectors are left and right. Tensors are left and right, so we can we can plot a total of four power spectra of um, of quadratic forms. So you get four left spectra, no, two left spectra and two right spectra. So vector, tensor, vector, tensor, and that's it. Okay. So when we analyze our universe, looking for um, for allowed early universe um, he helical violations, this is the thing to look for. And uh, I encourage analyses to publish it in this language rather than some very abstract space, which is much harder to um, isolate. Okay, in this in this space, you can even say, "Oh, it's at this scale. It's whatever you can pinpoint. It's at a k of whatever one that I see this." And then you can start going after the physics that may or may not have um, led to this. Just to um, to to remind us that in um, the CMB, this in two D, this is not this does not happen. Um, because the observer on the other side will disagree on whether it's left or right. So it's only in the three dimensions, like in the pastor, um, you can, everybody will agree <laughs> by the end of this talk um, of what the chirality of that pastor is, and turning it upside down is not going to change that. Okay, so changing your viewing angle will not change a 3D object in 2D. You cannot define a 2D object where people will agree on the um, helicity of that object. Okay, so I think I already said all of that. Um, there are some interesting physical mechanisms. Um, I'm going to, we heard about axions, a very favorite thing because it is a fairly minimal, um, thank you, a fairly minimal um, extension. And for example, it's been proposed to solve the neutron di electric dipole moment problem. So they've been pro uh, proposed for various reasons. Just a very brief um, reminder of how ac what, what these, uh, at least these um, standard model axion or the minimal standard model like axions do, is they add a term to Maxwell's equation that normally we have b dot equal to curl e. And you add to that a coupling, an, an axionic coupling um, of curl b. Okay. So curl, it turns out, and that's always something that I thought um, we, we have anybody who teaches um, vector calculus or first year or second year E and M, I always thought that um, projecting a, a vector field, like electric field, onto a potential that's great. You know, you reduce the three D problem to a three dimension, well, a three degree of freedom problem onto a single degree of freedom. You can calculate potentials and all that is great for solving new problems. We often also teach that magnetic fields B, which are divergence three can be decomposed into a vector potential. And that always seems like a lot of work um, for not all that much gain, that you still have a vector, you still have three degrees of freedom. You, you even introduced another gauge freedom. It's not entirely obvious that in classical um, physics, this gets you very fast. So it's a lot of work. Whereas, I encourage us to teach e &M that actually a divergence free field can be decomposed into two pseudoscalars left and right. Okay, and then you're done. And then I think it's obvious, okay, so my magnetic fields, they could be pure left, could be pure right, or a combination of the two. And I can just solve for the two potentials, and my life is easy. And I can write down some, some very interesting ones that have pure left, pure right, and then I can solve everything with a single field. And But we don't do it that, that way, so most of us are not that familiar with uh, hel helical projections. Um, the reason this matters here is that in, um, in axionic um, electrodynamics, uh, you, can, you can see that the curl operator will have a positive and ne a negative eigenvalue for the, the left and the right have opposite signs. And one of them is unstable depending on the sign of theta dot, which is, uh, as we saw in the, in the misalignment picture, a global number at least with a, with a fixed sign. So depending on g and theta dot, um, all magnetic fields in this universe should be pure left or pure right. That's the only instability that you drive. Okay, so in a fairly concrete physics model, you expect that all magnetic fields in this early universe would have a single direction. And any, and similarly, if you drove um, axionic asymmetric things at, in the early universe to form perturbations, you can drive pure, purely helical perturbations of, at order one. Okay, it's not, it's not very exotic. It's only, it's only modestly exotic. Uh, so I think it is certainly worth um, cl um, classifying all data into these left and right modes, 
and just asking every time you can, okay, did, did our data imply, infer a helical symmetric or not an initial condition? It's accessible um, in many measurements that we make. And we give a few more examples, which is, um, here's an, uh, something we had looked at recently. So what you need, to remember, is a vector field. With a uh, vector field you can either make out of a scalar by taking a quadratic form like we do for CMB lensing. You get a, a deflection vector out. That's the tidal picture. Um, we do have, however, um, vector fields given to us, for example, by galaxy spin fields, galaxy alignments. Okay, those um, are vector fields that are, are three-dimensional and um, do carry information about helicity. So we can always decompose galaxy alignment fields into the two underlying parities. So, uh, and in fact, this has been reclaimed, observed, and detected. You can actually predict and measure the alignments of galaxies in 3D with a full 3D vector. Um, and when you, uh, when you actually do this, uh, each helicity at a time, um, we find no, we find consistency with a symmetric um, initial condition. Perhaps that's not totally shocking. Um, it is amusing, though, that if you say, is this relevant, um, it, this data allows for a pure, does allow for, you know, it's just saying it's weakly constraining, meaning you allow for symmetric, that's fine. You also allow for pure left, but not pure right. Okay, so obviously, um, if you had to take bets, I'd, I'd recommend bet on symmetric. <laughs> but at least one of the bets is already ruled out. So the one of the extremal bets on this galaxy spin alignment is already ruled out by data. In other words, data is already at a, at a level that some types of initial conditions that in principle, um, you can at least set up an n-body simulation to implement, um, did not happen. So this helicity is something which is observationally accessible and an interesting test of what happens in the early universe. Just a reminder, and that's something that, um, you know, for some this is just obvious, and for others this is um, obviously wrong. Just to give you my, say, <laughs> the, our textbook argument is that um, in addition to statistical isotropy and homogeneity, helicity is additionally allowed. So if you look at alignment of galaxies on the sky, that is not saying that all galaxies are rotating whatever left-handed on the whole sky because that will differ for a different observer in your universe. This is a 3D effect, meaning that um, a galaxy's spin relative to the, its neighbor along, along its connecting vector. That is the one that's correlated. Okay? It's a fully statistically isotropic process. So this is something that um, I found um, people often get hung up on. Oh, but you know, sh should I just look for them being more left and right galaxies? No, this is a, a k vector dependent or a separation dependent statement, and therefore fully um, isotropic. It's a twist along your k vector. And um, this is a summary that um, that so the data does constrain things. So metric is allowed because that. So this is basically the, the summary of, of where I thought, you know, the le lessons that we have learned is good to apply um, technology or tools and convert notations from different fields to other fields. So here's something where I find the CMB lensing field has a very concise way of describing um, what we mean by a um, quadratic displacement vector, which has, uh, which is vectorial. It's 2D, so it doesn't have felicity, it does have parity. And this is equally up, up, um, implementable in a 3D survey. So this is fully, um, uh, fully present. And that in this language, the uh, concept of helicity is much simplified and can be described as just four power spectra. And uh, something which you just go after and that this is true for um, both the, um, the perturbation uh, of the scalars Okay, so quadratic perturbations of scalars are, can be vectorial, or for two vectorial quantities like galaxy angular momentum vectors. So there actually are vectors that you can on which you can pose these questions, and it also asks you know it allows a decoupling, like which is nice in cosmology, that you can decouple the possible allowed possible initial conditions that are consistent with symmetries only, and the observational outcome, and then have a separate question of what physics can generate these kinematically allowed outcomes. OK, 
Okay, so I, I, I think so for CMBs, this has worked very well. Obviously, you want to be as, as agnostic as possible and not tie everything to a very, very um, detailed physical um, equation when we don't actually know which one, even if it is inflation, which inflation it is, or if, it is, if, if even it is that, but to allow for discoveries. If you don't allow for you to discover things, you will not discover things. So allow for your data analysis to the degree of freedom and um, helicity is something that uh, in, in the CMB is, is hard to see, but in any, in any large scale structure measurement is an inevitable, an inevitable side product of your analysis. And I, I highly recommend um, looking at that combination. And I think that's all I wanted to um, survey today. Thank you. OK, we can maybe take one or two questions in the interest of time. Um, yeah, I was curious about your first statement about the non-contamination by late time nonlinearity. Does that mean that whatever produced the helicity at early times is no longer active at late times? Is we, some, we, yeah. uh, is that, that's the statement, right? So yeah. At least in, in our normal cosmological simulations, yeah. all the equations that we are used to form galaxies and stars and gas, those are all parity symmetric and will not, impose, will not introduce new parity. It could erase initial parity, but it cannot generate new parity. Okay. So I realize you showed the CMV lensing spectrum as just as an example of a four-point function. Uh, the thing that you showed is obviously very noise dominated on large scales. On small scales. Uh, large angular scales. On large angular yeah. scales. Uh, yeah. So you can't actually determine uh, whether or not uh, this would provide a useful constraint on the kind of effects that you're looking for in large scale structure in the CMV. Uh, do you, have you thought about what you can actually learn from the CAB about this? Well, I think large and small is relative, given that, uh, that this, this never gets plotted. Uh, I mean, if it were maximally helical, this error bar is perfectly small enough for you to see that. Okay, and then if you it was, a, yeah. well, If then, it was maximally helical, Yeah, yes. and you, we, don't know that, we don't even know that. That's what I'm saying, right? Nobody, you could ask the question, maybe it is maximally. I mean, some things in physics like neutrinos are maximally asymmetric. Well, let me put it another way. What constraint can you put on the helicity from the current data? Again, the CMB, there's none. On large scale structure, as, as I mentioned, this, this is numbers we, we just, I just quoted on some other obscure slide. So why does that vary between seven sigma and less than two sigma and four sigma? What is the dis difference between those analyses, the three groups that you quoted? Well, okay, so what I'm, what I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't make people unhappy in case one of you is also on one of, these, one of these papers. So in this analysis, I think the error bars are now well understood of how they come about. And it's even that su sufficiently subtle and non-trivial to compute. If you take the general configuration of, of, of quadrilaterals, um, those error bars are non-trivial to understand. And it's a good question of whether one really got them right, which is why I think in this space. So that's why uh, projecting it as something we understand has a better chance of us figuring it out. And that's why the ones that don't claim a detection project onto this kind of um, analysis. So the ambiguity is in the error in the Indeed, in exactly. Oh, it's only on the errors. So uh, thanks, Willy. I just had a quick question on your work with Pavel compared to the recent results by Hu et al. So I think they found seven sigma parity odd by the bias spectrum, right? So does this is it consistent, or I missed which way it the, your galaxy survey results went? Uh, are they sort of consistent, or are they? They well, okay. So first of all, the the ones that are inconsistent, which is other, the mm -hmm. Ho and the Philcox, which is the exact same data, the exact same analysis of the mean, but a different estimate of the error. Oh. Okay, so if you mm -hmm. if you think you see it, depends on whether how big you make your error bar. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, whereas our analysis used the Sloan main sample with a different oh, okay. scale. So our ah. constraints are not on the exact same scale as theirs, so uh, okay. not identical. Okay, uh, we'll go for one last question before the break. Hi, thanks for the nice talk. So when you're measuring for, from the galaxy, how much the, uh, so I presume there'll be always an intrinsic alignment depending upon uh, how many galaxies you're observing. So you need a, as a function of scale or length scale, you at least need a finite number of galaxies to beat your error. Because, because of just tidal deformation, tidal uh, coupling between two nearby galaxies in the nonlinear structure formation regime, I will expect some nonlinearities, some contamination. So I need at least a few number of galaxies to beat that as a function of scales. Okay, so maybe that's, that's the way to maybe to recast your question of um, 
of what would it take to have even sensitivity, even if it were maximally violated, when would, when would you have a chance of even seeing that? And the way I would, I would pose that is in, there's, a, there's a, a noise, meaning you measure them at finite position, yes. and the alignments, the intrinsic alignments are not huge. There, there's a mild intrinsic alignment. So it's only once you've measured an alignment that you can say whether this alignment is preferentially left or right. If you never measured a correlation of galaxy alignments, then you're not in a good position to constrain the asymmetry. So you have, of, course, of course, you can measure them in the two modes separately, which I think one should still do, even in upper bound. I think it would be, it would be more useful to quote the left and right upper bound separately, but that's perhaps not that profound. It's more profound when you see something. Right. So, but if I take a simulation and I calculate this, your esti I apply your estimator on a simulation. Yes. Then how may, what is the typical number densities of galaxies I need to make a detection or non-detection, non let's say. To see, to see a detection. So in, in this case, it was uh, to about 10,000 galaxies to get a three, sig three or four sigma detection. It's not huge numbers. 10,000 uh, is fine. How do yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So, so they, 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 are, they are reasonably strongly aligned. That's why this is not, it's not like um, way far in the future. It just requires an analysis. This is all of existing archival data that we didn't even look at. This is ancient data. This is a galaxy zoo from 20 years ago. A was done by the Citizen Science Project. Yes. And there are well known biases in uh, how people view uh, uh, which way galaxies and alignments and which way. So, for. Uh, so, so I mean, the study of this well, oh no, there are many papers on that. So, for example, you know, the 49% versus 51% left to right classification yeah. by human eyes. And we know that that's true because if you randomly flip it, the vote goes, still goes 51 uh -huh. left to right. So we know that that's not, not even in the data. Um, but because what I said, um, the, the net alignment has no helicity. It doesn't actually matter. So this particular bias does not enter, the, even if, even, you know, this is not, this is a k equal to zero helicity, which is not, which is not definable. So it is the correlation of galaxies that leads to it. But actually, for our upper bound, um, there, again, there are a couple of, again, there are a couple of internal cross checks that this is um, insensitive to these one, at least a one percent level human biases that are known to be in the data. Okay, maybe we can chat later about this. But thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Veli, and thank you for all the three speakers and the audience for a lively discussion. Welcome to the fourth session. Now we have one talk uh, by L. Sri Ram Kumar, and then we will have a lightning talks, four lightning talks. Sri Ram, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Shabir. I should begin by thanking uh, Saurabh and the other organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be back uh, at uh, RRI. With the detection of gravitational waves from merging binary black holes, there has been a considerable interest whether these black holes that have gone on to merge were formed in the early universe. In particular, if you want to form these black holes during the radiation dominated epoch, then the power on small scales should be considerably higher than the power on, small on the large scales, which are well constrained by the CMB. Interestingly, as you try to enhance power during inflation on small scales, there are other consequences that occur. For instance, secondary gravitational waves are generated. They turn out to be larger in amplitude than the primary gravitational waves generated during inflation. And as I will describe, if you try to generate magnetic fields through one of these inflationary potentials that lead to enhanced power on small scales, you end up not producing adequate amounts of magnetic fields and you need to somehow resolve such mechanism. In this talk, I will discuss some of the non-trivial dynamics and their consequences, non-trivial inflationary dynamics, uh, which lead to, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, enhanced power on small scales and their consequences. Here's an outline of my talk. I will start with a few customary slides on the constraints on inflation over large scales. And then I will discuss the types of models that lead to enhanced power on small scales. In the context of single field models, you need an epoch known as ultra slow roll inflation. And uh, you can, you know, ultra slow roll inflation is, you know, when you try to enhance power on small scales and such models, it proves to be, the power spectra proves to be often inconsistent with the CMB on large scales. 
So you need to turn to two field models which provide you richer dynamics to achieve the enhanced power. And then I will talk about the implications for primordial black hole formation and the generation of secondary gravitational waves. Whenever you have deviation from slow roll inflation, during the ultra slow roll inflation, I talked about the first slow roll parameter remains small, but the second and higher order slow roll parameters turn large. When you have such deviation from slow roll inflation, non-gauss entities turn out to be large. And I will discuss the extent of non-gauss entities that are, you know, generated in such scenarios. And the implications are being investigated as we speak. And uh, I will very briefly touch upon the implications of these models for inflationary magnetogenesis. If you are coupling the non conformal I'm sorry, the electromagnetic field to the inflaton through these, the, through these potentials of our interest, then you don't end up producing NF magnetic fields. Uh, so you need to somehow circumvent this problem. We, I will discuss about that and I will close with an outlook. Let me start, as I said, with my customary slides on inflation. What has been plotted are the different wave numbers, co-moving wave numbers, and the green is the Hubble scale, uh, co-moving Hubble radius, co-moving co Hubble radius. And uh, you, there are various epochs post-inflation that have been indicated. You can ignore them and think of a straight line here corresponding to radiation domination. As you very well know, these modes are well inside the Hubble radius during the early stages of inflation. They leave the Hubble radius during inflation and they re-enter the Hubble radius at a later epochs. And how do you drive this epoch of inflation, which allows you to impose well-motivated initial conditions? Well, you turn to a scalar field. And as you very well know, there are many types of scalar fields and some of them well constrained. Some of them are not so well constrained. And the idea is to see whether, you know, in this talk is to see whether, you know, non-trivial dynamics on small scales can allow us to, you know, pro can provide a lever, lever arm to constrain dynamics on large scales as well. How do you constrain inflationary models? It is, you have scalar fields which drive the background. They have fluctuations. They generate perturbations, scalar and tensor perturbations, which have been discussed earlier. And these scalar and tensor perturbations are often described in this power law form. You have four quantities here, the scalar power, scalar amplitude, the tensor amplitude, the scalar spectral index, and the tensor spectral index. We haven't seen the primordial or, or you know gravitational waves as yet. So we are not interested in NT as such. So AS is well known, which is often referred to as Kobe normalization. So what you are interested in determining is NS and the tensor to scalar ratio. And you can ask what are the constraints that emerge from the you know uh, CMB anisotropies as observed by Planck. Well, you have arrived at you can arrive at such constraints. Uh, there are better constraints, particularly on the tensor to scalar ratio, when you include the recent observations by bicep, etc. But the bottom line is that you have a scalar spectral tilt, which is close to 0.96, and the tensor to scalar ratio of the best constraints is 0 0.036 or so. And as has been pointed out in an earlier talk, one of the best models is the Starobinsky model, which is the R plus R squared inflation. And please note, all these constraints are arrived at assuming slow roll inflation. You have a simple model where the field slowly rolls down the potential. How do you enhance power on small scales? Remember why we need to enhance power on small scales? Well, I, this is a you know cartoon picture of the diagram that I had earlier. You have the Hubble scale, which has been referred to the horizon here, Hubble radius, you know, uh, and uh, it's a co-moving Hubble radius, and you have the radiation dominated era here, where the co-moving Hubble radius is increasing, and uh, you have the various wave numbers of cosmological interest. They leave the Hubble radius and re-enter. And when they re-enter the Hubble radius, if you have, if they have adequate power, substantial power, you can have a power spectrum close to one so that you don't break perturbation theory. And if you have such power, as they re-enter the Hubble radius, they can collapse to form what are referred to as these primordial black holes. What is the kind of power that you require? This is, you know, essentially k power three by two of the curvature perturbation in a given mode. So you have about, you know, between 10 power minus five on 10 power minus four on the CMB scales, which is what I refer to as Kobe normalization. What you need for PBH production, that is, if you want a significant number of primordial black holes produced, you want a number fairly close to one. Uh, and how do you generate these? Well, you would have seen inflationary potentials. I'm sure you have heard of the, what is known as the first low roll parameter which is essentially h dot by h squared minus h dot by h squared, h being the Hubble radius during inflation. If you have a simple slow roll model, like the Starobinsky model I had mentioned earlier, what you will have is 
the epsilon one parameter will be very small and as you approach inflation it will rise, it will touch one leading to the end of inflation. But in these cases what happens I have indicated a typical potentials that are considered in this context, they are often known as ultra slow roll inflationary models. What you notice suddenly the epsilon one parameter starts decreasing rapidly, in fact it decreases exponentially and it is this what is referred to as ultra slow roll. The speed of the scalar field comes down drastically. How is this achieved? There is a point of inflection in these potentials. Therefore, the first and the second derivatives of the potential vanish and the speed comes down. And that is illustrated well in this phase plot where I have plotted phi versus phi subscript n, n being the e-fold and you know which refers to the derivative. So in a slow roll scenario, this line would have been in what is referred to as an inflationary attractor because different trajectories come in and join that and it would have remained here and it would have fallen, fallen into the center and it would have oscillated about the minimum. But notice what happens here. This, this vertical line denotes the point of inflection in this potential. What happens is that the speed decreases rapidly tremendously and it almost comes to zero and somehow the scalar field escapes the grip of this potential and it comes down and oscillates around the mid of I'm sorry, the bottom of the potential leading to the end of inflation. So typically what you have is something I illustrated, epsilon 1 comes down drastically and then it rises again and it has to approach towards, you know, touch unity for end of inflation to occur. And these are called ultra slow roll models for reasons I mentioned a few minutes back. Okay, uh, these are called punctuated inflation models. What happens is that very briefly epsilon 1 goes above unity and then it starts coming down. There is a brief interruption of inflation before inflation is restored. And what happens is that though the first slow roll parameters remain small, the second slow roll parameters, notice this is becomes 6 or so and epsilon 3 becomes very large at these points of transition and it is for this reason slow roll is violated. You cannot use slow roll approximation to can I stop this? You cannot use slow roll approximation to estimate the uh, estimate the power spectra, etc. You need to turn to numerics. And here is another class of potentials which will permit punctuated inflation. And all these potentials contain a point of inflection. And uh, what you you know I will not have time to talk about is that when you try to construct these, consider these models, you have to produce power at a particular scale. And the closer the scale is to the CMB scale where you want to enhance power, there is, you know, the tension with the CMB data becomes larger. And many of these models, even if you, you know, generate peaks in the power spectra at very small scales, they will still lead to um, NS and R, which are fairly inconsistent with the CMB data. You can circumvent this problem, at least in single field models, by so-called reconstructed scenarios. In other words, I can specify an epsilon 1 of N, you just, this is, you know, you're able to achieve this because you have, you know, introduced many more parameters in this description of epsilon 1 of n than the potentials had in the previous two slides. And due to this, you can ensure that you have an epoch of ultra slow roll inflation and ensure that using this epsilon 1a and epsilon 2a, that the power spectra are indeed consistent with the CMB data on large scales. So single field models have a problem in being consistent with the CMB data on large scales, but you can overcome such difficulties with reconstructed scenarios. What is the power spectra? What do the power spectra look like? The power spectra typically look like this. There is a peak in the power spectrum. This is roughly easy to understand. In the slow roll approximation, this amplitude of the power spectrum, scalar power spectrum goes as h squared by epsilon 1, h being the Hubble parameter and epsilon 1 being the slow roll parameter. And epsilon 1, remember, goes very small and therefore they correspond to, you know, the, that leads to that broadly, that behavior leads to peaks in the power spectra. These are the power spectra in these ultra slow roll and, in, and punctuated inflationary models. And these are in what are known as the reconstructed scenarios. In the reconstructed scenarios, you can even generate power spectra with a broad enough peak. And uh, I mentioned as to how it is uh, challenging to generate spectra with large enough peaks and also be consistent with the CMB data on small scales. One way to circumvent this is consider two field models. The presence of the additional field allows you richer dynamics. And one such two field model we have examined is this non, you know, a canonical field described by phi and a non-canonical field, you know, the non-canonical 
kinetic term contains this f of i function and you have the second field phi and you assume potentials which are separable but the fields are coupled essentially through this non-canonical function and you can choose functions of this type and you can easily generate features in the spectra and I will just briefly de describe the dynamics of these fields. What happens is that there are two fields phi and chi phi comes down and oscillates at the bottom of the potential. You start with a very small initial velocity for chi. It remains where it is and at some point of time it starts evolving once phi has reached the bottom of the potential. Essentially there is a turning in field space and when there is a turning in field space what you find as far as the background is concerned is that the epsilon 1 parameter comes down drastically for a brief period and it rises again and what effectually hap happens effectively happens is that you know as the turning in field space occurs there is a tachyonic instability two things happen there is a tachyonic instability and isocurvature perturbation remember in a single field model you have only the curvature perturbations but when you have more than one field you have the isocurvature apart from the curvature perturbations the isocurvature perturbations feed the curvature perturbations and this these models allow you further you know um, uh, easy tuning of your parameters so that you can have your peaks at different domains in the power spectra and here in this particular paper we have constructed you know uh, for some parameters peaks that correspond to as I will describe later gravitational waves which are sensitive to these various observatories. So we talked about power spectra this is of course the scalars and these are the tensors. Tensors have a milder effect you know in fact the tensor amplitude gets suppressed at later stages. Now we turn on to understand what are the implications of um, uh, primordial black hole formation or what is the extent of PVHS that are formed and why are, you know what is the spectrum of the secondary gravitational waves that have been produced. You know since I don't have much time I will not be able to provide the technical details you can go on to calculate you essentially has to calculate the number of black holes produced as each mode re-enters the Hubble radius and we have done that for the different models of our interest and uh, you know what has been plotted is the fractional of PBHS that contribute to dark matter density as a function of mass m of the black holes and this you know this red curve here and this red curve here are correspond to those particular you know uh, USR ultra slow roll and punctuated inflation models and you can tweak you can you know tune the peak in the reconstructed scenarios so you can generate peaks at different scales and I don't have time to discuss the various constraints here. These constraints essentially arise due to black hole evaporation. Very small black holes would have evaporated and these are largely constraints arising from micro lensing and there is a narrow window you can have a situation where FPBH can be as close to one as possible. And this is in the single field models and what you can also what we did um, uh, before I go on to the two field model I'll just briefly comment about it. In these reconstructed scenarios I can construct you know power spectra with wide enough peaks and what you find is that you know as the peaks are shifted you know the, the peak of the FPBH shifts to different masses and uh, if you look if you have looked at the expression for FPBH they have an overall dependence of m power minus half and that is what we have been able to reproduce from these different power spectra. And that is in single field models you can calculate the corresponding quantities in two field models as well and you have you know depending on the location of the peaks in the power spectra you have different values of FPBH. There are some uncertainties in the calculation of these FPBHs. I believe Rajiv may talk about it on the last day when he discusses PBH formation. Now we move on to secondary gravitational waves. What happens is that at the leading order in perturbation theory you have the decomposition theorem that is that is gravitational waves tensor perturbations and scalar perturbations evolve independently but not so at a higher order when you cut when you talk about you know power spectra with high enough peaks close to uh, the power spectrum being close to one what happens is that they end up the second order perturbations source second order gravitational waves and these are referred to as secondary gravitational waves and if you did not have such high peaks your graph your primordial prime you know primary gravitational waves will be very small they will be at 10 power minus 23 or so but because you have enhanced power at the second order when you include the scalar power you have you know a peak in the spectrum of secondary gravitational waves and the peaks as you can evidently see you can tweak you know you can uh, tweak the peak in the power spectrum to have these peaks in omega gw at different locations and you know as you can evidently see they are comparable to the sensitivity curves of the various gravitational wave observatories. 
And this is what you can do with the SEC2 field model. And you know, there is, you can tweak the locations of the peak and you can even tweak with this additional parameter that is available to you, the height of the peaks as well. And you can have a variety of scenarios where they are, as I said, you know, uh, strengths are comparable to the sensitivities of these various um, gravity wave observatories. I mentioned earlier that when you have deviations from slow roll inflation, non-Gaussianities can be large. Let me quickly remind you what are the constraints on non-Gaussianities um, on the CMD scales. How is the constraints on uh, the non-Gaussianities arrived at? Typically what happens is that one works with templates of bispectra. So what essentially you have is K1, K2, K3, you know, but K1, K2, K3 are not independent. They all, the wave vectors have to form of the edges of a triangle and therefore they are referred to as bispectra and you introduce this bispectrum is written as a Fourier, I'm sorry, as a superposition of these three bispectra, the local which is absolutely K independent, equilateral which peaks in the equilateral limit and uh, something which is supposed to be orthonormal to these and you arrive at these constraints using the CMB on these parameter FNL local FNL equilateral and FNL orthogonal and the constraints are essentially point to the fact that you know what it implies is that slow ro rolling single field models which involve the canonical scalar field which are favored by the data at the level of power spectra are also consistent at the level of non gaussianities in single field models the non gaussianities that you obtain is of the order of 10 power minus 2 or so what happens to non gaussianities in ultra slow roll models and other models that we have discussed. Well, this is the bispectrum that arises in ultra slow roll and punctuated inflation. You can consider different, different limits of the three wave vectors. One is often referred to as the equilateral shape when all the three vectors are of equal length and that's called the equilateral limit of the, this should not be confused with the with the shapes of the bispectra, this is a particular limit of the bispectrum. And in the equilateral limit, notice it resembles very much like the power spectrum and it has an amplitude close. The peak has an amplitude close to 10 power minus 1 or so. And if you look at the, what is known as the squeeze limit that was talked about earlier today, the amplitude is considerably smaller compared to the equilateral limit. And uh, you can ask what is the value of FNL? I would just ask, you know, I request you to focus around these domain where the peaks in the primer in the, in the spectrum are located around these locations and what you find is that FNL is of order one or so which means it is about 100 times larger than what you have in slow roll inflation. In other words, if you had a slow roll inflationary potential all the way, FNL would be order one but in, because you have these epochs of ultra slow roll, FNL is boosted and if it's all, I'm sorry, did I say slow roll, FNL would have been 10 power minus 2 because you have epochs of ultra slow roll inflation, FNL is boosted, it's of order one or so. And you, it is interesting to also understand the shape of the bispectrum that has been generated in these models. What we have plotted is the bispectrum close to the pivot scale on the left. So this K3 has been chosen to the pivot scale. So essentially you're looking at the shape of the bispectrum in the slow roll regime and you're looking at the shape of the bispectrum in the uh, near the peak of the power spectrum, what you find is that on around the pivot scale, that is on the CMB scales, the bispectrum has an equilateral shape, but close to the peak in the power spectrum, the, 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 the FNL has a local shape. So there is, you know, there is a change of shape in the power and in the bispectrum as you shift, you know, as you look at the bispectrum at different locations across the scales of interest. So, I will talk about the non gaussianities and implications in its outlook. This is something we are still working on. I will just discuss, I have how many? Two minutes on implications for inflationary magnetogenesis. So what, you know, this is again, that was mentioned by Uli in the morning. Uh, so what you have is a Lagrangian, which is not conformal. That is, you introduce a non conformal coupling function, J of phi, before f mu nu, f mu nu, you break this conformal invariance of the electromagnetic action during inflation in order to generate scale invariant magnetic fields. You have to take this from me. If you want to generate a scale invariant magnetic fields, this J of n has to behave like e power 2n. It has to behave like a squared, then you will have a scale invariant magnetic field. But what, are, what we have plotted in J of, in J of here is the J of n in slow roll ultra models which permit ultra slow roll. If you have, if this is your inflationary model 
and you are trying to generate inflate, I'm sorry, magnetic, primordial magnetic fields with these models, then what happens is that you will have a scale invariant spectra on small scales and you will have a very strongly K dependent power spectra of the magnetic field on large, I'm sorry, on, did I say small scales? On large scales, you will have a scale invariant spectra. You can consider non-helical fields and you can introduce some helicity as well and that will boost the amplitude of these magnetic fields and they will have scale invariant spectra. But what happens is that the moment the field hits this point of inflection, this, uh, these points correspond to the location when the field, in the, you know, uh, the inflaton field, which is coupled to the electromagnetic field, hits the point of inflection. What happens is that the field stops moving, J stops evolving, and you have essentially conformal coupling uh, restored, and therefore you have a K power 4 dependence. So there is a problem in generating magnetic fields of adequate strengths in such ultra slower models. There is a way of overcoming this. You can turn to the two field models that I had discussed. So there are two fields which are evolving. Both are slow rolling. You can choose your coupling function so that the initial phase depends on one field and the later phase depends on the other field. And you can ensure your J, which should behave as E power 2N or A squared, does indeed behave. And you can arrive at scale invariant spectra. But the electromagnetic spectra will contain very sharp features. And they will, for instance, if you have such features on CMB scales, they will leave telltale imprints on the CMB itself. This is something we are discussing currently, we are working on currently. And they can, if the features occur at small scales, if you enhance power on small scales, they will leave those, you know, features on those small scales. Since I'm running out of time, I'll just close with a uh, quick outlook. Uh, there are imprints of the you know, uh, of ultra slow roll on the power and the bispectra of neutral hydrogen. In particular, the, if you have noticed, I'll just have to rush through a few slides back. I've gone through too fast. So you will see these spectra contain a sharp dip. And in this particular, in a, in a particular work, we have examined the imprints of the dip in the 21 centimeter spectrum. There is a poster by Raghavendra uh, outside. I would urge you to take a look at it. And the effects of non gaussianities on the primordial black holes and the formation of primordial black holes is something that is being examined. You know, as you re, as they re-enter, if they have large non non large non gaussianities they will also change the number of that are black holes that are being produced, that is being investigated. And the effects of non gaussianities on secondary gravitational, they will also contribute to the secondary gravitational waves. Uh, additionally, in addition to the power spectrum, this has been examined to some extent in a model independent fashion, to some extent model dependent fashion. This has been examined at late times during the radiation dominated epoch. They can influence during inflation as well. And this can be considered under the, you know, garb of loop corrections to the primordial spectrum. The question is, if you enhance power on small scales, is that a cascading effect from, you know, transfer of power on from small scale to large scales that affect your CMB constraints. And this is something that is being discussed as we speak. This work has been done with, uh, I will highlight the students. Matteo Braglia was earlier student of Fabio Finelli. He's currently a postdoc at NYU. Raghavendra was my student and he's currently a postdoc here. Sagarika Tripathi is a, post a student with me um, at IIT Madras presently. Thank you for your attention. I'll stop here. Thank you, Surya. Uh, we can take two questions. On there. Uh, what is the mass range of PBHs that you get at the higher end? I couldn't quite read the numbers on your plot. So, so um, it's the, uh, sort of maroon and mustard yeah, colored just, uh, curves. So it is, it is difficult to get adequate number of black holes of say one solar mass. Uh, on, on smaller scales, what happens is that this FPBH as a function of M, assume that you have same amount of power, primordial power, it goes like M power minus half. So th this is roughly what we are interested in, you know, 10 power minus 15 to one solar mass. And uh, the number comes down drastically. And there are subtleties I haven't had the time to discuss, you know, whether uh, it depends on one particular critical threshold density, what should be that value is being debated. If you change that even small amount, this can grow down exponentially. So given those, this is roughly the number. In the next plot, you had a significant number. In the next plot, yeah, this one. Ah, yes, so <laughs> that's right. So here, what has happened is that there is a wider spectrum, so that argument doesn't apply. So you can, you can, 
shifted to slightly higher values. Yes. So what and is the number? I can't it, is, it is one solar mass here. Oh, it's okay. one solar mass. And also, I don't know this. When we plotted this, we assumed a particular value for the threshold density. I think this was this will be smaller, so this goes higher. So it may be here somewhere if you want to compare with the earlier earlier stuff. Yeah. Nice talk. Uh, the, I have a question in the magnetic field part. Uh, did I understand it correctly that you are saying that the models which you are considering will also lead to a large power in small scales in the magnetic field? So, uh, no, the power is not large. Uh, the cost by considering those inflationary models is that your magnetic fields on CMB scale, which you want today to be uh, something like, you know, nano gauss or something like that, you know, uh, will be considerably suppressed. You won't be able to produce such levels of magnetic fields in these models. We won't be able to produce No, it. you won't be. So, single field models will not be able to do that. So you need to turn to two field models and there is considerable amount of fine tuning and uh, depending on where you have this ultra slow run inflation, there can be features in your spectrum of magnetic fields as well. So what is this plateau? Then I misunderstood it. What is this plateau means? In the previous plot, what is this? This one. Yeah. This is the strength of the magnetic fields uh -huh. produced after inflation on, um, uh, on CMB scales, on large scales. I see. And this is the large scales, right? Right. So this is the magnetic field produced during at the end of inflation. Okay. These numbers will be considerably smaller than even femto gauss today. So if you have an epoch of ultra slow roll, and that's your inflationary model supposed to be, ridiculous. and you know there is another assumption that's what your leads to the coupling, non-conformal coupling to the electromagnetic field. Then those models of magnetogenesis are not viable. Okay. Or not viable in the sense they are, no, no. they won't produce enough magnetic, magnetic field. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Sri Ram, Thank for you. the talk. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Sri Ram, Thank for you. the talk. Uh, now we have five lightning talks. Uh, may I request all the five speakers to please acquire some of the convenient chairs so that we don't spend more time in switching. Uh, Dipanshu, Raghavendra, Mohammad Ishaq, Nilanjan Dev and Sarvesh. So each uh, lightning talk is five minutes. So I would request, uh, so there won't be any question answer session. Uh, there, there are posters outside, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them there. So first talk is by Dipanshu. So I am Dipanshu. I will be presenting uh, capturing statistical isotropy violation with isotropic angular correlation function. So this is title of my talk. So I so will start with the problem that we have investigated in our work. So the Planck data reveals the signatures of statistical isotropy violation in its 2018 results. So to study those uh, statistical isotropy violation features, we need an efficient mathematical construct. So in this work, we define a new construct to expand the non-statistical isotropic feature in CMB data in terms of isotropic correlation functions. So we have a bipolar spherical harmonics, which is a tensor product of y LMs. This, this y LMs, when you do the tensor product, this forms a complete and orthonormal basis in the S2 cross S2 space. This basis provides a general formalism for quantifying the departure from statistical isotropy. So whenever we have the statistical isotropy violations, our covariance matrix has the non-diagonal components. So here we need to encapture the non-diagonal elements and this basis captures the non-diagonal entries as you can see from the equation. So we want to go further from the bipost basis. So we defined another uh, reduction of bipost basis, basis which is like a reducible representation of bipost basis. So which is based on mathematical theorem that any L rank tensor should be constructed by L number of its arguments. So here you can see that, so this bipost basis was a L rank tensor. So we constructed this L rank tensor by L number of its components. So in this basis, we have the expansion of this covariance matrix in the terms of theta, this cos theta. So this cos theta is a real space, pixel space measure. 
So, so we are defining this new uh, parameter as m by post functions because these are minimal and they will define the anisotropy features in the uh, statistical isotropy violation feature in the CMB. So this uh, m by post functions are nothing but the angular correlation functions from the anisotropic CMB sky. So we we use we use this mathematics to a non non case of statistical isotropy violation case, which is uh, do Doppler boost. Uh, this Doppler boost occurs due to the movement of our rest frame as compared like as compared to the CMB frame. So this can be studied by our two set of angular correlation functions, which are shown here. So these two correl uh, angular correlation functions have the form of first derivative of Legendre polynomials. As we know in the statistical isotropic function, we have the, uh, the, the Legendre polynomial. So this serves as a sort of derivative maps from the CMB sky. So when we plotted these, these functions, C0 and C1 to the, uh, to the simulated set of Doppler boosted maps. So we saw that the, Doppler, the, the correlation in the Doppler boosted map are correlated at very small angles only. So these two functions show the diff two zero C zero and C one uh, here, and uh, so we conclude saying that this M by push captures the the deviation from the non statistical isotropy uh, on a two di two dimension sphere, and this provides us a real space estimator for the for the for the measurements as a isotropic correlation functions. So we also say that for every anisotropy at multiple L, we there will be L plus one. Uh, correlation functions. So thank you. This is my talk. Raghavendra. So the work I'm presenting is uh, titled Observing Nulls in Primordial Correlations via the 21 centimeter signal. This is a work that I uh, did with my collaborators mentioned here and which Sriram briefly alluded to. Uh, this is mainly focusing on a specific feature that is generated in ultra slow roll uh, models of inflation which have garnered recent interest in literature, particularly in the uh, context of primordial black hole generation and secondary gravitational wave that we have been listening to. To distinguish uh, the plethora of models that are already generating these uh, uh, exotic objects, we have to identify unique signatures of these models and ultra slow roll inflation generates such a unique feature in that it generates this null of primordial correlations at a specific spot just before the rise in the wave, uh, rise in the spectrum occurs yeah, in this scalar power spectrum. One can actually solve the scalar perturbations in these models and arrive at the location of the dip called K dip in the range of wave numbers in terms of the model parameters namely K1 and delta n. So we want to capture uh, this feature to uh, confirm or rule out ultra slow roll inflation. For that we uh, resort to two specific models of ultra slow roll that are already available in, uh, in the literature. So we demonstrated this null in the at the level of power spectrum by numerically computing the scalar power spectrum for these two model and we tuned the parameters such that we achieved the dip at around 7.6 megaparsec inverse as, had, as is shown in the uh, plot on the right. Further to show it it is generic we also computed the bi spectrum in various limits of course equilateral squeezed and uh, flattened limits and so on and we see that this generic dip occurs at the same location of 7.6 megaparsec inverse in all the in both these models in all the limits computed apart from other uh, features that can occur due to the complications of the bi spectrum but not as generic as the dip itself. And we are sure that if we compute higher order correlations this dip will still occur at the same locations as, as is observed. Right. If we have the primordial feature, what probe is best suited to capture it? Well, we already have discussed all these uh, different probes, but each come with their own limitations to probe the scale of our interest. CMB is suppressed by silk damping beyond uh, something like 1.1 megaparsec inverse. As we know, large scale structure can probe up to 0.2 become, uh, before becoming highly nonlinear. And Lyman alpha data is broadly consistent with the nearly scale invariant spectrum up to let's say 4 megaparsec inverse. So we resort to this pristine probe of uh, primordial density perturbations, which is the H1 signal, that too specifically from dark ages. So we choose two specific redshift to compute our primordial uh, 21 centimeter power spectrum, namely 27 and 50. And for these two models, as I have shown, the signal generically dips at the same wave number as expected compared to the lambda CDM coupled with slow roll inflationary scenario that is presented in dashed lines. So we markedly see a dip and it is consistently above the uh, Poissonian fluctuations present at those corresponding redshifts. And there is a real prospect of uh, viewing this once we get past the foregrounds. 
Of course, at the level of bi spectrum too, we compute the B21 and we see for both the models as expected again at the red ships, we see the dip generically occurring along with the other features that were present, though now the Poisson fluctuations dominate the signal at the level of bi spectrum. Nevertheless, there are some interesting features to probe even in the Poisson fluctuations generated, but please catch me outside in the poster to discuss those uh, specific details. But all in all, I am trying to convey that the detection of this dip is possible with the sensitivities of future 21 centimeter experiments such as a lunar array radio interferometer and this detect, uh, detection of a dip is crucial in that it will strongly motivate hunt for stochastic gravitational waves that can be generated because of the rise that is closely following in the range of wave numbers. So, such a confirmation of a dip is crucial and also it can have interesting implications regarding the primordial non-Gaussianities which we know have uh, different shapes that has been recently presented. So, thanks for your attention and see you at the post. Thank you, Raghavendra. <laughs> Next is Mohammad Ishaq. Uh, a very good evening. My name is Ishaq and I am going to be discussing about some estimators to probe the isotropy of CMB hot and cold spots. Uh, so, SI basically entails that more or less the hot and cold spots of the CMB should be uniformly placed. So, uh, can we probe the manner of any sort of non-uniformity -uniform, in the CMB spots? For that, we take some clues from the orientation matrix, which was first given by Watson and Scheidegger in the concept of uh, in the context of geophysics. Uh, so they discussed about the orientation matrix, uh, which uh, basically incorporates the direction cosines of certain points on the on a two sphere, and the eigenvalues of these were found by Wood Woodcock to entail the shape and strength of the non-uniformity of these points. Uh, what we did is for the CMB spots, we know that some spots definitely contribute more than the others in terms of the temperature intensity. So, therefore, we incorporated the peak values as well as the direction cosines in the new uh, revamped orientation matrix. Uh, our statistics, uh, like uh, the isotropy statistics or estimators that uh, we get from that uh, modified orientation matrix are the shape and strength parameters originally given by Woodcock. Uh, so, for the shape parameter which is gamma, uh, if the gamma lies between 0 and 1, uh, we see girdles on the surface of the sphere and if it lies beyond 1 up to infinity, it shows clusters of these points on the sphere. And the strength parameter, if it is zero, it uh, entails perfect uniformity. And if it keeps on increasing, it's it's basically increasing in the strength of non-uniformity. Uh, we show this, uh, we illustrate this concept with the help of some toy maps that we simulated. Uh, these are, of course, SI violating uh, toy maps. Uh, one which shows girdles, the other shows clusters. And for each of these, we can see that the gammas for the toy map one are definitely lesser than one. So that entails that they have girdles. And for the clustering map, we see that the gammas are greater than one therefore entailing that they have clusters. And the zetas are all, uh, both, uh, for all these cases, they are greater than one, therefore entailing that there, are, there is a significant non-uniformity. So what about real CMB spots? Uh, we've plotted here some of these uh, foreground clean CMB maps and the shape and strength values are given, given here. The zetas are mostly low, indicating mostly uniform placements, but we need to consider whether or not these gammas and zetas are compatible with our uh, theory. So we compare them with 10 to the 4 say simulated SI obeying maps. And if we find some anomalous signals, we are supposed to check for the robustness by uh, considering different kinds of, uh, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, like uh, changes, for example, of sky coverage of frequency bands, different observation instruments and so on. So uh, we analyze some foreground minimized CMB maps, which are uh, given here, of course, incorporating this entire check of robustness of different frequency bands, different kinds of foreground cleaning methods and so on. Uh, yeah, so we have two cases in particular. One is without any galactic masks and the other is with a galactic mask. Uh, in the no galactic masking case, we have the full sky case as well as the uh, a case where we are masking the non-Gaussian cold spot because the non I mean, it could essentially contribute some anomalous feature, which is why we want to mask the non-Gaussian cold spot. And in the galactic masking case, we are considering two uh, very standard maps, one from WMAP and the other from Planck. So, in the first case, without any galactic mask, we see that gamma agrees very well with theory. However, for zeta, we see that more than 95% of all these SI obeying maps have a zeta which is much larger than those from foreground clean CME maps. Similarly, in the case two, with galactic mask, again, we see that gamma agrees with theory. However, zeta, for zeta, we see that zeta is anomalously low. So, there is a striking isotropy, uh, there is a striking isotropy of weak non-uniformity. So, we found a robust signal of anomalously weak non-uniformity, which is independent of the NGCS or the non-Gaussian cold spot. And now we uh, want to bring a rationale of as to whether this could be related to the low variance of the CMB temperature and isotropy field. The rationale behind being this as follows. So, Larson et al. in 2004 have said that uh, there are low uh, peak values of the spots on an average and Montessori et al. have said that uh, of the CMB field, there is a certain uh, anomalously low variance of this temperature field. 
So these two could actually entail that there are low uh, mass weights. And uh, additionally, the low variance normally is confined to the northern ecliptic hemisphere. So this is also inverted in the directional dependence, which could result in the weak uniform, non-uniformity of the spots. Cruz et al. told us that with our, if we remove the quadrupole and octopole contributions, we get uh, we, we are able to uh, remove the low CMV variance anomaly. So we did the same thing. We applied this filter function and we found that the low uh, zeta s or the unusually weak non-uniformity of spots also disappears. So our key findings are this, a robust signal of anomalously weak non-informity of spots is found, which is independent of the non caution cold spot. And the signal is, uh, it, I mean, we do get clues that it is probably due to the quadruple octopole contributions and it could be related with the low variance uh, anomaly of the CME temperature and isotropy field. Thank you. Thank you, Isha. Next is Nilanjan Dev. Uh, so I'm Nilanjan. I'm uh, a PhD student in IIC Bangalore. I'm working with uh, Dr. Tajit Kumar Jain. So here I will be focusing on uh, primordial black holes and gravitational wave background, how uh, we can use them to probe the early universe, particularly the universe between the end of inflation and Big Bang, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, so as Sriram and Raghavendra has already mentioned that uh, primordial black hole can be formed in uh, from the amplification in the inflation ready scalar curvature perturbation at the smaller scale. And uh, primordial black hole has come up as a promising dark matter candidate. It can contribute to dark matter uh, in the asteroid mass range. So uh, we start with a inflection point model and uh, near the inflection point uh, where near the flat part where inflaton field slows down, uh, the curvature perturbation can be amplified. So and uh, with uh, the peak in the curvature perturbation in different uh, length scale, we can get primordial black holes in different mass ranges and associated uh, gravitational wave background in uh, different frequency ranges where frequency of these uh, GW peaks will correspond to the mass range of primordial black holes. Uh, so I particularly self focus on the effect of a non-instantaneous rating history between the inflation and the start of standard radiation domination. So if we have a non-instantaneous rating between uh, these two phases which we define with uh, equation of state parameter W reheating and default duration in reheating. There will be a shift in the uh, power spectra of curvature perturbation. That will lead to a uh, shift in the mass range of primordial black hole and also the abundance of these primordial black holes. Uh, but when we consider the effect of reheating history on the gravitational wave background, other than this usual shift uh, which happens in the in this primary Peak, you can see that if there is a uh, different rating history, there is a shift. Other than this usual shift, uh, there will be also an additional amplification, wh which basically comes uh, because of the non-trivial evolution of scalar perturbation during the reheating phase. Uh, we see that if we have a, particularly if we have a matter-dominated reheating phase, uh, we get an amplification uh, in a very high frequency. Uh, in the second part, we consider uh, matter dominated phase contributed from the ultra low mass primordial black holes because uh, primordial black holes if we consider primordial black holes less than 10 to the power 9 gram these primordial black holes will evaporate uh, even before big bang nucleosynthesis so basically they can dominate the universe for a brief period of time uh, before uh, radiation domination starts so in that case we shall have a timeline like this as you can see uh, after inflation, early radiation domination starts, then primordial black hole forms. After some point, primordial black hole can dominate. And after they evaporate, our standard radiation domination starts. Uh, in this kind of scenario, one interesting aspect is that uh, isocarvature perturbation will be generated when the primordial black holes are formed. This isocarvature perturbation will contribute to adiabatic perturbation. And so at the time when uh, primordial black holes are evaporating and radiation domination is starting, we shall have basically two components in the adiabatic perturbation, one component coming from the inflation, another component coming from the primordial black hole uh, density fluctuation. So assuming that uh, Poissonian distribution of primordial black hole, what we get is that for a particular monochromatic mass range of primordial black hole and with appropriate initial abundance, uh, in the second order GW background, we shall basically have two peaks for each of this scenario. The first peak is coming from the inflationary adiabatic perturbation, the second peak is coming from the uh, primordial black hole density fluctuation. So uh, we basically uh, uh, also estimate the analytical uh, estimations for 
our numerical results and we use these analytical estimate to get the uh, signal to noise ratio uh, estimation also. In this plot, I am taking the cutoff of SNR as greater than or equal to 10. With that, uh, we show the uh, probability of detection in different uh, GW observatories. The left slanted lines are from the first peak, the right slanted lines are from the second peak. So, where these two lines are superimposing, there we can probe both these peaks, uh, which will basically probe this kind of scenario quite effectively. So, with that, I will stop. Thank you, Nilan. Next, Sarvesh. So, I am uh, in this work, I am trying to uh, uh, develop a method which is uh, model independent from poor ground modeling. So, I am, I am trying to uh, develop a method, a model independent method uh, which is efficient to remove polarized foreground. It, it is challenging for weak B mode signal. So, we improved the uh, previous uh, Gibbs ILT method so that it is applicable to the weak CMB B mode signal. So, we estimate the joint density of the tensor to scalar ratio and lensing power spectrum to show the performance of our method. So, the method is, uh, so we have data. So, this data has contribution from signal, foreground and noise. So, we take a, a guess for uh, the theoretical power spectrum and uh, given data, we sample the signal. And then once we have a signal, we uh, use that signal to sample the theoretical power spectrum. So, the sampling, in order to sample the CMB signal, we use the ILC method and where the um, we calculate the weights and uh, we linearly combine the observation in various uh, CMB frequencies and uh, we have this constraint on the weights. So, we minimize the variance. So, we, uh, we use these two equa uh, this equation to obtain the, this equation where we have this AIJ matrix uh, which is related to the covariance matrix C in this fashion and we use uh, since uh, this covariance matrix in pixel space is very huge and it is very difficult to calculate the inverse of this matrix in pixel space uh, we move to harmonic space uh, we move to harmonic space uh, and there we not only we uh, move to harmonic space we also subtract noise bias correction in the covariance matrix and then what we do, we calculate the weights and we use those weights to uh, obtain the signal uh, S. So, once we have the signal, we sample the power spectrum. So, the signal can be written in terms of ALMs in uh, this fashion. And we can use this uh, um, uh, ALMs to uh, get power spectrum uh, uh, of the estimated power spectrum. We then in the next step, what we do, we subtract a weighted noise bias correction, we apply a weighted noise correction in the power spectrum and then we use that uh, corrected uh, bias uh, power spectrum in order to um, sample the theoretical power, uh, theoretical power, power spectrum. So, not only this, we also uh, de-lens the, um, uh, we in order to estimate the R and A lens, we uh, use the this likelihood function and uh, de-lens the power spectrum R and in order to find the joint uh, distribution, we use the Blackwell Rao approximation. So, this is the result, uh, we, uh, this is the mean difference map. So, we apply our method on 200 simulations each for r equal to 0 0.01, r equal to 0 0.05 case. And uh, what we observed that from the mean difference map, uh, that the uh, simulations of the absolute pixel uh, reconstruction error is less than 10 to the power minus 5, 5 micro Kelvin for both, both values of R indicating accurate map reconstruction using our method. And uh, we also look into the fractional bias, uh, which is defined like this. And uh, from the two plots, what we found that 2% two, two to 3%, we have 2 to 3% more positive bias for R equal to 0 0.01 case, indicating that our method do not have significant bias even for R equal to 0 0.01 case. And these are the normal uh, normalized joint 2D Blackwell Rao posterior density estimate for A lens and R for R equal to 0 0.01 case. And this is a slice of that. And uh, so the conclusion is the main act that the method accurately reconstructs the simulated weak primordial CMB B mode sky and angular power spectrum for both R equal to 0 0.05 and 0 0.01 case. And for first time, what we have demonstrated that CMB B mode signal 
uh, using ILC approach and in a Bayesian framework, uh, samples of the CMV B mode critical angle power spectra given the data and using our method gives an unbiased estimate of PR for both cases. Our method on the six foreground and noise contaminated PICO CMB B mode channels, we can detect, detect R with more than nine sigma and eight sigma significance. And our method is computationally fast and efficient and accurate in delensing the detected significant unbiased detection of R equal to 0 0.2. Thank you. Thank you, Sarvesh. Let's thank all the speakers for keeping with the time.